Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to now call the Academic Goals and Instructional Improvement Committee meeting to order. Uh, again, welcome everyone. I know we have a big agenda and a few consent items that will be full. So that's that uh, first item. Here we go. Dr. Bunby? Here. Mr. Castile? Here. Dr. Davis? Here. Ms. Ellis? Here. Mr. Garvey? Here. Ms. Holloway? Mr. Mallorin? Here. Mr. Morris? Here. Ms. Orange Jones? Here. Mr. Rock? Here. Ms. Boche? Here. Ms. Clifton? Here. We have a quorum. Great, thank you. Uh, next item, please. Your consent. Your consent agenda is ready for approval, adding items 6.1 through 6.3 and items 7.5 and pulling items 3.2 and 3.3. No motion, please. Motion by Dr. Davis. Uh, second by Mr. Rock. Any objection to the motion? That motion passes. Next item. <coughs> Your first item is on page one, item 2.1, consideration of a report regarding the documentary Why Louisiana Ain't Mississippi or Any Place Else, presented by Commissioner Jay Yarden. The, recommended, the recommendation is to receive and endorse, and additional material has been distributed. Right. Motion, motion by Ms. Holloway, second by Ms. Foshe. Uh, Commissioner, I, I heard your presentation about 15 years ago, and, uh, and it was enlightening, and entertaining, and exciting, and it's great to have you here presenting today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Good morning, Jay Gardner. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, not necessarily in my official capacity as commissioner, but uh, as a partner with Louisiana Public Broadcasting on a four-hour documentary entitled Why Louisiana Ain't Mississippi or Any Place Else. And it's a, it's a television version of this presentation that uh, Mr. Castile was talking about that I've done for a number of years. But one of the main motivations behind it was to educate Louisianans about our state. And there's always been an undercurrent of a, an important ed educational component that could come with it. Our underwriters, uh, and particularly Louisiana Workers' Compensation uh, Company, corporation, is particularly interested in what we could do by way of education. So everything we did with the program was designed to ultimately come to you and, and seek uh, your stamp of approval to, to make this a classroom feature. I'm joined today by two top executives from the LPVU. I'm sure you recognize C.C. Copeland and Matthew Tessier who are here. Linda Midget, who's the executive producer of the show, is not with us this morning, but she was uh, really the creative genius behind making the television version. And I'm joined by Ann Arsenault, who's an education technology specialist at LPV, who's responsible for putting together what you'll see this morning, which is a series of resources for classroom teachers, grades 6 through 12, to uh, incorporate uh, the lessons from this documentary into the classroom. So, I'll show you this very brief uh, video as an introduction, and I'll turn it over to Ann to, to explain kind of how this came about and, and to show you one of the examples of, of these, this resource. And in the hit miniseries, Why Louisiana Ain't Mississippi or Any Place Else, LPB explores all the ways that Louisiana is just a little bit different. If you live here long enough, something was said to go Bobby is Mississippi River Water. Our unique history. <laughs> Our diverse cultures. You know what they really don't realize? They're in Indian time. This fun and educational series is now being brought to classrooms across Louisiana this fall. LBB's Education Division and Select Advisors have developed a collection of 24 medium-rich, standard-aligned curriculum supports to engage students, enhance learning, and support educators. This new offering from LBB brings that concept from the TV screen to the classroom. I'm Louisiana was part of the triangle of trade between North America, Europe, and West Africa that began in the 1700s. The nature of the slave trade during colonial times was mostly the story of the Middle Passage, and they disproportionately came from the Senegambia region. In this example curriculum support, we learn about the diverse countries and cultures that make up Louisiana, and students create their own passports to document history along the way. And this is land for King Louis. Louis. Louisiana. Each module includes a list of learning objectives, activity and lesson suggestions, resources needed, including pertinent links to support materials. 
and a lesson related clip from the documentary. Chef, when the world thinks about gumbo, they think it's a Cajun dish, a Creole dish. It's really a dish that's representative of everybody who's come to the new world through Louisiana. By identifying educational highlights from the documentary and developing simple to use, classroom ready resources for educators, LBB hopes to ignite an interest in Louisiana history and culture and inspire students to seek more. Each module is written according to Louisiana standards across subject areas. Subjects covered include English language arts, social studies, math, technology, and arts. The resources support learning in grades 6 through 12 and are easily adjustable for different grade levels. They are written for differentiation as well as enrichment opportunities. Each resource promotes group work and technological proficiency, as well as independent thinking and writing skills. Finally, the modules promote critical thinking with a cross-curricular learning scope. Both the documentary and the supporting educational resources create an awareness of the rich cultural contributions to our state made by our diverse population. Students will be inspired to discover and understand cherished Louisiana traditions. The modules help connect the past with the present and foster pride in this place we call home. So with a, a shameless uh, plug, you can, you can get the entire documentary at, uh, while at uh, LDB.org. And you can access all the information relative to the educational component at wildweekend.lpd.org. And there's a coffee table book that uh, also accompanies the show, and all the proceeds go to LPD. So if you'd like one of these, let me know. And uh, uh, LPD, friends of LPD actually get all the, the proceeds from the sale of the documentary. Um, so with that, I'll turn this over to Ann and let her give you some insight as to how this came about. Incidentally, we had four classroom teachers as consultants that worked with Ann to kind of approve exactly what was put together in these uh, 24 different uh, classroom resources that involve 80-some-odd clips from the show. Thank you, Jane. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. As you can see, the resources are steeped in history from Louisiana, but they do cover many other subject areas. The first one that we had, um, I'll show you that one if we have time, but the first one that we, the one that I want to show you is in the main subject area of science. And in this particular resource, the, uh, the students will be proving literally why Louisiana ain't Mississippi using the scientific method. Groups of students will partner with students from different states. It does not have to be Mississippi. It can be any other state. But groups of students in the classes will partner with other groups from different states. And they will be testing and making comparisons between water, soil, air, air pressure, temperature, rainfall, just to name a few. And with the water, they would test pH, color, smell, clarity, and particulates. The students would use infographics, such as graphs, tables, to present their work. They would also meet with their other schools that they would partner with through telecommunications. So they would have sort of like Zoom meetings to decide what we're going to test. And then they would come back after testing and do their uh, Zoom meetings again to present their findings of what they found in their states. Now, they don't have to only test what we've given them in the activity. We also want the students to be creative and test other things. That would be, for example, maybe they would test demographics or uh, employment rates or different things like that. But that would be left to the students. So the students would not only be proving or learning that Louisiana is unique and different from other parts of the country. They would also be using technology. They would be practicing sampling during, uh, safety during sampling. And they would also be exposed to networking. 
and all of its benefits. If you could uh, show the overview, each, each lesson comes with an overview. It comes with the standards that close better. Okay. This is it. Every lesson is embedded with a video, and I would like to show the video for this one um, after, let me explain a little bit about it. Each video clip actually comes from the documentary, Why Louisiana Ain't Mississippi. The video clip of each activity is going to be pertinent to presenting that activity to the students. So it gives you some information about what you'll need to carry out the activity or the lesson. So if you could show that video, I'd appreciate it. Lee's Lunchroom in McCown, just off I-49, has sold more than 75,000 pies in a single year. It's still worth a stop now on your way to Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge today is an amalgamation of all the cultures indigenous to Louisiana. It is neither waspy nor Cajun. It is religiously and racially diverse. Its old state capital, built in the 1850s, has been home to much history. That building has been called a place of great men, magnificent gestures, political intrigue, and war. It was the site of the Louisiana Succession Convention in 1861 and a Huey Long impeachment trial in 1929. After the Civil War, Baton Rouge became the permanent capital it's city. Not correct, but, but, uh, and also home of the ocean fighting. Yeah, it's That's not the, the correct clip for this particular uh, activity. That's the clip for the news report activity, which involves technology, ELA, social studies, and media arts and the students would be getting together in groups and doing an actual news report of a historical event, but they'd be doing it, <coughs> presenting it in uh, real time as if it were happening today. And that comes with uh, PBS NewsHour Storymaker, which would explain and walk them through it, and the students would actually learn how to do this. Now, this clip is for the actual science, uh, the Prove Why Louisiana, activity that we were talking about. The river flow measures three million gallons per second. If the levee were to be breached right here at Skip Bergman Drive, God forbid, the water would fill Tiger Stadium in 30 seconds. Too many to roll tide. <laughs> they make two points right here. I mean, right here. <laughs> The volume and force of the Mississippi carries with it nutrient-rich sediment known as alluvium. The river actually filters 40% of the dirt in America, ultimately giving rise to the nation's largest floodplain and within it, Louisiana's alluvial valley. That rich river sediment creates the finest farmland in the country. It has made Louisiana an agricultural giant and the production of beef and dairy cattle, cotton, corn, rice, and soybeans. Oh, and who could forget crawfish? We're the nation's largest domestic producer, 150 million pounds of the delicacies each year. But the Mississippi River didn't build those fertile fields all on its own. If the Mississippi had its way and the levee system had not been created to harness the river, it would eventually overtake the Atchafalaya River and hasten its race to the Gulf. The Atchafalaya flows south to the Gulf for 130 miles. The Mississippi's serpentine path through Louisiana requires 315 miles before it reaches the Gulf. It's a good thing for the economy that the two rivers remain separate and distinct. Otherwise, Baton Rouge would not be a port city, and New Orleans would become a saltwater estuary. Of course, in true colonization fashion, it was a Spaniard 
Hernando de Soto, who was credited with discovering the Mississippi River in 1541. The Spanish were the first European outsiders with whom the Native Americans had to contend. The Spaniards were explorers. They wanted to expand their castle to the 60s. So as you can see, that would be uh, an entryway, an introduction for the teacher to introduce the lesson <coughs> to the students. And they can get, kind of get a gist of what they are trying to do to prove. I will go back to the other lesson that we were talking about. It comes with uh, Story Maker software links, and it helps the students to learn about lighting, angles, script writing, and um, it guides you through that. It guides the teacher and the students through that. They can click on the links for assistance. And okay. so while presenting this last week at the Teacher Leader Summit, teachers expressed real interest in this. We discussed some things about uh, student engagement and you know, behavior in the classroom is not that great right now, but when they're engaged, when they're a part of their learning, they can, uh, when they become part of their learning, they learn it better, and they become more focused and involved in their own development. And the teacher doesn't have all the stress of trying to get the students to be interested in <coughs> They're learning. So what I would like to, you know, make sure that we have is access to these clips in the classroom for all teachers. Thank you. So just as a disclaimer, I realize that uh, it's not grammatically correct that I read this uh, this uh, program, but uh, in the interest of trying to make it something people would be interested in, we took the liberty in, in using the word "ain't." We always, always uh, use that as a disclaimer, particularly. English teachers. But in any event, thank you for giving us some time to make this presentation this morning. We ask for your endorsement uh, as this moves forward in the classroom this fall. Great. Uh, any comments or questions from members of the board? Move that we endorse. All right. There's a motion to move and endorse. It's been There's seconded. Um, any objections to that motion? No objection. The motion passes. Thank you. Congratulations. Members. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, our next item, please. Your next item, your next item is on page three, item three point two, consideration of request from local education agencies for waivers of policy contained in bulletin submitted by the state superintendent of education. Uh, the recommendation is to deny and approve. We have public comment on the CTE. All right, uh, there's a recommendation to deny. Is there? First, a motion or a second to place this item? Motion to deny and approve. Motion to deny. Motion. Uh, Mr. Melbourne, motion to deny. Second. Uh, Ms. Ellis, second the motion. All right, now uh, public comment. Let's see. Ms. Ellis. So, Following folks would make their way up. Uh, Brad Osborne uh, opposes the recommendation and wishes to speak. Well, also have Brad Osborne supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. So I have two cards, Mr. Osborne. Yeah, there are two waivers. One is uh, pretended three, transportation, and the other is not right. Three two, two point two a, and then Stacy Lewis. Opposes the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Kelly Windham opposes the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Janet Grillo or Grillo opposes, Grillo. Grillo. opposes the recommendation, does not wish to speak. And Joey Rollins, uh, that's also 3.2D, so I'll hold off on that one. Uh, Salva, you have the floor. All right. Uh, Good morning, board members. I'm Brian Osborne, a president of the St. Anthony Parish, uh, the St. Anthony Federation of Teachers and School Employees. Um, as I've mentioned um, before, I represent every job class, so it's been very interesting uh, as a teacher myself to learn about classes like um, 
transportation, bus owner operators, uh, the last few years have really struggled, and we've, we've done amazing things to try to help them uh, afford the enormous cost of these buses. So um, we're, the reason we're asking for this particular waiver is we're at a transition point where our district is looking to move toward a completely board-owned fleet. But at the same time, we're not there yet. We lack the infrastructure, the bus barns, the parking spots, the actual buses themselves to, to meet that goal. And these buses just keep getting more and more expensive. We have the largest number of bus owner operators uh, in the state of Louisiana. So we, we know we need these folks to get us to that next phase, but we want to make sure they're, they're treated fairly because they have done so much work to transport children to school. As a teacher, I, I could never teach kids that didn't show up. They needed reliable transportation. With this particular measure, you're allowing uh, bus owner operators to purchase a bus that's older than 10 years. Um, these are the folks that know how to keep these buses well maintained. Um, they work in groups. They help each other with labor. They keep these uh, buses reliable and on the road. Uh, denying them this has kind of pulled the rug out from under them. They feel like that they cannot um, plan their futures effectively. It's not as if they want to go from being an owner-operator to an operator. Our owner-operators are very proud people. They're hardworking. They take pride in ownership. So we might just lose these folks that we desperately need. We cannot afford to lose one of them in St. Tammany Parish. We're already short. This is already a critical shortage area. So we are desperate for you to, to, to grant this waiver. Um, and that's uh, that's where I stand on it. These, these are amazing people, and they're critical to the functioning of our parish. Now, within the, within the rules that are promulgated, a bus driver can buy a bus at 10 years, which is the cap, current cap, and they can go on and keep driving that bus for 15 more years, but if they happen to retire, let's say after three years of driving that bus, then that bus is 13 years old, another owner-operator cannot buy that bus, even though it's a bus that's already in the system. So some of these rules just seem arbitrary, and we're just asking not for a permanent waiver, but just for a window of time so that we can responsibly transition from owner-operators to a board-owned fleet, and it may take up to 10 years. We don't know, but we just need a little bit of relief right now. Thank you. Great, thank you, sir. We also have uh, Mr. Frank Javier, Superintendent, and Steve Alfonso uh, to speak with respect to this item. Uh, Mr. Superintendent, please identify yourself. Frank Javi, the Superintendent of St. Tammy Parish Public Schools. Thank you, Mr. Casey. Uh, thank you, board members. And, as was previously stated, St. Tammy Parish has the largest uh, number of owner operated bus operators in the entire state. We are transitioning as a parish through attrition and retirement to a school board owned fleet, but we do not have the ability just to ask those drivers to step away. So what we're asking for is a waiver that would give us the opportunity to allow those buses that fall within 10 and 15 years to that were owned by a owner operator to just remain in our fleet so that an owner operator whose bus is aging out could go ahead and take that bus and continue to drive it as long as it passed inspection and as long as it didn't hit that 25 year old cap. Um, so we're just looking to try to bump those people out. Buses are very expensive. Uh, we do not want to force anyone out of their profession. Uh, and starting over for a bus less than 10 years sometimes can be very demanding. So we're just asking to keep a bus that's already in our fleet and the owner operator has given it up, retired, um, unexpectedly passed away, whatever it might be, for that bus to remain in our fleet so that we can continue to, to use that bus and I'm going to have Mr. Alfonso address kind of some insurance in a little bit more detail than we have. Uh, thanks for having me, Chairman, Dr. Trumbo, the board. My name is Steve Alfonso, I'm Assistant Superintendent of HR, and I'm a, I'm a former Transportation Director at St. Tammany Parish Schools. I'm not going to be repetitive in what was said by Superintendent Mr. Osborne, but one thing I'd really like to say is that uh, these bus owner operators are very important individuals. From an HR standpoint, this is really a retention thing. So we ask for this waiver 
to retain these good people in current positions. I'd just like to provide an example to you. We have a bus owner operator retiring who drove a special education bus. A bus is 14 years old, currently at general system. We had a driver transferred to a sped route from a regulated route, and they're asking to purchase that bus. Under the current guidelines, they cannot. So that's just one, you know, so that is something that this may force this guy out of the profession. One technicality I'd like to bring up, please, is that from an insurance standpoint, these buses, these people who resign or retire, these buses are currently in our fleet, are insured for the fiscal year, July 1 to June 30th. So at the end of the school year, say May 20th, technically that bus is still in our system until July 1. So we're asking just simply to transfer ownership to these wonderful bus owner operators and retain them as employees. Great, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, guys. All right. Uh, Mr. This this Superintendent, would you like to make any comments? Uh, relative to the transportation work? Yes, please. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's fairly uh, it's fairly simple in terms of the recommendation. Uh, this particular uh, body put in place a policy that says that uh, one can't introduce a bus into the system if it's older than 10 years. And so I don't know the history on why that policy was put in place. I'm not sure when. I think Ms. Davis is exploring that. Um, we were just simply uh, adhering to uh, what this board's policy says. Um, should this board decide to, to, to make a waiver, we understand that. Uh, should this board decide to review the policy in and of itself, we would understand that. Uh, we just had concerns as administration when there was a policy in place um, that was probably relative to student safety with these buses over 10 years old. Uh, in, in making a recommendation to waive that way, that uh, policy. Thank you, Dr. Brumley. Mr. Garvey. Yes, I um, um, dug into this issue a little bit, and I'd like to share some information with the board. I think we have Mr. Como from the staff here, who uh, some considered him our bus expert. He could come down. He denies that title, but he denies being an expert. Uh, so, Michael Como uh, is with the agency. Uh, Mike, come on down. Um, and uh, he doesn't seem to want to come on down. <laughs> no, that's, a, that's a hesitant walk, Mike Como. Uh, but in terms of uh, responsibilities, Mike does a lot with um, student safety, uh, which also does include the buses, and he is our resident expert in transportation. Uh, I don't think a lot of desk members know what what are the different features between these older buses and the newer buses what is the reason that Desi set this policy up whenever it was years ago that it set this up uh, are the reasons for it good enough to keep the policy should we review the policy could you tell us some more about it please yes uh, Michael Connell has to be health and community director here at the department uh, we expect that the standards from the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety uh, Commission will uh, improve or be recommended over time. As I mentioned to you, there are some features that are on uh, new buses that have been improved in the last few years, like energy absorbing seating, uh, some side skirt reinforcement. Yeah, that's, that's the case the bus was in an accident. Right. It makes the, uh, the students less likely to get injured. Yes, there's compartmentalized seating and then there's padding um, that's associated with that compartmentalized seating that's been improved over the years. So that, that's an added safety feature and it's been improved as time has gone by. And as you can imagine, there's been some design and construction improvements uh, as well. Uh, are there any, anything else other than the seat padding? Yes, like I mentioned, side skirt reinforcement, there's some roof tiles, uh, there's double bolted mounting clips uh, for the body as it goes onto the bus. I'm not an engineer or a mechanical expert, probably manufacturers can tell you how those things uh, have improved over the years, but I think uh, in a new bus you can see some of those things. There's some other collision mitigation things, smart braking, cameras, uh, auto reversing doors and seat belts that can be added as well. And 
can some of these things be added to a bus that's more than 10 years old? Like upgrade the bus? Or? Not, not a lot of cost. For instance, I thought uh, you had mentioned that it was possible. Well, for instance, we've explored the idea of adding seat belts to hold the bus, and it's very costly. But the new buses come with seat belts? They can. They can, it's not, but not, not necessarily? Not mandatory. Do you know how long this waiver has been in place? Since when was the last time we reviewed it to see if it was paid it's, It was before my time, I think, that that's about the 10 year policy. <laughs> and before your time would be roughly how many years ago? 2008, maybe. <laughs> do you think maybe it's time for us to review it again? Or, or do you think it's a, a good policy to have in place? I would advise that we get together with some transportation experts that, uh, and to protect <laughs> that policy, yes. But I, I think the transportation industry as a whole uh, feels like the life expectancy of a bus is about 12 to 15 years. It is it possible for us to defer on this motion until we have a chance to review the policy? Or is this a way Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a question that the board would have to decide, not my promote, but um, uh, Mike certainly is willing to pull together manufacturers who work in this industry and uh, provide additional detail. But we can, in St. County, wait, or does it need an answer on this waiver today? That would be a uh, Superintendent Jabby question. He's raising his hand. Superintendent, you want to come back up for us, please? Alfonso? Yes, sir. Steve Alfonso, Assistant Superintendent of HR at St. Tammy Parish Schools. Um, I'd just really like to speak on the waiver in general and answer Mr. Garvey's question. All the upgrades of those buses, that can happen. St. Tammy Parish Schools employs a safety manager who personally inspects every bus we have. The thing about the waiver that really made us apply for the waiver is that if that person that's retiring at 14 years decides not to retire, that bus can stay in for another 11 years. So the bus is currently our system. We ask them to leave it in our system. We constantly maintaining our buses and inspecting our buses. And please remember that it's two inspections yearly that all buses go through. The one can be done by the LEA, the other is done by a state inspector, which we employ for them. So just please keep that in mind when uh, with the waiver, with the request of the waiver. It looks back to the, the timing of the waiver. Yes, sir. Can it wait until August? No, sir. We need to start. We need to start school, sir. Uh, our first day of school is August the tenth, and we have some bus, some bus owner operators with some buses aging out that need to purchase a bus for the price of inflation and the cost of the buses is going to make them either resign or retire. And how many buses are we talking about that you would have this waiver apply to? But we have a total of, within the next three years, we have a total of 14 buses, 14 bus owner operators who have buses aging out. If I'm not mistaken, sir, it's four this year, and one's in attendance today. Four, four buses? Four buses this year, yes, sir. How, how many buses total? Uh, we have 304 owner operators. When? So that's 1% of the Yes, sir. It's a very minuscule percentage. Yes, sir. I'd be interested in hearing what this motion is. Motion. I just have a couple of questions. When you say aging out, tell me what you mean by aging out. That's a transportation terminology, ma'am. What aging out simply means that when a bus turns 25 years old, you don't, you can no longer use it to transport children. That's right. That. So, I, I just have a couple of questions. So your inspections just follow the two a year, one by the state inspector, and one by your. That's. Local. Yes, ma'am, that's a requirement. We do do more, though, because we have four investigators who go out and inspect. Are Hopefully. any limits placed on mileage as opposed to age, or is there a combination? Of no, ma'am. No, so it could be a bus with 50,000 miles on it or a bus with 200,000 miles on it. That's correct, the yes, The issue is the bus itself would be number of years. The, um, when Superintendent Brumley said, um, policy applies to buses being introduced into the school system. Would we consider them these buses 
that you're describing that are already in the school system being introduced into the school system or just an ownership transfer? Is there any distinction there? Microphone. Yes, it's, it's an ownership, so uh, it cannot be sold if it's over 10 years of age. It can stay in the system, if, but if it's sold or leased, it, then... It can so be. our policy currently um, applies to ownership as opposed to buses already in the fleet or not already in the fleet. You know, I, I'm kind of a little bit, you know, we all operate all of our districts operate school systems. I know charters uh, contract with operators as well. And there's always, you know, everybody is looking to have the safest buses on the road. And that's why the inspection processes are so intense, because they have to go through those inspections by third party people who are not the owners operating. You know, these are people who, are, who know what the safety measures are and can go in and make sure the bus is in those conditions. And there are certain upgrades that can be done. And many of us across the state own our own buses, and some do as St. Tammany has done and contract with owner-operated buses. And I think primarily charters operate with owner-operated um, companies or owner-operated buses. I would, you know, I, I'd like to see us revisit this policy, like Barbie is suggesting, to maintain the safety standards, but take a look at some of the reasonableness on this, because we have buses all across the state that are more than 10 years on the road each and every day transporting our students. We have buses 11 to 25 years. And that's why I asked you about the age. I couldn't remember what the actual um, lifespan was. Uh, I think there is a difference between buses that are continuing within a system and then something that you're going outside of the system to purchase and reintroduce into the system. Now, Mr. Alfonso, I know you said that you need an answer today and that it couldn't wait, but I would, I would um, ask you maybe to reconsider that particular response because if we are going to look at this, because this is something for this board to look at, we're looking at safety concerns with children being transported, and also looking at are these buses reliable to be on the road, and are they part of your system? At least those are some of the concerns that I have. So I would like to push this back to August. It may affect a couple of your drivers, but this is a larger issue than one, two, three, or four. Um, bus operators. It's really a policy that we're looking at that's a statewide policy that we have to be comfortable with to show that, um, you know, that uh, we're taking this seriously. Um, not only forget insurance and liability issues, which are things we have to consider, but these are children that we're transporting and the safety of those children are paramount. You know, I, I, I would just like to make a substitute motion on this that we defer this until the August meeting and ask the department to uh, reevaluate and take a look at the policy and see if they can come back with some type of a recommendation. It's been a substitute made, motion made by Ms. Bush. Is there a second to that? Mr. Garvey seconds that, that motion. Any additional discussion on the substitute motion, Mr. Alfonso? Uh, Ms. Bocek, thank you very much. Anything this board can do to help our school system and these other options, we appreciate. But I just want to make one thing, a little clarity, what we do as a school system in regards to being compliance with Bolton 119. 119 <coughs> the issue is safety, and we're aware of that. But what we do, we can have the LEA can do an inspection, and the state can do it, the state certified inspector can. We employ state certified inspectors. But we require our owner operators to go to an inspection state inspection station twice a year where we can do one. So they get state inspected twice plus we inspect. So I just want to get that point of clarity out there. And that could be part of something that we consider when we look at the policy. So I think it would behoove everyone to defer this until August to see if there are recommendations that could be made that would satisfy all parties. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, Mr. Morris and then Mr. Harvey. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a question about a point of order. 
they take precedence. Uh, the, the substitute motion, I think prior to the substitute motion, we had a motion on the floor to cover several items. And I'm seeing a, 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 I think a yes from our staff. Uh, the substitute motion, I believe, is intended to cover just, just for one eight. item. Yes. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that. It just covers the bus waiver issue. Yes. And not the library waiver. That's my intent. We have to do it a different way. No. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Mr. Lawrence? Yeah, uh, obviously safety is the most important issue here, but uh, Superintendent Moshe also alluded to the liability. So I was curious, is there any, are there any reliability metrics in our school bus system that, that uh, count for? Well, yeah, yes, sir. We, we uh, our owner operators pay a portion of uh, liability insurance, but the school system takes up the majority. So they're covered liability wise. Yes, I'm sorry, let me try again. Yes, sir. I'm personally relative to reliability. Oh, reliability. Reliability. Well, that, that's part of the inspection process, sir, to see the reliability of those buses. And if we, we, and it's, I know we have some attendance here, I would say this, we pull buses off the streets a lot when they're not reliable, they're not up to our standards. So, so you guys have records of reliability? A record of reliability? Right. Yes, sir, we have records. Yes, sir. Okay. okay, how do you, how do you, how do you steward? I mean, how do you account for that? What is your, what is your uh, means of measurement? They're they're uh, on time, certain percent of the time, or they'll like, break down X number of times a year. How, how do you guys account for that? We have, uh, as a staff, we have five investigators. That's what their title is a job class in our office. Plus, we have a safety manager. Plus, we have a fleet manager. All those guys are required to inspect these buses and do spot inspections and run. So the matrix is but check we have the edge lock system to see the reliability of those buses when they're arriving and things like that. And we keep documentation of all those facets. Okay. If, if we do in fact prefer it, you guys come back again, I'd like to see that data if you could provide it. That'd be yeah. helpful. I'll be very together. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, again, this motion to pass at 3.2A. Uh, any objections to the substitute motion? Seeing, hearing, I'm oh, sorry. Can I speak to that motion before the vote? Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> uh, respectfully, so this waiver applies to these buses, and I'm, I'm all about safety as well. But thinking in terms of safety, losing experienced drivers, so I'd rather have a driver who has 25 years of experience and a 15 year old bus that's well maintained than a brand new bus with a year zero drive. You know, to talk about safety. So yes, the mechanics and the nuts and bolts are important, but the most important element is that bus owner operator. And we honestly cannot lose a single one. So I know we're saying it's a handful, but this affects four to five people that will have an impact on our system, that will have an impact on safety if we replace them with much less experienced drivers. Thank you. Great, right. thank you, sir. All right, uh, in light of those additional comments, any objection? Hearing, seeing none, the uh, motion passes. All right, that takes us to our next item, and that would be 3.2B. Um, likewise, as a motion, as a recommendation to not to get this before our board for consideration. Can I get a motion? We already have a motion. All right, we have public comments then. We have Mr. Jaffe, we'll get you up again first this time, and again, Mr. Alfonso. Obviously, we've been very popular this morning. But, um, thank you all for hearing this, uh, Mr. Castillo and board members. Today, with, with the librarians waiver that we're asking for, they're asking you strictly as an HR measure. Uh, St. Tanya Parish, we were 90 teachers short last year. We used 90 long-term subs or temporary teachers to fill vacancies. Without this waiver, seven teachers will come out of the classroom where they're working right now to overstaff our libraries. We've already met with our library librarians of our high schools, middle and elementary to discuss measures that we can use to support them, whether it be by library aides or by extra clerical, helping them out. But the only people that can take these library positions are certified teachers. So we're talking about seven more teachers in St. Tammany coming out of a classroom of students.
to work in the library as a librarian. So we're not trying to not support our librarians. We're not trying to do anything like that. It's strictly an HR measure we're trying to get some help from you guys with as a waiver to give us another year to see if we can do some things to staff our or to fill our vacancies in our classroom that will allow us to then fill the vacancies that may be created in our library. So this is strictly an HR response to make sure that we have our classrooms fully staffed. Thanks again, Steve Alfonso, Assistant Superintendent. Uh, just to pony up what Superintendent Javi has said, this is an HR thing. Uh, I just want to bring some things to your attention with the shortages, and I know you guys are fully aware of that. At Job Fair, we had 640 applicants sign up to attend job fair for roughly approximately 400 attended and uh, after reviewing our documents after job fair which was roughly a month ago we're still in the same position we we're in last year with our current vacancies which some were filled by long-term subs in, in that regard so if this waiver is not passed it will impact our classroom will impact our students and will take the teacher out of the classroom that will hurt so just from an HR standpoint so this, this will have an impact on us. Right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Alfonso. We also have Mr. Brad Osborne, who also wishes to speak on this particular issue. He supports the recommendation. Uh, and then we have Ms. Uh, Jody Rollins, who supports the recommendation, but does not wish to speak. Mr. Osborne. Yes, again, Brian Osborne, uh, president of the St. Anthony Federation of Teachers and School Employees. Uh, we structure our union around action committees. Certainly one of those organized action committees going is the Librarian Action Committee. Uh, they overwhelmed me with the amount of research they had done, and color-coded charts, and all these things, just showing uh, not only are we out of compliance, but we've been out of compliance for over 10 years. Um, I came into the system as a teacher in 2002. Um, at Slido High School, we had a primary librarian, a secondary librarian, both certified, and they had a library aide. And then by the time I uh, left the uh, teaching ranks in 2020, they were down to a single librarian. So I feel like our libraries have uh, withered on the vine for over 10 years. And you know, administration, I love my administration, we don't always see eye to eye. We don't see this as an HR thing. We see this as a literacy thing. We see this as impacting children. Libraries are the place I, love, I learned to love reading. And that's what's missing right now. Uh, COVID only accelerated the decline of these libraries, all the additional li uh, responsibilities being piled on librarians, it varies by school, but from Chromebooks to every other catch-all to help out administration, you know, pulling these people to sub in classrooms because we have uh, substitute shortages. These folks don't recognize the profession anymore, and some are quitting. It, it, it's unheard of to see a librarian not finish their career. And last year, I know of two that left because they were so frustrated. And one was on my committee and just didn't believe the committee could get anything done. And so I come out here today because all of them are scared to talk to you. They don't want to speak out. Um, they respect their superintendent, but they clearly feel passionately. So my job is to be their representative, to be their voice. And I beg you to deny this work so that we can begin to rebuild these libraries in St. Tammany Parish so we can once again have a world-class school system. Thank you. Mr. Garvey. Uh, yes, yeah, so the speaker could remain. Mr. Osborne. Uh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Garvey. I'll call the question. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, you said that the librarians are frustrated. Yes, sir. Are they frustrated about being librarians? They are frustrated that what they do every day no, no longer matches what their job description states. It no longer looks like what they went to school to do, which is to instill a love of uh, reading, uh, the ability to teach uh, valuable skills such as research skills, uh, media literacy, those sorts of things. They become so inundated with other administrative types of requests that what they know and love is being stripped away from them. That's the source of the frustration. And it's just hard to keep their head above water. There's a nuts and bolts component. They have to reshelve books. They have to order books. Um, in our district, it was stated on the public record that every new book coming into the library has to be 
reviewed by the librarian. And we all know there's a lot of concerns about collections and things like that. How can we expect an understaffed librarian, often a single librarian, to meet the demand of reviewing every book coming into a library? It's impossible. Um, it's probably impossible even if you had a full staff, but they don't have a full staff. So that is at the heart of the frustration, that they are being asked to do things that are changing what a library looks like and basically making it defunct. Uh, I've gotten several emails and uh, an anonymous letter, a letter written by someone I know, but it's not signed and no name is attached, uh, saying that the librarians are being asked to do a lot of non-librarian tasks, uh, substitute teaching as an example, uh, tracking on <coughs> books, which is not a library task. Is that, is that really yeah, yeah, it's accurate. And it, it does vary by school. There are schools where the administration makes accommodations to get some help. But out of 55, you know, there are some that, that really seriously need um, assistance. And I'm not sure how many librarians, I think I heard six, they need six high school librarians to meet the minimum standard. I know Mandeville High School. How many? Six or seven. Okay. So Mandeville High, they recommend having three because it's a, a over 2,000 plus student population, they have a single librarian. That's it. That's, impo that's an impossible thing. Uh, the only rule was that I heard was that if you have more than 1,000, you're supposed to have two librarians. Okay, yeah. So like you're saying there's another rule that says if you have 2,000 students, you're supposed to have three librarians? Okay, so there are rules and suggestions. So the LDOE has their own recommendations, but that doesn't have the force of a BESI mandate. So I think you're accurate. Uh, the minimum is what has to be enforced. But the recommendations are something we should consider, I believe. No, that's no, not why we're here today. There's a, a school in St. Tammany that has 3,000 students and one library. Over 2,000. Over 2,000 students with one library. Yes, sir. Over 2,000. Uh, do, do you see, if this, if we, this waiver were denied, is it going to contribute to the teacher shortage? Or are um, there teachers that would want to be a librarian that would not quit being a regular teacher if they were they were forced to be a regular teacher would they be more likely to quit and, and therefore I really don't think so because it's such a niche degree and people are gonna have to go into debt to get that degree. And I would also um, have the board consider uh, two years ago, we grew the size of government at St. Tammany, opened up all these administrative positions, and there are all these other ancillary positions that have been opened up. So if we're able to pull those people out of the classroom and ignore minimum standards, then maybe we need to take a look at what we're doing. I think we need to meet the minimum standards. Thank you. And actually, I'd like to say something. So, the week you know, the CFM was the I think it might need to fill out a card and do it. Yeah, just have a card and say how you fill out. Right, so uh, I understand that, I don't know who the lady is, but she'll introduce What's herself, but she has Jody a card. Robbins, do I need to check the other box? We'll, we'll check it for Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Robbins. I have her? Jody Rollins. Um, I don't live in St. Tammany Parish, but I worked as an advocate there. And I am asking the Bessie board to not give them any waivers. Uh, I'm glad to see that Superintendent Jabiet knows how many teachers he's short. I guess he's one of the like 70% that responded to you guys asking them how many teachers they were short. Last time I looked at the numbers, St. Tammany Parish was a very wealthy parish. If Superintendent Jabia is short staff, what is he doing? to encourage more teachers to want to work in his district and librarians and bus drivers. We talk about autonomy in the state of Louisiana. I hear that word so much I could spit. Give the LEAs autonomy. Give them autonomy. Let them run the show. Run it, Superintendent Javia. If you cannot get teachers to your district, don't put the labor on the ones you have. That makes no sense. He shouldn't be given a waiver when it's his responsibility and his school board responsibility to fill the teacher shortages because it's not money. That's not why. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, Dr. Brown, would you like to comment on this particular topic? 
Yeah, thank you, uh, President Steele. I just want to uh, make sure the board appreciates uh, where we are on this recommendation. So there is a policy that states that high schools that have over a thousand student membership uh, have to have more than one librarian. And so, of course, the, the administration of, of St. Tammany is asking for a waiver of that. Uh, our, our rationale here is simply one, it's best in policy, but two, we are providing so much emphasis right now on literacy uh, that we don't want to scale back in, in those efforts. And, and further, um, with all of the work in terms of looking at what is developmentally appropriate in terms of being in our school libraries, we know that our, our, our librarians have a lot of, uh, uh, of effort uh, and, and time needed to do those tasks and to cultivate uh, those, those that love of reading in their students. And so we just did not want to back down uh, in terms of uh, reducing uh, the need to have more of our students engaging every day with, with, with librarians and cultivating that, that love of reading. So that's the, the rationale for the recommendation to deny the uh, waiver request. All right, thank you. Uh, we have heard public comment as a motion and a second. Is there any? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Um, I think we're losing sight of our children in the, this fight. Uh, if y'all don't know that, that's why I'm here. I'm a student and I became on this board. Um, I understand that librarians are important, as all people in education are important, educators, administration, anything. But if if denying this waiver is going to cause more libraries to come and less teachers to come, then I think we're losing sight of our children. Because I know in my school, our librarian does not teach a class. Uh, she helps in classes. Uh, classes go to her. She explains how to check out a library book, and she does that. But she does not teach children. Uh, teachers teach children. And um, if a teacher is going to be taken out of the classroom to fill a position that necessarily doesn't teach children, then maybe we just need to evaluate what are we doing for the teachers that teach children and less for the librarians that help them. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any additional comments from members of the board? Dr. Wilkie. I, I would like to be reminded what motion is on the floor. To deny. A motion to deny. Okay. okay. Right. The motion to deny the waivers on the floor. Any objections to that motion? Hearing, seeing none, that motion passes. All right, our next item. Do we also want to um, see if there's any discussion on C? There's no comments on C. There are no comments on C? All right, and that was part of our consent agenda item? Well, no, it's part of the motion on the floor. All right, uh, having said that, any objections to that motion? No objections, that motion passes as well. Next item. Mr. Chair? Yes. Can you take a moment? personal privilege to introduce someone. Sure, go ahead. State Representative Kathy Edmonston. Thank you for being here. I noticed you coming in. Next item is on page 9, item 3.3, consideration of a student waiver request for exit to adult education. The recommendation is to approve. All right. Uh, I will know that this Patricia Anselin uh, is here and says that she supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. I'm going to get a motion on the floor, but um, let's see, Matt Davis, uh, Mr. Mellorin seconds that. Uh, I don't know that there's any objection to that motion, uh, but I don't want to prevent uh, Ms. Anselin from speaking. Is she here? State your name. Trish Hanselet. Uh, back in February, oh, we just. Ms. Hanselet, yes, one little housekeeping matter. I've changed the uh, amount of comment time to okay. two minutes for everyone. Yeah, We've got a large crowd, so okay. just to let everyone know. Yeah, it's real short. Uh, back in February, we decided that my son would do best in adult education and earning his high set diploma. Um, we've been fighting with the school board since then to um, get it approved when others had previously been approved and I'm trying to get him in as soon as possible whether he turns 18 in two months um, we're wanting to get him started as soon as possible so he can start working on a trade and um, I'm just trying to fight that in mind. Thank you ma'am. Uh, Mr. Robert? I have a question for the speaker. You said your son is going to be 
seeking the high set mm -hmm. or pay, seeking to pass the high set. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. um, there's been a lot of discussion lately about the high set not providing appropriate opportunities to children. Uh, do you see the high set is holding your child back? Appropriate as opposed to getting a, a regular high school diploma. So the appropriate opportunities as in what? Whatever opportunities you'll be looking to seek later on. So once he gets his high set there, he can go on to a trade. He can go on to a community college. Mm -hmm. He can even and do after a... after that, if he would like to go to a university. He could, but I know my son will be university material. Thank you. All right, uh, that said, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, any comments, questions from the board? Any objection to the motion? I just want to make a comment. Not yes, ma'am. I'm not going to object to the motion, but I just want to get back. I don't think if you high set for community college entrance, you know, if there's discussions with the uh, community college that could start the program without the high set. So just for information purposes, it's not a requirement for entrance. Great, thank you, Ms. Froche. All right, any additional comments or questions? Hearing none, seeing none, the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item. The next item is on page 27, item 4.1, consideration of a report regarding the new Meridian Mathematics Assessment by the program. The recommendation is to receive. All right, is there a motion to receive? Ms. Alice moves, and Mr. Morris seconds. While we wait, Mr. Mr. just to set this up, um, we are we are all interested in um, how we can think about in the future of assessment, um, getting our teachers results uh, as quickly as possible to inform instruction. Um, we are thinking about opportunities uh, where we might be able to reduce the amount of time that that students are tasked with actually testing that takes away from instructional time during the school day. Uh, there was a meeting, uh, I mean, there was a request last meeting uh, to add uh, one of our partners uh, to this agenda to share some of the pilot work that we've been working on uh, with them. Uh, and as we think about what the future of assessment might look like, uh, are there opportunities over the course of the year in a, in a through course model uh, to assess students in a, in a timely, uh, developmentally appropriate way and provide that feedback to teachers uh, so that it can inform their instruction. So uh, one of the partners that, that we have worked with in, in helping us think through this, uh, as well as other partners, uh, is uh, New Meridian. And so um, I believe uh, that they would like to make a few comments about uh, their work with us um, and uh, provide any additional uh, commentary. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? My yes. name is Ashley Eden. I'm the Senior Vice President of State Partnerships at New Meridian. And just our mission statement up front, New Meridian is a nonprofit on a mission to advance high quality education for each and every student. And what, we, what drives our day-to-day -day work is that we envision a world of curious and engaged thinkers who are ready to solve the problems of tomorrow. Um, so just very quickly, uh, the states we work with um, we're currently working in the department, or in Louisiana, we make some of the items for the LEAP assessment. We also create all of the items for ELA and math for the Bureau of Indian Education, for the Department of Defense. Illinois, we create items for their science assessment and their ELA and math assessment. Um, in New Jersey, we create the ELA and math assessment there, also in DC. In Maine, we create just their science assessment, and in Montana, we're doing a pilot that I'll speak a little bit more about here in a second. And so I'm gonna keep this pretty quick because this is just our first year of a pilot in the state, but just to give you a brief overview um, to add on to what Superintendent Brumley started with, is we make summative assessments. We're a summative assessment company, and we've long understood and heard, though, that summative assessment results aren't supposed to be used to provide instructional value in the classroom real time. I was a deputy secretary and chief of staff in New Mexico, 
So I would say I use summative assessment results almost every day to make policy decisions, to make decisions around resource allocation. It was very important to me that we had good data, but I was sympathetic for teachers and parents who said, I don't get that back until the end of the year, and my students are already moving on to the next grade. So what are we supposed to do to help them understand that fourth grade material when they're already in fifth grade? So as a nonprofit assessment company, we went into the field and we asked folks about it, and we we're like, well, does your interim assessment provide that type of data? And pretty overwhelmingly, we heard from, um, from district superintendents and teachers that it didn't give them the type of data they needed to be instructionally relevant and to provide um, actions that they could do in the classroom to help that student. So this is just one example of some of the frustrations we heard. Um, so if you start at the bottom, um, they go about a third of the year and you test all the state standards. This is just an off-the-shelf interim product. And so the student is experiencing questions that they've, they've not been taught yet. So it can be a frustrating experience because they're, they're like, I don't know this. Am I doing something wrong? What don't I understand? And so it shows where the student is at that point. And then you go throughout the year, it shows what we consider artificial growth because really it's just representing what the student has learned throughout the year. And by the end of the year, they should have covered all the standards. So that's not traditionally what we would call growth. That's just opportunity to learn and showing up. And it's a frustrating experience for the student. So we've thought about what does the continuous feedback look like? How could it look? Um, so can we focus on the instruction, not take assessment out of the instruction, but instead embed it in? So the teacher teaches a unit, the students are participating, they take a quick check-in on that unit, and then the, they start the next unit. But the teacher gets immediate feedback on what of the state standards were mastered and which ones weren't, so they can provide immediate support in their classroom for that student. Um, here's just an example of how we did it. So this is, this is fifth grade math, and it doesn't represent all of your state standards, but um, a portion of them. So we take all the standards, which are over here on the right, and we've created clusters. Um, from these clusters, we've, so each of these clusters are the boxes at the top. And again, this does not represent all of the Louisiana state standards because the slide would be too busy. But let's say we have all of the clusters of standards at the top. We can take any scope and sequence. So you see here, we've aligned it to Eureka. Um, any scope and sequence. I don't have my animation on this slide. That's okay. So each of those boxes would slide in. So we can say, okay, if you're doing Eureka, no problem. We'll start with place value in this first testing window, and then we'll move to fraction, addition, and subtraction in the second window, if that is how Eureka has you teaching and learning. But what we found is that um, there's actually a little less adherence to commercial scope and sequence in ELA than there is in math. And so we can also just sit down and teach with a teacher and say, what do you teach and when? And then we can create our assessments throughout the year perfectly aligned to what that teacher's scope and sequence is. So flexible scope and sequence that covers the entire breadth of state standards. Then right after each administration window, the teacher would get back a report like this. So it shows of these clusters of state standards, what was mastered and what wasn't. So very quickly they can say, oh, I need to go back. I actually didn't teach that particular skill very well. I need to go back and reteach it. Or I can create small groups to make sure that certain, certain groups of students can get up to speed before we go on to the next topic, et cetera. And what we found is that reports like this just don't exist in the field today. For some of the interims, it just says, your child got this score, and at that score, they can do these types of skills usually. It's not spe specific to how they responded on the assessment to questions about those particular standards. And then um, we haven't done it here in Louisiana, but we're still working with the department. By the end of the year, we are going to create a psychometric model so that it could replace the end of the year assessment. So we roll these little assessments up throughout the year, and then you still do get a summative end of year assessment, or we could not do that. We think there's still a lot of value in throughout the year just giving the immediate feedback on standards to teachers. So uh, I promise I keep it short, 
So this past year has been a pretty small pilot. We've been working with the Louisiana Department of Education. Um, more than 1,800 students participated. Um, over here on the right, you see the, the school districts in which we um, piloted this year. So we did four administration windows. This year, um, we didn't align scope and sequence to our items, so it was the first year of the pilot this past year, but this next school year, it will be aligned. So over the summer, we're sitting down with district administrators, we're saying what scope and sequence do you use, what curriculum do you use, and this year, the students will experience the assessment that is exactly aligned with what's being taught in the classroom. So we're really excited uh, about the data and the feedback we'll get this year. And that's it. Uh, we're, we're hoping to expand here, but very small pilot this year, um, and working with the department. So that's it. I promise I'd keep it short, but open to any questions. Yep. Great. Ms. Bojack. Yeah, I have a question. You talked about aligning, aligning it to the Eureka curriculum, which, you know, I understand a uh, uh, many, many districts use that. There are other tier one curriculums that district use, that district use, I read and some others that have been identified. Mm -hmm. When you talk about aligning them to the district standards, within this continuing pilot, are you going to do it not only with Eureka, but with whatever curriculum is being used and how it approaches? Because they may be <coughs> teaching different standards at different times, and it really is no value if it's out of sync with whatever it is that that particular district is doing. So, that's part A to the question, and we talked a little bit about looking at it um, as a, an interim assessment to potentially or possibly replace end of year summary of assessments as sleep is. Um, and I guess this would be a wrong no, question I'll or whatever. Comment and then turn it over. Yeah. And the comment I'll offer is that um, I've been pretty clear that I think that this needs to be. Uh, curriculum agnostic as much as possible, directly relative to the standards as a whole for the state. Um, because we want to maintain um, the local decision making around curriculum so the as it gets the ultimate standards. So I do think that that's a place where we have to be really careful. And I think it is a very important question that you raised. Uh, and so we're looking at your exactly. And so that's that's one example. But for us as an agency, what would be important is that um, if you do this, that it would be ultimately uh, where it would be uh, <coughs> not requiring a particular curriculum that would take away from local decision making around that, but tied more directly to the standards that she showed earlier on the right side of your screen. It, and the reason I'm asking you this and then you can respond is. You listed the seven districts. My district was one of them. We had a little red box around it. And we're not sure what we're going to do with this pilot because you're basing it now on the Eureka modules, which we don't use Eureka now at, the, at that level. So that was the reason. Yes, thank you so much for the question. The little red box was so that I could acknowledge you, so sorry I didn't do that when I came to that slide. So thank you for uh, participating this past year with us. Um, I want to be very clear, as Superintendent Romley said, the, the way we are thinking about through course testing is fundamentally different than I think the way anyone has done it yet so far, and that we are absolutely curriculum agnostic, curriculum flexible. So these boxes here up top where we take the state standards and we put them into clusters, we can then order those clusters in any way. So you're right, we use, we put Eureka on this slide because in Louisiana that's been mostly what it's been doing. But we're working with your district currently and we're saying what do you use and we will align to that. So it, this is just to demonstrate um, how it works with Eureka, but it could be a homegrown system or it could be any other tier one, uh, we can align to any uh, curriculum as long as that curriculum covers the breadth of all the, uh, all the state standards. Okay, so I just wanted to clear that up because I know a lot of districts are in that in a similar situation. Yes, thank you so much for the question because it is, we would not have designed a system that couldn't flexibly align to every different district and what they're 
I will say we're also piloting in Montana. Montana has some, I guess, the most one-room schoolhouses in the in the state. And so they eventually might get to a place where each classroom might, they can do competency-based learning. So they, a teacher can create these modules on their own and help uh, someone could virtually coach the student throughout the year. We're not there yet. That's just a vision they have. Uh, but the flexibility exists within the system to do things like that. And I realize we talked about that this now pilot, the same thing has, has been occurring with the LA pilot with the basis on the, on the guidebooks, where many districts don't use the guidebooks, they'll use with wisdom and some others, and I know that there um, are discussions now with the um, you with wisdom, looking at some of the assessments along the way there. So I just want to you know, caution everyone to have got to be cognizant of the curriculum being used by all districts and all schools as long as they have, they do have the two different steps. I'm not talking accommodate everyone who's using everything, but the designated piece is acceptable curriculum, so we've got to accommodate those districts. Great. Um, Ms. Holloway. Ms. Holloway. Uh, no, I was just going to reiterate the importance of Superintendent Thursday's question. This is really important. Um, and also, it is priority for us of maintaining autonomy and curriculum uh, decision making, uh, which uh, I mean, the um, New Meridian team can tell you. So, if you look at the example here, it was a pretty catchy little uh, flashy show she just put on with these falling down into the right place. Um, but so that's showing the standards and where they fall in the sequence within this particular curriculum. So if you had a different uh, curriculum with a, within a different system, this flow and this drop down would happen in a, in a different format. And so that's what's really important to us in moving forward is, is making sure that um, we can respect that um, local decision making around curriculum decisions, which is, um, well, it's not just what we believe, but it's also what law provides. Thank you. Ms. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for being here. A couple of months ago, I heard a brief overview of what was being piloted in Louisiana and also in Montana, and it excited me as an educator to, to know the urgency of benchmarking and how to assess students and what are we looking at as a state uh, in regards to our lead assessment versus, versus what I saw, and it was really, to me, on point. And, and that's why I asked for a new Meridian to be presented today so the board members could see what's being piloted in our state and what is the potential of us uh, looking ahead of a different way of assessing our students. And it's a frequent um, um, assessment to where teachers know what to do as far as intervening, and that's important. The question I have is, can this program or assessment, the test limits, be utilized in state accountability? That's my first question. And because we're looking ahead of what will our state accountability look like and what's fair to, uh, to all of our uh, teachers and students. And also the second is, can you measure accurately student growth with this? Two great questions. I wish I had better answers because we're just the one year into the pilot. But the fact that we are also your vendor who makes most of the LEAP assessment items, we are able to do that research, which we are doing now. Our intention is to make sure that when we roll it up at the end and we have a summative assessment score, that that is able to be able to be used for accountability. So we're doing that research. Project, your timeline and projection of, hey, this could be used. That's something we want to look at. There's accountability. Montana is moving to the end of this year. They will have um, every grade will have piloted. And then the end of next year, they're going to incorporate it into their accountability system. So we will finish doing the research with them this year. And then we'll create the psychometrics models and implement it by next year. 
So I know you all are very involved in the timeline, so it will take over the summer, we'll have to do standard setting, and the, they won't get the results back probably until the beginning of the year, that year for the Montana students. But at that point, it will count for their accountability systems and they can use it in their report cards. But again, it has to align like uh, Ms. Boche was talking about, the curriculum alignment. Okay. There's no alignment in our curriculum across each district. So it'll be interesting. Thank you for the thank questions you. and for the invitation. I have a, I have a comment too. Yes, Ms. Ellis. Um, thank you for this. This is exciting. As a practitioner and someone who is always looking at accountability and trying to help teachers find a way to not wait till the end. I know this sounds pretty morbid, but I call them autopsies. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we got that data and it's like, it's happened. So here we are. What are we going to do about it? Student is behind. So this is exciting to know that we could potentially be taking, I guess what you guys call it, as a test lit of some sort, and then have real actionable data. That's very, very exciting. And I like the fact that, and I guess <coughs> to your point, this isn't about curriculum, this is about standards. Mm -hmm. So we can take those standards and align them to the scope or sequence of whatever curriculum you've chosen, as long as it's aligned, uh, to, to create really great assessments. So thank you for your work. I'm anxious to see how this plays out. And I'm anxious to see that the end of the school year doesn't end after we leave. Like, I really want us to continue on and not spend a month going, okay, we've tested, what do we do now? Um, we can continue school for weeks and weeks on end, have all those fun parties at the end of the year, but um, leave does not define the end of the school year. So that would be exciting to me. So thank you for your work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Hollis. Mr. Miller. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I know we had the opportunity to speak to the Teacher Leader Summit and Mr. Lambert as well. Uh, I just want to say I'm excited about the potential for this. I know Mr. Lambert and I have talked about this. Like, we're always looking to how we can impact and grow and actually grow our students. And I think this is potentially the biggest change in a very long time. <coughs> As Ellis called it autopsy, we're taking it from autopsy to basically something that a teacher can use throughout if implemented properly. In, in effect, growth and have meaningful changes on our students. He's delivered, and, and I've talked about it a lot. Like, if you said with the math part, you can get the grades within two days. Mm -hmm. And so, for a teacher to know in real time, this is where my students are deficient, I can go back and, and not everything in that builds on the other. Like, if they're missing a core concept that is going to have that, they can break out that group and, and give them that intervention at that time as opposed to waiting until they get to the next year. Yeah. Mr. Lambert, I don't know you were excited about this, the potential that we have here. And, and this is potentially a game changer. I know we we started focusing on only said numeracy and, and all the core concepts of math. And this ties right in where we can potentially have a, a huge impact and catch our kids before they're promoted to the next grade. And so thank you for this. Uh, hopefully we can get through the process quickly and I'm excited, so thank you. Thank you so much. Great, Ms. Lawrence. Yeah, I want to echo the comments from my colleagues, but I was curious too, when would we expect to hear something about the outcomes uh, from the pilot programs? So we just finished this past year, they just finished their uh, last administration window. Um, this year, like I said, we didn't align it to scope and sequence because we started too late in the school year. So we have very good data on each item, how each item performed, how long it took the kid to take it. But I would say the data we got this year isn't good enough to say, can it um, represent growth? Can it roll up to a summative assessment? So it will probably be the end of next year where we'll look back and be able to look at the data and, and make better claims about what that data says. So potentially you could share the Montana data with us with regard to improvement with implementation of this approach? Yes, I would say Montana was in the same position as Louisiana this year. We started the pilots at the same time, so they also did not align with scope and sequence this year. But we are happy to share any of the data around how the items perform and even which curriculum we are aligning to over the summer. Any of that, happy to give updates throughout the way, or uh, the Department of Ed is a very good partner, and I know they'd be willing to answer questions yeah. as well. Thank you. Very, very excited about the approach, and look forward to hearing about the outcome. Thank you. Ms. Boucher. 
Yeah, and I think conceptually what you just said is very, very important. Um, probably these first districts that you piloted in, which I was one, some of the issues were that it wasn't aligned with the spoken sequence. So what happened is as you gave the kids these interim assessments, there were items where we haven't covered this yet, or there were things on you covered that wasn't being assessed. So from a teacher's point of view, it's like, well, wait a minute, why are we doing this? It's really not aligned to what the instruction is. So I think this coming year, if we're able to do that more effectively, we're going to get conceptually, this is, I think, where we need to be and where we need to, to move forward with. But we just need to make sure as we do that that we're building that buy-in from our educators, from our teachers, because they see the relevance of we're assessing as we progress along the continuum and we are assessing standards that we have just been teaching and not something that we have teach yet. So I you know, applaud you with that and I think that this coming year we can get that alignment a little bit better one now. Yes. Right. Just in just in closing, yes. I mean I do think it holds a lot of promise uh, with various partners to think about through course assessment and also the ability to reduce the amount of time children are testing um, and provide uh, more time for instruction, but also being able to give teachers like real-time feedback. And I guess what uh, Ms. Ellis and Mr. Mellorin were talking about is moving from an autopsy to like a routine physical a few times. Of course, yeah. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Well said, Mr. Superintendent. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. If we could just get you to fill out a card, our record, that would also be helpful. We have a motion to receive. Uh, any objections to that motion? No objections. The motion uh, passes. Next item, please. The next item is on page 28, item 5.1, consideration of the reauthorization of successful course choice providers. Um, and a status report regarding course choice providers. The recommendation is to approve the reauthorization and initial authorization of course choice providers as outlined. Great. Uh, motion by Mr. Rock, second by Dr. Bofi. Um, is there a report here, Mr. Superintendent? No report. Any comments, questions by the board? Uh, any objections? Motion passes. Next item. Your next item is on page 31, item 5.2, consideration of an update report regarding literacy and key performance indicators. The recommendation is to receive. I get a motion to receive. Back to Second, Mr. Morris. So, Mr. Castillo, this is just part of our uh, commitment to the board to continue to bring forward um, academic information relative to the key performance indicators. Uh, Dr. Chasson will make this report, but also use this as an opportunity to call out once again uh, the EPIC dashboard that we released yesterday, um, which provides information on outcomes both at the state and system level, but also academic return on investment and uh, expenditure information. So we're really excited about that dashboard being released, and this is a component of that specifically relative to the Sir. Yeah. Good. I appreciate uh, Superintendent Brumley. Superintendent Brumley's reference to the Epic Dashboard. Just wanted to make sure, since we got a larger crowd here today, it wasn't here yesterday, we could help them appreciate how we could find that dashboard. Yes, sir. Very easy to find uh, on our website, louisianabelief.com. Uh, there's an, uh, an Epic tab uh, that you can get one and click on, and it's, it's readily available. Today, I'm happy to bring you all updates on our ongoing literacy improvement work across the state. So, just to remind you all of our mission um, around literacy, which is Louisiana. Dr. Chess, I think you need to pull that microphone a little bit closer to you. Thank you. Louisiana students will have improved literacy outcomes through high quality instruction and interaction from an effective teacher who is supported by leaders and families. We ground all of our literacy work and really set the foundation for that work with our literacy pillars, which are all focused around setting and monitoring literacy goals, providing explicit literacy interventions and extensions, 
providing our educators with ongoing professional growth opportunities, and recognizing the key role that our families play in a child's literacy journey. So we'll start today with some literacy goals and outcomes. We have some highlights and some new data to share with you all. So to start, just um, reminding everyone we've talked some about our NAEP, our 2022 NAEP results, but just wanted to bring these back to the forefront, that our fourth graders ranked first in the country for reading growth on the National Assessment for Educational Progress, which we know is truly amazing. It's a remarkable achievement, and we are confident that Louisiana will continue to see improvement across the board um, because of the strategies that I'm going to outline and give some updates around today. Next, Louisiana rose from 46th to 42nd in our overall national ranking. This is our highest overall national ranking since 2003. In reading in particular, our fourth grade students improved their average NAEP score in reading compared to the national average, which saw a three-point decline due to the pandemic. We saw that uptick while um, most other states saw a decline. While almost all states saw declines in fourth grade data, we saw an increase and in fact outpaced all other states in fourth grade reading growth. Specifically, this got us a little closer to our NAEP goal. Specifically, in relation to our goal of a 220 scale score, we grew from a 210 to a 212. In reading, Louisiana fourth graders rose eight places in ranking from 48th to 40th in the nation. And I wanted to also highlight one of the most significant areas of growth in NAEP um, that I don't know that we've brought to the forefront and talked about enough really occurred in one particular subgroup that we're, we're very proud of to highlight. And that is our fourth grade students who are economically disadvantaged improved from 42nd to 11th in national ranking for their reading score growth on eight, which is truly remarkable. In eighth grade, our students' average scale score remained steady, while nationally the average score decreased three points. So again, even that holding steady in those eighth graders was a really important feat in light of the pandemic in 2022. But we do expect to see that increase over time. Due to, due to the pandemic, of course, um, lots of other states, the majority of other states, saw a decline. And so our eighth graders rose in ranking from 44th to 36th. And this is some new data that I have to share with you all today um, that's very hot off the press. Um, but as I bring it to you all today, of course, I'm going to once again give the disclaimer about our current literacy screeners. As a reminder, this data is a compilation of four literacy screeners that are, that are administered to our kindergarten through third grade students. This is the first time that we did a statewide administration and data collection of spring literacy screener data. I want to call your attention to these cohorts of children. You see that the, the lighter bar shows the low level, the darker bar is proficient, which would be on or above um, grade level reading performance. And so just want to call attention to our kindergarten and first grade students. Those cohorts did perform better on their end of year or EOI screener. Um, these are our students who we know their early language was impacted by the pandemic. Um, you know, we've talked before about, um, you know, everyone around them wearing masks and not being able to see their mouths and how they form words. We know that um, our youngest children were really impacted by the pandemic in their early language development, but these students have matriculated um, through their early childhood care experience and now into a school setting. And we know that they've begun to receive strong phonics-based approach instruction from the start and say they would have less gaps in their learning than some of their counterparts in second and third grade who we see come out with a lower proficiency level. So this means that we have shown growth from the fall administration to the spring administration. We have 8.6% growth. Um, in kindergarten through third grade of students 
reading on or above grade level. In the fall of 2022, 49.6% of our K through third grade students were on or above grade level. And our spring 2023 data shows this group is now at 58.2% on or above grade level. Once again, we know that our literacy screeners this past year have been self-reported data from our school system. It's a compilation of four possible literacy screeners that we rolled together into two groups of on or above level or below level. I want to pause here and note the significance of this data just to let you all know because this is the first time that we've done an end of year screener and data collection that the data collection, the administration of the screener does not have the same cut scores throughout. So the beginning of year screener cut scores to the end of year changes because we would expect all students to learn and grow by a grade level as they participate in that grade level instruction. And so the cut scores change. They get harder from the beginning of the year to the middle of the year to the end of the year. So it's not that students grew because we would expect all students to grow in their reading level. It's that we were able to move out of state 8.6% of those students from reading below grade level to reading on or above grade level. And that's the significance of this end of year data collection of our spring screener. So I wanted to point that out, that it's not just about growth because all of our, they had to grow, but also the cut scores change from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Next year with our new literacy screener, we will be able to much more specifically measure growth because for example, we're not seeing here, we aren't able to get granular enough in our data at this point to show students who might have been scoring maybe even at the bottom end of our well below group and now maybe they're scoring at the top end of the below so maybe they're not moving into that top bar quite yet but they might have grown over a whole grade level in reading growth this year but it might take them two years to catch back up to where they should be on grade level or even two and a half or three years so there may have been students hanging in this lower category below grade level who grew large amounts but we won't see it in this data. We will see it in our data collection next year with our new screener. So I next wanted to just overview a snapshot of our literacy funding. You all know I've brought to you before how we fund all of our literacy improvement work. So just to provide an update, that first row is our federal literacy grants. Um, so that top row shows that we have $34 million that we've allocated to our schools with academic labels. These dollars have supported literacy coaches, ELA high quality instructional materials and professional development, literacy tutoring, including English and reading, ACT preparation, and English school enrollment courses. The next row are ESSER stimulus dollars. We will have distributed over $66 million of ESSER over a three year period. And these specifically will be used for our literacy screener, our science of reading training, including the development of our Louisiana specific science of reading training. This includes our regional literacy specialists to support literacy coaching, our tutoring vouchers for the Steve Carter Literacy Tutoring Program, and our ELA high quality instructional materials that all align to the science of reading. The next row are our GEAR funds, also known as the Governor's Stimulus Funding. Louisiana received $1 million to address literacy learning loss and to support professional development. And so this has funded our ongoing literacy PD of all types of roles and school systems. I also want to note, and we'll, we'll share a little more in just a few slides, that the state also made last year during, during legislative session a $5 million appropriation for the READ program. So here are the updates on the specific initiatives. We've seen some of the data um, that we're really excited about, but we also know we have a lot more work to do moving forward. So I wanna highlight some of that key work. In the 2023-2024 school year, we will be focused on three critical components to support our continued growth in reading. We are adopting that universal literacy screener in grades kindergarten through third grade. We're providing ongoing professional development for educators, and we're elevating the tutoring opportunities that are available for our students across the street, across the state. We 
We are also happy to be working on various initiatives to support our ongoing professional growth for our educators. We know that the work we are asking of educators right now is very heavy and deep. Um, it is new to many of them. We are asking them to, to learn so much themselves, to embrace change. And we have to ensure they all have the support, training, and resources necessary to best serve our students, which is why this pillar is so important to us. This is our literacy professional learning KPI, and I have some, some updates here that I'll voice over that we didn't have um, fully in our data collection when we made this slide, and it went live in four docs. But we did complete our data collection for our science of reading training, what we call our Act 108 training, um, which the Act 108 of 2021 requires each teacher who teaches kindergarten through third grade and each principal and assistant principal of a school that includes kindergarten through third grade to successfully complete a foundational literacy skills instruction course. And so last year when we did our data collection as required by Act 108, we had 9% of our educators who were required to complete the coursework um, conclude that training and complete it in time for the data collection. This year, we're at 47% completion as of April 1st which is really very positive. Um, we do know that our target is 50%. However, I am confident that was 47% of April 1. Um, today is June 13th. I'm very confident that that last 3% and probably many more have finished, which is what we heard from school systems, um, that we were collecting it so early. They were like, so many people are about to finish at the end of the school year. And so I'm sure that we hit our target of over 50%. Um, our next goal is for our next data collection um, in the spring of 24 that we will have a 75% completion rate. Dr. Chesson, you're doing a great job, but I just want to take a moment here for the board to appreciate again this professional development that teachers are undergoing is not a one hour course. This is 50, yeah. 60, 70 hours with competency based um, assessments to conclude. Um, and we essentially are at 47, probably higher because that was from April. Uh, half of the teachers across the state in K3 and those leaders have completed this training. And so um, we talk about some of the movement we've seen uh, and the progress that we're making in literacy. And it is the right approach, science-based, science of reading, back to the basics. That's the right approach. But it, this, this movement would not be happening without teachers and leaders and students doing this work. And, and it is so um, exciting for me as an educator to, to walk in schools across the entire state and see so much energy around this particular uh, effort. Uh, and so on this slide, I just wanted to, to shout out our teachers and our leaders on the ground every single day doing this work to help get that better outcomes for uh, kids and families. Thank you, Dr. Chess. is that about a third of the teachers who have not, or I'll say educators, teachers and leaders, who have not yet completed their training are participating in the letters training, which is a two-year program. And that is one of the approved providers. So about a third of the ones that are missing from this group, we expect to, to see next spring as they complete. They're taking a little longer because it is designed to be a longer program. So I'd like next to just take you all through this timeline. I know many of you have had questions before on my updates about what is the road ahead um, regarding this Act 108 training. It's wonderful that we are capturing so many of our existing teachers right now, but how do we keep from um, the expense and the burden of existing teachers having to undergo this training in the future? And so for 23-24 next school, school year, we'll continue to train our educators in the science of reading, according to Act 108, our school systems, again, will have those possible vendors um, paid for through ESSER funding. So that will continue through next school year. We'll have a lot of folks complete over the summer and then into next school year. For the 24-25 school year, the lead 
Louisiana version of the Science of Reading training will be available. This will be free of charge for all teachers, lead leaders, and our educator prep providers. This will count for hours of coursework for folks who take it. Um, this is the partnership that we have that you all have approved some time ago with um, Louisiana Tech. Um, they are helping us build that Louisiana version of the Science of Reading that we will own in perpetuity and be able to make available to everyone. So that will be available during the 24-25 school year. We are also making, with our teacher prep providers who are absolutely our partners in this work, shifts in coursework and shifts in that assessment. Our teachers who are entering the workforce in 25-26 will have been trained in the science of reading through their coursework in ed prep programs and they will have passed the new teaching of reading elementary exam that they will need for certification. So those entering the workforce in 25-26 will no longer have to take this Act 108 training because it will have been built into their coursework and their assessments. We'll continue to be able to host and provide the Louisiana version of our training because we know that there will be folks that don't fall into those categories. So we'll have uncertified teachers. We'll also have people um, perhaps coming to teach from out of state who will need to take that version. I also want to note that we have made available an optional training, recognizing that not all of our students enter fourth grade reading at grade level. Um, there's a huge need for our fourth through eighth grade teachers to also have access to a science of reading training. So we have been able to make that available over the last year, and it will continue to be available through January of 2024. We have over 1,000 educators participating in the optional version for fourth through eighth grade. Also wanted to note that after folks complete their Act 108 training, it's about implementing the knowledge and skills learned during that training into classroom practices. And so we're supporting that through our literacy division. And so once again, our literacy division will be traveling the state for the second annual Louisiana Literacy Regional PD Tour. And this year's tour will include six stops across our state. They'll be traveling to the Northeast, Northwest, Southwest, Central, and Southeast Louisiana and hosting these sessions around literacy best practices from screener to core, which will really help our educators around how do they use the reporting and the data from a literacy screener to drive their classroom instruction. Um, and how do they really implement best practices in comprehension and fluency. So really helping and supporting our educators in moving those best practices into classroom instruction. We've also been doing a lot of work to better serve our students with dyslexia. Um, Act 206 of the 2020 legislative session revised our state definition of dyslexia. We've updated Bulletin 1903. We've updated our handbook for students with dyslexia. Um, we also have made an FAQ document um, and our own guide to dyslexia in Louisiana and led professional development to summarize policy and state law. We've also updated, according to Act 419 of 2021, um, the annual reporting of students who have been identified as dyslexic. And so we are also moving into, I'll call the next phase of the work around serving our students with dyslexia. And that includes um, providing the funding for the education of 50 new certified dyslexia therapists across the state. Next, we'll move on to interventions and extensions within our literacy work. This pillar is so crucial. We know what success will look like, more students being able to read on grade level, and we fully believe that that will happen when educators are able to address the individual needs of every single student. We know what learning loss looks like. It looks like gaps in knowledge and skills. I often compare it to Swiss cheese. And so the students have these holes in their knowledge and skills, and reading progresses and builds over time. And so learning loss is best addressed when educators are prepared to understand the specific needs of every individual student and meet those needs through instruction. And so ultimately that's done through interventions and extensions. And that really is the science of reading, a systematic, explicit, 
symphonic-based approach to addressing the needs of every learner. I want to highlight here, this is our reading proficiency KPI. This is for our tutoring initiative. Um, so we launched the Steve Carter Literacy Tutoring Program in December of 2022. This provides free literacy tutoring to eligible students through $1,000 digital tutoring vouchers. We have over 4,500 students currently registered. Sorry, I said that number wrong. Over 4,000 students currently registered for the program, but we know that we want many more to register. This is a program that provides that digital voucher to families. And so families have the option to go online and register their students. Our target is set for 25% of eligible students to be enrolled in utilizing these services in 2024. We've increased the eligibility criteria so more students can access these tutoring services. We also have done some amount of marketing around the program, but we are asking for your approval later today a contract for further increase in marketing, knowing that we need to do more targeted outreach to increase awareness for our eligible families. We've also been able to expand our number of providers. And so this is something we received a lot of feedback on. Um, we know that when parents go online, they are able to put in their child's student ID, they're able to enter their zip code. And the website then lets them know what is available as far as tutoring providers. <laughs> Um, we have been able to increase how many in-person providers are available and virtual providers are available across the state. And so this next slide, this map, shows in yellow the newly approved providers. That teal color are the current providers. And then across the state, virtual providers are available to everyone. And so we do have over 4,000 students currently utilizing the services. We're hopeful to have more engagement this summer and more folks um, go online, register, and utilize the tutoring. We've really been encouraging this a lot with our superintendents, with our school system, throughout engagements like Teacher Leader Summit, our Superintendent's Advisory Council, and then we'll increase our own marketing um, upon approval of today's contract to do even further outreach. <coughs> Can I ask a question just about this one real quick one? Yes, do. Can I ask you a question about this locker? Absolutely, right. Okay. I, I think one of the reasons, uh, you know, many of the families are not failing themselves with the Steve Carter literacy. Uh, not so much a marketing issue as a um, so many different offerings. As long as we have the ESSER money, we have a real time tutoring, we have after school tutoring, we have in school interventions, and we have. I hate to say this, but a lot of money from the federal government pushed into the same initiative. So when parents are looking at what is available, they usually tend to look to their school district first. And all of these tutoring programs that we have may be the first call. So my question is, the amount of time, I know you had the what, 40 some odd billion dollars for the party and how long does that last until the expiration of the funds? Is it anything to come? Can you just speak quickly to that? Because once that ESSER money is gone, next September of 2024, this particular program, the need for it, will increase because it will be um, far fewer funding sources to provide similar tutoring and intervention. Yeah, those are some great points, Superintendent Boche. Um, Yes, this funding does expire. It is ESSER free funding that is used for this program. And so it does expire in September of 2024. Um, what we are doing is collecting data points. We'll have some data collected this fall from this program um, to be able to show what impact it has had on students participating. And we'll continue to collect that data. I think it will be important to have some strong data points to show um, 
you just know what is working. You know, when we think about the sustainability of all of this ESSER funding and the programs that have come out of it, it'll be really important to have key evidence and data points. And so we've been very careful in crafting this program that we'll be able to collect that. So the bottom line though is the funding expires in September of 2024 and all of the other tutoring services. When all of that's are free, yes. And so I agree, I do think there are um, naturally competing programs around tutoring, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. We want folks to access what's best for them. Um, but it does mean, I think, that we've seen maybe less participation in this program than we would have seen otherwise. A lot of school systems have their own tutoring programs that they do something for, which is great. They have their own summer learning programs. Um, we've welcomed school systems lately. We've really shifted some of this approach in saying, yes, we need to market to families, but we also need to market to our school systems. There are creative ways that school systems might want to use this program. So there are ways that it can be used within a summer learning program, within an after school. It might be the school system working with the families to register students um, who need this program the most. So I think that we've also like shifted that approach in the last few months to say, yes, we want families to access it, but sometimes school systems can help families access it as well. Sir, Mr. if I could, um, some of the questions and some of the concerns with the uh, certificate motion. When does the Ski Carter funding expire? September of 2024. Okay, so it all expires? Yes, yeah, because this is funded with some of our um, SRC stuff. And funding. it's all use it or lose it, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that would give some more questions. Um, the marketing program that, that you're going to be uh, hopefully pursuing. Um, what you guys been able to identify what specific areas you're going to be marketing to? In other words, is it rural areas? Is it areas where you don't have broadband access? I'm just trying to get a sense of where the areas are that you identify. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, we are working currently with a vendor, you all approved the contract some time ago on you know, regular marketing techniques. We've done this for the last few months. Um, to work on those types of you know, what we need to do as far as um, billboard, how else can we get radio ads. The contract today is with a marketing firm to do um, a lot of online marketing, things like geofencing, targeted Google ads. Um, so we're increasing the amount of marketing. But we're specifically looking at the folks who um, are more rural and maybe they don't even have some of the providers in person as you see here on this map. So you don't ask me how geofencing is done, Mr. Morris, because I don't know, but I know it's going to happen. Can I ask a question? On this? On this, do we have a contingency plan if we don't see the spending going down rapidly enough, but where we're going to divert these dollars so they can be spent for the deadline? Yes, and we're actually working on that right now. We are um, really working so that all of that money that we have committed, we committed $40 million to the Steve Carter Literacy Tutoring Program of our own efforts to set aside. At this point, do we think that all $40 million is going to go to the Steve Carter Literacy Tutoring Program by September of 24? No. However, we want all of it to go towards tutoring. And so we are um, working right now to really identify what other tutoring services, programs are available. How else um, can we utilize these dollars still for tutoring, as well as increasing marketing and outreach to spend as much of it as possible on the Seed Park program. But also recognizing, you know, that's just literacy. We have lots of need in math. So we're also expanding to math tutoring as well um, within that funding source. Dr. Welfie. So since you're starting there, um, I do think it would be beneficial to think, because I like with marketing, I always think about targeted audience, right? And we know our children are either home for summer or they're in some kind of summer camp. And I think there would be a lot of power in partnering with summer camps. And it might be too late for this year, but it sounds like you would, might be able to get some in next year. Um, some summer camps where there could be tutoring available in addition to enrichment. Like, I don't know if you're going to sell children on one of summer camps that 
or 100% reading, but I am confident that it could be integrated. So I would, I would put that in mind because it is a time and space where it's um, really important to our children, and I think for our families, it could be very beneficial. So I um, always like to think about targeted marketing, so I'd certainly do that. Um, I want to know uh, more about the optional PD. I mean, I'm like waiting for the other thing to come online because I am super interested in this and maybe even do that. People keep asking what I'm going to do when I get off Betsy. It might be the 70 hours of uh, reading training, right? That's going to be available just in time for that. But I might go start the optional one now. So if you could just talk a little bit about what all that entails, like how many hours, how do we access it. Y'all can email me. It's, it's yeah, fine. I'm how many hours. I think that it's a scaled down version of the okay. larger science of reading training. Um, so it may take somewhere between like 15 and 20 hours. Um, okay. But we can get that to you so that you can do the 4th through 8th grade optional version. It is a, I do know that it takes a significant less amount of time and it's geared more towards 4th through 8th grade teachers. Okay. Interesting. And then what's the status of the screener? So the literacy screener, um, you all know we have worked really hard over the last few years on a request for proposals for our literacy screener. We were able to provide um, an update at Teacher Leader Summit last week to our school system. Um, that the Office of State Procurement at this time, um, they did tell us that we had an awarded vendor through the RFP process, and we were allowed to release that to school systems, which we did. Um, in mid-May, right before Teacher Leader Summit. Um, and then we were told by the Office of State Procurement that they are accepting a protest um, past the period. And so we are working very closely with the Office of State Procurement um, over the next few weeks and with our legal team to navigate what happens next. Um, we have provided updates to school systems and we are really hopeful that we will have that legal literacy in place through the beginning of next school year and there are some things that will be true no matter what vendor is selected because we wrote them into the RFP so things like what the reporting needs to look like um, some things around the administration of the screener they will be true no matter who the vendor is because we wrote those things into indicators of the RFP so we've released that to school systems so they at least have that amount of information to do some planning with um, but we are hopeful that all of that is settled in the next few weeks so that we can move forward with the new screen right at the beginning of next week. I am anxiously awaiting this to be finalized. Could you give me a phone call when it is finalized? Yes, I would love to. Thank you. And hopefully that's soon. So lastly, we will move into how we are engaging families, once again, realizing um, the crucial role that families play in a child's literacy journey. Um, just to remind you all of our Family Summer Support Toolkit, we know that learning should continue throughout the summer months. We also know that the last several summers, a lot of our children across the state participated in summer learning programs put on by our schools and school systems. We may have less children enrolled in those programs this summer, as maybe some of the urgency has declined post-pandemic, but we also know how important it is for a child's learning to continue. And so we produce this Family Summer Support Toolkit. It is meant to be a toolkit for schools and school systems um, to use in their communication strategy and techniques directly targeting families. And so it includes resources and activities that they can share with families. Um, but we, it's also great to make available to school-age families, our homeschool families, community groups, summer programs, um, and our summer child care providers. And so these activities and social media posts are meant to build both numeracy and literacy skills in the home using materials and everyday activities and tasks. I also wanted to add about the READ program. I talked a little earlier about that $5 million appropriation um, that happened in the last legislative session. And so our READ program provides home delivery of great appropriate books and literacy resources to pre-K through fifth grade students. And so we had over 21,000 students register. Um, we were able to send all of that $5 million appropriation on books 
and distribute them directly to students' homes. So um, this was really an amazing feat this year that we were able to get 618,000 books delivered to children's homes. So next steps, in conclusion, um, just once again, our summer literacy tour by our literacy division that we're really excited about. Also, moving forward into our universal literacy screener, we know that this will be so important for us as a state to have this data to drive some of our key decisions. But most importantly, it's going to give teachers great progress monitoring tools so that they are able to address the specific needs of children. Once again, that is the answer to learning loss. Um, and to reading deficiencies. And so we know that this universal literacy trainer will provide us great data, school systems and schools, but most importantly, teachers, the instructional tools that they need. Um, we also will be providing ongoing support for those individual student reading plans, including how to best plan and implement interventions. And that comes from policy that you all passed last year around those individual student plans for students reading below grade level. And finally, just ongoing professional development on how to best address the needs of students with disabilities, multi-sensory learning, and then the implementation of Act 108 into classroom instruction. And a big part of that is our ongoing support for our literacy coaches across the state. <coughs> and that concludes this update. Great. Thank you, Dr. Chesson. Any other questions or comments from the board? Ms. Morris. So, so thank you and, and kudos to you and your team for the progress. It was fantastic. Um, could I ask you to go back to the slide that's still available um, where you recognize the progress with the economically disadvantaged students? So, so that's the most significant of, of all the accomplishments that were noted, and it's fantastic. Is, is there any one or two things that you attribute that to? Um, I would that our overall literacy strategy, once again, is addressing the individual needs of students. Um, and I think that um, in a lot of cases, blanket instruction is what I call it has been happening, which, you know, whole group instruction is important. Our whole group on grade level core instruction is important, will always be important. Um, but there has to be more. And so what we've really encouraged, provided resources around, is about how do I find out what each student is missing and then how do I address it. Whereas these students in particular are economically disadvantaged students, have historically been some of our students with the most prevalent reading deficiencies, the most gaps in their learning. And so our push has really been one with that phonics-based approach of addressing what specifically are they missing. And so we decode when we read work. And so in order to decode, we have to learn parts of the code. And so they're missing parts of that code of phonics. And so when teachers are armed with the resources, the tools necessary, and training to know how do I discover which pieces of the code they're missing and how do I teach them that, that's when we see growth like this, especially with populations of students who, again, historically have had some of the largest gaps. It's that individual attention to specific student needs. Okay. So, so fundamentally, it's back to right? Okay, great. Um, so just again, I want to thank you again for the KPI reporting. You, you know we've talked about this for quite a while now, and folks can see the data and the fact that you guys have made some really impressive uh, targets and, and seeing the progress of the goals is really impressive when we can, when we can see it in that format. Um, and I also recall a conversation we had with regard to KPIs and goal setting several months ago when we talked about Mississippi's progress and how they went from 48 to 28 in I think it's six years we talked about what our goal for our KPI was, and we were very clear that our goal was going to be one better than Mississippi. Yes. So, so I'm interested in that particular KPI and how we're progressing towards that state goal. So that goal, I didn't have an update slide on that goal today because that goal is still, it's based on NAEP. So our goal is to go from the 210 to the 220. We progress from the 210 to 212. 
Thank you. Looking forward to that next update. Right. Dr. any additional Just to close out, I just want to thank the board for uh, continued help on the literacy strategy. We believe it's the right strategy. Uh, we're thankful to do the work. And also just mention that our math refresh is beginning in the same way that we approached literacy over the last two to three years. Uh, the components of that math refresh have recently begun to drop. Uh, and that, that includes a couple of pieces of key legislation that were passed uh, this session that, you'll, uh, that you also have information around in the report. So thank you, board, for helping me a part of it. Great. Thank you both. Uh, there was one public comment on this. Uh, Jody Rollins, uh, 5.2, wishes to speak to provide information only. Uh, two minutes, please. And would you introduce yourself again? Excuse me? Would you introduce yourself? Jody Rollins. I am the parent of a child that's on the alternate assessment. Um, I'm part of the 1% of families in our state. And, you know, um, I agree with Commissioner Darden. Louisiana ain't like no other place. In my research, I can't find one other state with the lack of monitoring of children with disabilities that we have. We have it, but most of it's self-reported. My son learned to read when he was 13 years old. He learned to read when he was 13 because I brought in Dr. Lorraine Mayfield, a brilliant educator, helped write the April Dunn Act to teach him. I live in Ascension Parish, wealthy district. I mentioned St. Tammany earlier. Last year in 21-22, with 6,000 students with IEPs, less than 10 were offered ESY. That's with all the additional ESSER money, everything y'all have done to try to incentivize our kids mattering. This document doesn't include Sammy and Logan. I'm sure Dr. Chasson's initiatives are great for the general ed population, but what about Sammy and Logan? What about the children who don't know Dr. Lorene Mayfield? I know you're going to accept this, and I, I'm not against that, because I'm sure we have made improvements for general ed. But remember that we're not checking to see if children on the alternate assessment can actually read, because our testing is read aloud to them. A lot of them are, are illiterate, and I've seen children who can't read, can't write, 18 years old, and score a level four on the Leap Connect test which is why my sons will never again take it. My children weren't even included in the special education playbook for system leaders. Sandy and Logan are not an asterisk. They are not a note. They are children and they are students. And I challenge you all to create a committee on Bessie for special education to examine what I'm talking about statewide ESY was 1.5 percent last year. Yeah, we went to minute eleven. Thank you so much for your comments. Do you have any questions for me? No, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, there's a motion to receive. Any objection to that motion to receive? Motion passes. Uh, that said, we're at item 5.3, and there's a, a request that we take on 5.3 with 7.3. Does the board have any objections to our moving that item so that they can be taken up to go? Um, Larry? Take those items yet. All right, seven. seven. All right, any objections to that motion? All right, we'll take 5.3 and 7.3 together. Next item. On page 55, item 7.1, consideration of revisions to Bulletin 136, Louisiana Standards for Early Childhood Care and Education Program, regarding the Early Learning and Development Standards. The recommendation is to receive. Updated documentation has been distributed. All right, is there a motion? Uh, Ms. Holliday, is there a motion? Is there a second? Mr. Uh, Mallory, is there a motion and a second? Um, Superintendent, do you have any comments? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Castile. So, uh, this is relative to the um, early learning standards. We know that uh, we uh, have a, a committee that has worked 
um, diligently for a long time the development of a set of standards. Those um, standards have been made available um, to the board. Uh, if you recall, most recently at a board meeting, the board made the decision to uh, send those standards back to that committee for additional uh, uh, public comment, uh, for additional time for that committee to uh, review the language uh, of those standards. And so that committee uh, took time to uh, do that work and address that in the way that they saw uh, uh, fit. Um, over the course of a period of time from uh, December, January, we also reopened uh, the public portal uh, for the public to take the time to provide additional uh, information on those standards. I believe we received around 600 additional uh, comments from individual uh, users on those standards. Uh, and, the, and the area that uh, we all know to be true, uh, that is the area of, of, of conflict here, is the social and emotional development uh, domain within the standards. Uh, of those individuals that submitted comments roughly Almost 60% were opposed to the social and emotional development uh, domain. Uh, also, what has happened recently is a resolution was filed uh, and passed in the uh, House of Representatives with, I believe, 60 plus votes uh, that directed the department uh, to take into account that public feedback and provide an additional set of standards for the board to consider. And so, that resolution passed, I believe, on June the 2nd. And so exactly one week later, we uploaded uh, a set of standards so that, that the board would have uh, those standards. What we, what we place as a recommendation is to receive the report. We recognize that uh, it's a lot of new information, it's a short amount of time, and so we just felt like uh, the best thing for us to do in terms of recommendation was to say, you, you have a set of standards from the committee, you have a, a set of standards developed by the department, um, and we believe that you should take time to look at those, review those, and receive that uh, particular report. I will point out the, the main differences. Uh, for the majority of the standards, they are very similar. The only uh, difference is in the social and emotional development domain. Uh, the department version approaches that a little bit differently, and we have that domain listed as interpersonal skills and well-being. Uh, we also did some work within that uh, set of, of standards within that domain. The other thing that we did is we believe we provided additional clarity uh, by uh, using the words such as a number of times to provide examples of what that standard could look like as it comes to life uh, in, an early, uh, in an early year classroom. And then the other uh, thing that the uh, department's version of the standards provides is we incorporated the word play, appreciating the importance of play uh, at a young age. And I believe, I believe play is incorporated in the standards around 100 times uh, because we believe in the benefits uh, of that. So again, we have a set of standards. They have been endorsed, I believe, by the committee um, that has worked on them for quite some time. We have a set of standards that meet the House resolution that, that uh, asked the department to provide a set of standards, and you have a recommendation from us to receive the report. Okay. There's a recommendation to receive. Is there a motion to receive the report? Ms. Morris moves to receive the report. Yeah. 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 Great. Any comments by the board? I need a substitute. My motion would be to approve as notice of intent provisions to bulletin 136, the Louisiana Standards for Early Child Care and Education Program serving children birth to five years as developed through the Standards Review Committee process. All right, there's a motion. Is there a second to that substitute motion? I'll second it. There's a second to that substitute motion. All right, that said, we have a number of comments. And I will start making my way through those. Um, I'd like for Ms. Katie Alexander, Chrissy Pike, for Kelly and Farge Laurie to first come up. And 
whoever would like to go first, please feel free to do so and please introduce yourself before you. Good morning, board members, and thank you so much for allowing us to speak here today. My name is Christy Hyde, and I'm the founder of Louisiana Conservatives, an organization that is dedicated to truth. I'm extremely concerned about the future of our state and country for a plethora of reasons, not the least of which is an infiltration of all of our sacred institutions by those wishing to do us harm. We commemorated the 79th anniversary of D-Day this past Tuesday, the day when our nation's troops stormed the beaches in Normandy to fight and conquer tyranny. They saved the world for another generation during that war, and the world will be forever grateful. Today we find ourselves, ironically, fi fighting the same war, except this time it's on our own shores. We're fighting tyranny within our country. That is the truth. We are fighting against evil in high places, just as the Bible foretold that we would. Our children, the most innocent of us, are being attacked on all fronts because Satan loves to prey on the most vulnerable. Citizens all over our nation have been fighting this fight. I and many others have been coming here to these meetings for almost a year as a voice for the citizens of Louisiana who were unable to physically be here to represent themselves. We and those citizens are very grateful that you allowed a public comment portal to be opened in order for parents, grandparents, and all citizens to voice their extreme concern over early learning standards, and they did in great numbers. The main objection to these standards being that the language as written is rife with Marxist ideology and has no place in our Louisiana schools. Based on the comments in the portal, the LDOE sent revisions to the ECDS committee. The revisions by the LDOE, in my opinion, were ignored by the committee. The committee was so unconcerned about the strong response to these standards that they only showed up for quorum at the very last meeting to vote and therefore heard none of the serious concerns of the citizens who attended each committee meeting. I know this as I attended each one. Thank you. Time has expired. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank I just you. ask that you adopt the revised standards as issued by LDOE. Thank you. Great. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, board members. My name is Katie Alexander. I'm with the Louisiana Citizen Advocacy Group. Um, this session, Rep. Beryl Lamedy brought forth H H.R. 192 regarding early childhood development standards. 63 representatives from across the state voted in favor of Rep. Lamedy's resolution, which stated issue with the Early Childhood Development Committee not taking parental concerns into account and requested LDOE to submit a version that would take those concerns into account. LD, LDOE did as was asked by an overwhelming majority of the elected representatives. LDOE's team of experts provided, or excuse me, produced a solid and high quality set of standards that did take parent parental concerns into consideration and will satisfy all stakeholders. Racial and social justice, social emotional learning may sound innocuous, even great, but we know it is a Trojan horse for a left, Marxist, a far left Marxist agenda. We need to go back to teaching children fundamentals and measuring milestones and take out all political agendas. Controversial political ideology, ideologies, curriculum, and pedagogy have no place in Louisiana's education. Thank you. Great, thank you. <coughs> Ms. Lowry, did I mispronounce your first name? I'm so you sorry. Did. That's Paige. okay. Paige Lowry with Moms for Liberty. Um, thank you and good morning. Um, so I'd like to start with, um, we have actually been enduring this process on behalf of the public since July of last year. A large majority of the public in July was unaware that this was even taking place. That was something that we brought to the forefront of this uh, board. We informed and encouraged the public to engage to prompt a public hearing so their voice could be could be heard on this matter and be allowed, I'm sorry, and be allowed to submit comments and concerns to this board. We thank you for allowing the public portal to be open to allow this to take place. Timing was not ideal, but nonetheless, we appreciate you for this. During the end of December to early January, you allowed public feedback through the online portal. The results, over 90% of public feedback, those who identified as family members, 
meaning grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles, the general public, expressed their concerns around the social and emotional development domain of the standards. They also expressed their strong opposition to SEL language being used in these standards. We understand that there was a special interest group. We understand that there were special interest groups, experts, educators, and providers of early childhood that submitted comments as well. However, this board here represents the taxpayers of Louisiana. <clears throat> Not special interest groups. So the state of Louisiana just allocated 44 million of taxpayer dollars to early childhood education, which we fully support. But it's important to remember whose money you are using for this. If you don't take a stand today to represent the taxpayers who duly elected you to do so, then it will be a disservice to those who voted you into your positions as a, as a representative of their voice. Within the last two years, there was another time when you shut down the voice of the public, and that was during COVID, when hundreds showed up to speak on their concerns around COVID mitigation. Now the public has brought to your attention again their concerns which center around SEL language that would allow curriculum and professional development that would open the door for discussions on racial and social issues along with gender ideology. Right. Yes. Sorry, it's not That's it. Yeah, sorry about that. Any questions? No, no okay. questions. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Please support uh, LBOE's right. uh, Next up, we have more folks I'm going to call. Um, this is Chris Alexander. I'm Mr. Alexander, I'm not sure if you wish to speak and indicate on it. I'm going to wait. All right, thank you, sir. Well, we do strongly support LDOE. Thank you. Thank you. And next, uh, Hamilton Simmons Jones supports the recommendation and wishes to speak. Tiffany Spears supports the recommendation and wishes to speak. Kathleen Young supports the recommendation. Does that indicate whether she wishes to speak? Yes. Making a way up. And then, hmm, can't quite make out this handwriting. It's Clay. I'm not sure what Clay's last name is, but Clay, if you're here, please come. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. My name is Hamilton Simon Jones, and I am also a taxpayer, and I am here to support the substitute motion and support the committee's recommendations uh, around the early learning development standards. I am an owner of a business that generates about half a billion dollars in economic uh, activity through um, us and our business relationships. I'm also a consultant to the New Orleans Campaign for Grade Level Reading. We are committed to every child reading on grade level by the end of third grade, and we have a coalition of about 125 organizations that are behind that. We recognize the importance of a really strong set of early learning development standards to make that happen. But mostly I'm here as a parent. I have two daughters, Sayla, who's 10, and Ida, who's 7, and they attended Type 3 Early Learning Centers here in the state of Louisiana. They were, uh, they received social emotional learning, as you would call it, in uh, those settings that taught them how to manage, recognize, name, and manage their emotions. As they have been progressing through school and life, that is one of the most important skills they gained during that time period. And to pass a version of these standards that don't acknowledge the value of that kind of education for our children to learn that is what they're learning in early childhood, is in part how to get along, how to, how to know themselves and their emotions, how to manage those, how to interact with others, and that's a really core and critical component of this. And I encourage you to adopt the standards as recommended by the committee, which has been through many steps of public process, public feedback, expert input, and I uh, stand by those recommendations. Thank you. Great, thank you, sir. Yeah. Hi, how you doing? Great, thanks. My name is Tiffany Spears. Is the light the mic on? Hear me? Yes. My name is Tiffany Spears. I am the owner of the Type 3 Child Care Center in New Orleans, uh, the Lower Ninth Ward, and also in New Orleans East. Um, the standards help children pay attention in class, make friends, teach them how to interact and communicate with people, which is something that is greatly needed in our society today. 
As an early care education provider, the standards assist myself and my staff with proper expectations of children at different ages. The standards also help children learn life skills, which will help them as they grow older and transition throughout elementary, middle school, and high school. Overall, social emotional development is the foundation of improving relationships, academic performance, and making responsible decisions. I am proud to support the proposed revised early learning and development standards throughout the review committee process. Great, thank you, ma'am. All right, next we have Eve Williams. Does not indicate whether they support or not, but put in the card. Uh, Elijah Crawford indicates that he supports the recommendation and wishes to speak. Please come on up, sir. Uh, Ricky Lemos uh, supports the recommendation and wishes to speak. Logan Wolf supports the recommendation wishes to speak. We'll get one more. Hansel Bradford supports the recommendation wishes to speak. Please introduce yourself. We have two minutes each. Good morning. Uh, I'm Elijah Crawford. I'm a fellow of the Power Coalition for Equity and Justice. Uh, and I am proud to support the proposed revised early learning and development standards developed through the review committee process. Um, <clears throat> the revised standards help early childhood educa educators reinforce the development of good life skills and prepare children to be kindergarten ready. In addition, these research based standards help early care and, and education professionals support young children in the development of valuable life skills like paying attention in class, being a good student, making friends, and interacting communicating with people. These kinds of skills help children be more responsible and successful as they grow. These standards give ch child care providers a guiding framework so that they can cultivate skills and environments that advance students' learning and development to prepare our youngest learners for success in school and life. Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Excuse me. I didn't understand who he represents. What you say? Our Coalition for Equity and Justice. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, ma'am. Good evening, members. My name is Ricky Lemos. Speak real loudly into that microphone, please. My name is Ricky Lemos, and I'm here to testify in support of the early learning standards for children. I am a certified preschool and daycare teacher from Lake Charles, Louisiana, where I spent my days teaching little ones, helping them learn while having fun at the same time. Work that I truly enjoy. I took pride in nurturing their minds, looking after them as I knew their parents who entrusted me to do my job or relied on me to be there every single day. I also have at first hand experience on the needs assessments and the gaps within our system. The, the standards have gone through an extended review process with updates to to the standards ready for the adoption. The resulting proposed revised standards continue to be based on research and best practice. These standards help our early care and education professional guide young children as they learn valuable life skills like paying attention in class, being a good student, making friends, and interacting and communicating with people. Children need to learn to read and write, but they also need to share and play well with others, be able to communicate. There needs to be proud of themselves and more. All common sense practical life skills. Today you have the real opportunity to impact the lives of those little ones. I'm asking you today to trust this work, trust the process that this, these standards have gone through for review and vote yes to early learning standards. Thank you. Right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Logan Wolf. Um, I'm representing myself, I'm not representing the group. Um, but I'll keep my comments brief, um, just on a couple of points. Um, first, I'd like to say that I am um, supportive of the learning and development standards um, developed through the review committee process. 
Um, this is a large, rigorous body of research that demonstrates how social emotional development improves academic performance, relationships, and behavior. The revised standards are in line with existing standards and reflect the best practices from a long established scientific field. Um, our children have one chance at a childhood. Um, we want our children to be responsible, make good decisions, and take responsibility for their actions. Children must be taught these things and they must be reinforced both at home and in school. These standards will help educators provide high quality instruction to children in Louisiana, which some studies show can reduce a child's likelihood of future involvement in the criminal justice system. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Ansel Bradford, and I'm representing myself at a new work with the Power Coalition for Equity and Justice. And this morning, I am in support of this proposed revised uh, early learning and development standards developed by the Fort Privy Review Committee. Um, business executives across the country have noted that too many employees and job applicants lack the life skills and necessary to be the necessary skills to be su successful. These skills include good communication, the applicant the ability to cooperate and the ability to overcome challenges. The foundation of an adult's ability to perform these skills are built in early childhood. And the business leaders recognize the vital role of early childhood programs in supporting these skills. That's all I have to say, but I do hope that you all support this action. Great, thank you all. all right, next up we have Angela Keys. Supports the recommendation wishes to speak. Cassia Plessy supports the recommendation wishes to speak. Dr. Michelle Demulinaire, I just messed that up, I'm sure. Uh, supports the recommendation wishes to speak. Marie Perkins supports the recommendation wishes to speak. You, let's see, one more. Ashley Jolly supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. All right, we'll start to my left. Hello, my name is Dr. Keisha Plessy. I'm a licensed child psychologist and early childhood and mental health consultant at Tulane University School of Medicine. I am proud to support their lives with early learning and development standards. Beginning at birth, social and emotional learning is a highly important part of healthy development. We know that social emotional development is foundational and is a research based component of early education. Research consistently shows that teaching social and emotional skills to children leads to improvement in academic performance, which we've talked about a lot today, lower dropout expulsion rates, and future healthy relationships with non violent peers. As a mental health consultant, I've seen firsthand the positive outcomes associated with promoting social and emotional development. I have seen a toddler struggle to interact with peers and remain engaged, and how this impacted his learning, decreased his confidence, and increased his challenging behavior. And thankfully, I've also seen the beauty of his teacher taking the time to teach him new ways to interact positively and feel motivated to learn. The reality is, educators are better able to prepare children for school, not only by teaching letters and numbers, but also by proactively and intentionally encouraging skills like problem solving during a conflict, using calming breaths when upset, and taking turns. Including social emotional development in the standards gives our educators a guiding framework so that they can support these skills that are necessary for success. The children in our state will have a hard time if they lack these basic skills, and thus our community will suffer. I encourage you to think about what happens to the young child who does not learn how to manage their anger when faced with a setback. How will they cope as an adult, and how will it impact those around them? How will our community be impacted by adults who were not given every opportunity to learn how to make friends or regulate their emotions and attention in their children? What our state need, needs now more than ever are healthy children, and what our children need are adults who are willing to prioritize their social and emotional development. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, 
Good morning. It is still morning. My name is Angela Keyes. I'm a licensed developmental psychologist at Tulane. I'm also an early childhood mental health consultant in the state. Um, I have I completed a postdoctoral fellowship in mental health and I've been working in this field for more than 20 years. I can attest that I have also seen the effects and the impact of good social emotional skills in children. We used to consider these soft skills, but what decades of research has taught us is that these are the very skills, the bedrock on which all other learning occurs. A child cannot, a child who is not regulated cannot learn. A child who does not enjoy school will not perform well in school. A child who does not have friends cannot make relationships with their teachers um, will have difficulty. So these skills, the ability to regulate their big feelings, to tolerate frustration, to focus their attention and persist on a difficult task, to make relationships to be a good friend, those are the things that children need. And these standards and the teacher support in achieving these skills make that possible. Educators are responsible for nurturing the whole child, not just teaching letters and numbers. And that support that includes supporting their social and emotional development. We have to teach these skills. It's not something children just acquire on their own. So we need teachers to take advantage of not only their planned instructional activities, but teachable moments. We know that a dysregulated child can disrupt an entire classroom, which impacts the learning of other children as well. Louisiana needs its citizens to have good social emotional skills if we are to thrive as a state. An acquisition of these critical skills starts at birth. The learning standards are necessary for our future, and I encourage you to move forward with your Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very nice. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. <coughs> Bolanier. Um, I'm here as a 30 year plus educator with an educational background in early childhood curriculum um, and instruction. I provided guidance on the, the 2013 standards and most recently the currently revised standards. Um, this was a very transparent process um, of me. Along with my colleagues, I felt that um, these, stand these standards uh, were very strong and uh, correlated with the guidance in national research. I'm here today not only as an educator, but as a mother and a grandmother. I'm here as a grandmother for Idris and Emlyn, three and two, who need these standards. This process, again, was open and transparent. It was research-based. It aligned with higher education and the teaching competencies. It aligned with our early childhood ancillary certificate, a program which Bessie approved. It aligns with the American Academy of Pediatrics. It aligns with TS Gold. I recommend that Bessie once again approve the standards that were written by the committee. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Ashley Jolly, and I'm representing um, my own Type 3 center, which is called Jolly Kids. It's located in St. Bernard, Louisiana. Um, I, am proud to, I am proud to support the proposed revised early learning and development standards developed through the review committee process. These standards help our early care and education professionals guide young children as they learn valuable life skills like paying attention in class, being a good student, student, making friends and interacting and communicating with people. For well over 10 years, Louisiana has used these standards to give our children a better start in life. I support the early learning, standards, learning and development standards. Um, to give you a little bit of background though about me, uh, about 50% of my staff do not have children and often Sometimes there's situations that are, that come about in our in my center, and they don't quite understand maybe why a one-year-old does something that a two-year-old doesn't do, or an infant does something that a one-year-old does. And a, a copy of these standards live in each and every single classroom that I have. And every time there's any type of incident like that, or any type of professional development training, these standards are the ones that I go to to help my my staff that do not have children understand why children act a certain way or do certain things or why a uh, little Bobby isn't walking right now but he's 15 months let's see what's going on should we get early steps involved 
all of this helps my educators because not everyone comes, just like I tell my parents, not all children come with a handbook, but this handbook, these standards actually help my educators and my parents on a daily basis. So I support these standards. Great. Thank you, ladies. Next up, we have the following four people. Jared Booter, supports the recommendation. Jared Toops, supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Reggie Carter, supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Cynthia, Cynthia DiCarlo, um, supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Sir, we'll begin with you. Good morning, I'm uh, Jared Luder, and I'm representing the Save the Children Action Network, and uh, I'm proud to support the proposed revised early learning and development standards to go through the re uh, review committee process. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce recognizes the importance of developing these skills in the early years to ensure children grow into successful adults, and business leaders expect adults to have these skills by the time they enter the workforce. And they expect that early childhood education programs will support the development of these skills. Uh, most states have similar standards in their education programs. Louisiana must maintain our long existing standards to remain competitive. Thank you. Thank you. Derek Toops, member of the review committee. I am also an adjunct uh, faculty at two community colleges in this state. I am a graduate of Chilean University, um, Master's of Education from Notre Dame, Early Childhood Certificate from UCLA, and a Certificate in Early Education Leadership from Harvard University. I spent 10 years in early learning centers as a teacher of two, three, and four year olds, as well as a director. And I spend my days making sure that we are stewarding state funds and policies to do what's best for our children. The main difference between the two documents that you have is that the review committee uses social and emotional development, whereas the LDE changes this to interpersonal skills and well-being. Words matter. Interpersonal skills and well-being is not social and emotional development. This change is not a compromise that finds a middle ground for all parties much less our state's children. This change is a deliberate shift away from research and the language used in the field that we work tirelessly to professionalize. I urge this body to side with research, not with language that undermines it. Adopting LDOE's proposed language would be counter to one of the department's four key early childhood initiatives, quote, providing the highest quality teaching elementary environment, end quote. Um, we cannot allow language to be co-opted, misconstrued, and twisted into something that it is not. I'd like to read the philosophy statement of this body. Bessie is committed to making informed policy decisions that will, will result in improved academic achievement for students. Bessie members, I urge you to side with research, which the experts of this committee have gone above and beyond to include in these standards for over two years. After this discussion and delay for two years, it is high time for us to finally adopt the committee standards so we can start spending our Tuesdays implementing these standards instead of defending them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Red Carter. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Louisiana. I come before you this morning to say that I'm proud to support the proposed revised early learning and development standards developed through the review committee process. It is important to me to make sure that all children in Louisiana are prepared to work collaboratively with their peers to solve the problems of the future. Including social and emotional development in early learning and development standards supports children early on to learn the skills necessary to help them in school and later on in adulthood. As someone who has spent the last 20 years with the Boys and Girls Club movement, which has been in existence for over 160 years, currently serves over 4 million youth and over 5,000 clubs across the nation, and have encountered thousands of young people from the ages of 5 to 18, I've seen firsthand the importance of young people having the critical social-emotional development skills 
that will prepare them for all the challenges that life may bring. Things like problem solving, perseverance, creativity and innovation, empathy and respect, and civic engagement, to name a few, are supported in the mission and the programming of the Boys and Girls Club movement, along with our three priority outcomes of academic success, good character and citizenship, and healthy lifestyles. Thank you for your time and consideration concerning this matter, and thank you for your continued support for our Hi, I'm Cynthia DeCarlo. I'm an early care and education provider, um, researcher. Faculty. Is the green line on? It is. Okay. okay. Can you just pull a little closer? Okay, can you hear me better now? I think so. Uh, my name is Cynthia DeCarlo. I began working with children in 1994 and earned a doctorate in 2004. I've served as a early intervention teacher, regular education teacher, working directly with children, and then transitioned into higher education where I um, now operate an early childhood ancillary program, undergraduate, master's, and doctoral programs to train people to work directly with young children. I also served on the Early Learning and Development Committee for Social and Emotional Development. I was asked by the Department of Education, based on my expertise, as were other members of the ELDS committee. I strongly suggest that the Bessie Board adopts the standards that were developed over a two-year period by this committee. Social and emotional development is the language of our field. This is a discipline and uh, a research area. I am a researcher. I have conducted research for the past 20 plus years, and it is dangerous for a field to deviate from the language of the field. I ask that you adopt the standards that were written by the committee as the committee was suggested by the LDOA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. all right, next four up we have Sonia Joseph, supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Susan Spring supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Susan East Nelson supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. And Dr. Louise Sonia supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. My name is Sonia Joseph. I'm owner and operator of Clara for the Lambs Free School Academy located in New Orleans. We serve, we have the ability to serve almost 500 children, but more importantly, I'm a grandmother of seven and a mother of two daughters. This is important to me that we keep the social and emotional development language in the standards because they help guide myself and my staff on how to work with children. Um, as the young lady who's a student advocate said on the board, this is about the children. This is not about adults and their thoughts about what actually goes on in the early learning center. As an owner and an operator, I am really sad that I have to be here again discussing this instead of in my center with my children engaging with them. We are here to support the children and their development. We want them to be able to succeed when they get to school, and I think Dr. Stashon actually outlined how important it is what we do because the children came to kindergarten ready to learn, ready to learn how to read, and they were able to do those things because they were taught by us how to get along with each other, how to share, how to have respect for each other, their teachers, and their learning process. This is why this is so important. Louisiana, for a change, is a leader in something. That is very rarely said in the same sentence. We have set the standard for how we work with our children, how we help children thrive when they become adults. So I ask you to please support as the committee has set the standards. Thank you. Thank you. You made me go. 
I'm Dr. Susan Spring, I'm a retired educator and business executive, and I'm proud to support the work of the committee version and the standards as you have approved them before. I've been a part of that committee that's been developing the standards and the meetings for over two years. Um, I have been thinking about your task, which is a daunting task. Your job is for the entire state of Louisiana and the students and children of the entire state of Louisiana. In reading the website, your responsibility is to provide leadership and create policies for education that expand opportunities for children, empower families and communities, and advance Louisiana in an increasingly competitive global market. Well, that fits exactly with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce statement, which recognized the importance of developing the skills that we're discussing from the earliest years and to ensure the children grow into successful adults. In other words, developing children into successful adults in order to function in an increasingly competitive global market. In reading the Messy website, I learned the majority of you are educators, as I would expect. A few lawyers thrown in there, and that's okay. <laughs> but I ask all of you to think of your responsibility to the state of Louisiana. Think again of your job to create policies for education that enables our children to develop the skills to function in an increasingly competitive global market. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Libby Somney, Executive Director of Louisiana Policy Institute for Children, as well as the Chair of the Early Learning and Development Standards Committee. The proposed revisions to the Early Learning and Development Standards and the guidance document that this board tasked the committee to do develop, was developed through the Standards Review Committee process and are unanimously supported by the members of the committee. As a reminder, the 25-member review committee included a variety of Louisiana early parent education professionals representing public schools, higher education, <coughs> pre-K child care, Head Start centers, government agencies, parents, and was staffed by the Department of Education. The review committee met an additional four times between February and May of this year and accepted public comment before and during each meeting. Meetings were typically attended by eight to 10 members of the public, and two to five individuals usually provided public comment. The committee worked asynchronously between meetings to meet the charge of BESI, which allowed us to get to a point to be a quorum on May in the main meeting. The review committee also accepted public comments via email before each meeting and received 405 emails, all of which supported the revisions under, the, under consideration of the committee. The proposed revisions that come to you through the review committee process have been updated, incorporating feedback received as well as continuing to reflect research and best practices in early childhood development. The revised standards will help children be ready for school and life. The standards support children learning academic skills and also important social and emotional skills, which are skills that allow them to succeed in their relationships with others. Thank you. Great. All right. Thank you, ladies. Uh, the following folks have provided public comment cards, and I'll read their names into the record. Sheila Kaposky Merkel supports the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Courtney Rogers supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Ebony Walker supports the recommendation, uh, does not wish to speak. Elijah Crawford uh, does not wish to speak, did not indicate one way or another. Uh, Jacqueline Lindell, Germany, supports the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Susan Haydell supports the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Uh, Mary Octazan. Uh, supports the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Uh, Mary Susie Library supports the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Mary Margaret Brook uh, supports the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Those are all the public comment cards that I have. Are there any comments or questions by the board? 
this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. okay. I, had several, I had several notes. Uh, so first of all, uh, appreciate all the work uh, that everybody put in this. What I heard was about this for a year now. It's, it's a critical issue. Uh, that everyone recognizes uh, with regard to um, early education of our children. But, but also I want to say I'm just really disappointed. Um, my understanding was that um, we were going to provide some clarity with regard to defining some of these terms to remove some of the perceived ambiguity so that these terms could not be misinterpreted. Um, my understanding is the department put their version together in a week. I, I struggle to see how that gets done. Um, we also ask that a guidance document be completed again in order to provide some clarity and, and remove some of the perceived ambiguity. Um, and then I really appreciate the one comment that I heard this morning uh, that provided some clarity between what fundamentally, I guess, what the department did different than the committee. Now let's just change the terms from social emotional development to interpersonal skills and well-being. Um, it sounds like everybody here is trying to get to the same place. I'm, I'm struggling with: is it really um, the language? Is it the terms? Is it age appropriateness, or is it the content? I'm, I'm personally, I'm just not clear yet what the remaining unresolved issues are. Um, I haven't seen a marked up document that helps to explain the differences between the two, and, and I struggle with what the rush is. Um, so if somebody could help you understand what, what the rush is to get a decision today, um, with the things I just spoke to, at least unresolved in my mind, I, I would appreciate the board considering the initial recommendation, which was to receive the document, give some time to digest it, and at least for me personally to consider the things that I just spoke to that are still unresolved in my mind. So one point of clarity, Mr. Morris, the guidance document uh, has been available. It's available in board documents, so you do have that guidance document. Uh, and of course, our recommendation was simply, as you mentioned, um, the, the, the time constraints to receive the report. But I do want to point of clarity is that the guidance document is available. So, yeah, thank you. As far as for those comments, I also um, ask as a personal um, me that we should consider the request from uh, HR 192 to give the department and the commission um, time to be able to look at this these documents and concur. Uh, Libby, thank you so much for your work and your passion for what you do. And uh, it's a lot of work. A lot of hard work at the committee, but here we are, and we've had a request from the legislators, and I would ask to be honored by that. That's my personal opinion. Thank you. Right. Mr. Garvey. Yeah. Um, to agree with Mr. Morris, Ms. Holloway, um, I heard one comment today about why the department's proposal is not acceptable. Uh, it was a fairly short comment. I would like to hear from the committee why they think the department's proposal is not sufficient, is not good, is not going to address the uh, learning of these children properly. Uh, I think that the department <coughs> produce some pretty good standards, but I'd like to hear from the committee why they aren't, why they think they aren't good enough. So I would like to amend the motion that's on the table to direct that we get input from the committee before we approve the standards that are on the table right now. So, Mr. Garber, it sounds like you're making motion to amend, offering an amendment. I do see some folks from the um, from the committee that in response to your inquiry that showed up to the table, you want them to respond. Now are you 
rather than there just being an amendment? I would like to hear about, I'd like to hear the response, but I would like to hear <coughs> the official response from the official committee. All right. Are you representatives of the official committee? Yeah. Dr. Sun? Dr. Yeah. Sun? Okay. They're representatives from the committee. I would like to send this to the committee to hear from the committee, full committee, or a quorum of the committee, what they think is sufficient about the superintendent's proposal. Okay. Is there a second to that amendment? Oh, no. No second. No second. Okay. Melbourne uh, offers. I just want point of clarification. Is there already a substitute on the table? There's a substitute motion that's on the table. Okay. Um, and there's an amendment to uh, Dr. Davis's substitute motion made by uh, Mr. Garvey, seconded by Mr. Melbourne. Um, I object to that amendment. She has to Mm. Well, it would be voted on after we hear from the representatives, so we can vote on it before we hear from the representatives. No, I'm, I'm fine with allowing them to speak then. All right, so we've got some representatives from the committee. Uh, uh, who wishes to speak first? Derek, I'll start once. I'll go first. Um, sure. As I alluded to in my public comment, social and emotional development is not interpersonal skills and well-being. The very first time we were here to present the standards, Mr. Morris asked me, can we just change the title of the domain? My answer remains the same. Yes, you can, but it defeats the purpose of having research-based standards. Bessie tasked El Dewey, El Dewey with putting together a committee of experts in this field, including seven people who have PhDs, which are terminal degrees in early childhood education. I'm all about the public process. This has been transparent over time. I hear the concern that has been presented to us from the public. However, as a professional body of experts, we are presenting to Bessie what the research says and what is standard best practice for the field. Change what you want, but it is not going to be in alignment with what the committee of experts represents, or recommends, rather. And if you go throughout um, the two documents, you'll see there was a change of the, the term emotions. Um, and turning all the, where it says emotions to feelings, uh, which again is counterintuitive to the body of work. Emotions are defin defined. There are countless uh, research studies <coughs> about children's emotions and how they identify them. And feelings are typically more subject subjective when we're talking about that. And so when we're talking about a definition of an emotion, that becomes critically important, especially to our educators. Additionally, um, we were tasked to come up with a definition for social and emotional development. We did do that as a committee that is in the guidance document. Uh, and in the document that the department is putting forth, which actually limited public input, it was done in-house without public input in a transparent manner. Um, it changed, as Derek talked about earlier, it changed the term social emotional development to interpersonal skills and well being and did not include a definition of that. Great. Any other comments? Uh, yes, I just want to say that words do matter. Um, changing the language does matter. Um, we specifically looked at research. We looked at the field, we aligned with the field, and we want to make sure that the language that's used in the standards aligns with best practices in teaching. And what we put before you was aligns perfectly with the teaching competencies, it aligns with um, the developmental standards of children, and it's a great guide for teachers in a classroom for young children. And I think one more point of clarity is that there has been obviously opposition, which got us to this point with the standards, but there has been overwhelming support of the revised early learning development standards as proposed by the committee. Because it's been a transparent process since this committee started over two years ago. And perhaps one more comment on the actual change from social and emotional development to interpersonal skills and well-being. That alone is not a sufficient enough domain title to capture what is in the whole set of standards in that domain. 
It does not include intrapersonal skills, which are those skills that are foundational to understanding, interpreting one's own emotions. So it is just an insufficient title, which is why we chose to go with social emotional development, because it reflects a comprehensive um, overview of the field of research. Thank you. Dr. Rose, yes, I just want to offer um, the, the, the statement was made, and rightfully so, that we had to do those in house. That was because the resolution gave us one week to complete that task. Um, we're certainly open to uh, providing those on a, on a public portal and allowing people time to uh, you know, provide additional feedback. But we were meeting the requirement of the resolution to have something to this board for this meeting. Uh, and, Mr. Morris, uh, more than just the domain change in this, um, if you look at individual standards, which you may not have had enough time to do, um, because it is short notice, these, these standards that we developed in-house are much more specific. <coughs> Great, Mr. Morris. <laughs> so I appreciate uh, members' comments and comments from the experts, but nobody still addressed my concern for what's the rush. Number one, I can think of a lot of things that come before this board that personally I think demand much more urgency than this issue. I mean, if I'm wrong there, somebody please help me out because nobody's spoken to that yet with regard to what the rush is. Um, secondly, I don't see how you can compare the two things when one of them hasn't been defined. So I get back to original concern, which is we're talking about specific language, we're talking about age appropriateness, or we're actually talking about content. You know, somebody, used, somebody used the word Marxist earlier. That, that's an extreme, right? How can you get to that much of an extreme? Well, okay, we haven't defined both of the terms, right? So the ambiguity is still there. The ambiguity hasn't been resolved. So I don't understand the, the rush to make a decision here when we're trying to compare two things and we haven't even defined one of them. Seems like both parties could work together. Let's get the first term defined. Then let's talk about what the differences are. Then let's make a well-informed decision. Right, thank you, Mr. Morris. Um, Mr. Gardner. Yeah, I'd like to go back to what Morris, Mr. Morris brought up. We haven't received the guidance documents on these. Is it not possible to get the guidance documents on these so that we can? It's in board house. The guidance. Yeah, there are okay, large good. documents. Yeah. Very good. So I wasn't in the packet, but it was like, there's a link to it. Um, <coughs> there's a link on the internet. So maybe now we know where to find it, but we haven't received it. And then uh, I guess the next question would be for the superintendent. Uh, there's been the claim, and it sounds uh, justified, that some of the terms in your proposals have not been defined yet. Do uh, you have could you quickly define those before the next meeting of the review committee? I would have to have a conversation with our team, Mr. Garvey. Um, we, we simply work to meet the obligation of the resolution to have something here uh, for this board meeting. So if we're talking about further review, I have to have that conversation, but I don't know what the answer to that would be right now. Do you think it would delay things? to the extent that it would be harmful to the students of the state? Um, I'm happy to spend time with our team and, and define interpersonal skills and well-being. Sorry, show us. Just a point of clarification. So we have a motion and a substitute on the table. Dr. Davis, are you willing to, to amend your substitute to include any form of a delay at this point? No, I'm not. But then I think it's a call to question. All right, uh, there is a substitute motion that's on the table. Any objections to that substitute motion? Mr. Castillo, I want to make sure, are we voting on Ms. McDonough Davis's or on Mr. Garvey's amendment? Which one do you offer an amendment that is done? Second, goodbye. Yeah. I'm just trying to clarify which we're voting on. So, if, if my understanding of the parliamentary rules are correct, that the amendment has been offered, but the mover has not accepted that, that amendment, and therefore there is no amendment in light of the rejection of that amendment by the author. Okay. That failed for 
refer back to the substitute motion offered by Dr. Davis. That's right. I'm just clarifying. Yes, and, and so I asked if there is any objection. I suspect that there might. Well, then I, I would like to comment on, on the motion that's on the floor at the moment. I would okay. suggest that members vote against it so that we can get more input from the committee regarding the superintendent's proposal. Any other comments? Thank you, Mr. Garvey. Can we get us? I suspect when I say, again, are there any objections? There will be at least one objection. So I'll do that for the formality. Are there any objections? Oh, there is an objection. Roll call, please. Dr. Bofi? Yes. Dr. Bofi votes yes. Dr. Davis? Yes. Dr. Davis votes yes. Ms. Ellis? No. Ms. Ellis votes no. Mr. Garvey? No. Mr. Garvey votes no. Ms. Holloway? No. Ms. Holloway votes no. Mr. Melvin? No. Mr. Melvin votes no. Mr. Morris? No. Mr. Morris votes no. Ms. Orange Jones? Yes. Ms. Orange Jones votes yes. Mr. Rock? Yes. Mr. Rock votes yes. Ms. Boucher? Yes. Ms. Boucher votes yes. Mr. Castile? Yes. Mr. Castile votes yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, the next item is on page 132, item 7.2, consideration of revisions to Bulletin 137, Louisiana Early Learning Center Licensing Regulations, regarding the three-year review. The recommendation is to approve as notice of intent. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. We'll moved by Dr. Bofi, is there a second? Uh, Mr. Roth. No further comments. Any objections to the motion? All right, that motion passes. Next item. The next item is on page 142, item 7.3, consideration of revisions to bulletin 741, Louisiana Handbook for School Administrators regarding an appeals process for all students as it relates to graduation assessment requirements. The recommendation is to approve as notice of intent and additional backup documentation has been distributed. We are also taking up consideration of an update report regarding policy revisions that provide for an appeals process for all students as it relates to graduation assessment requirements. That recommendation is to receive. All right, is there a motion to receive? Ms. Holloway. Seconded by uh, Dr. Davis. And Mr. Superintendent, we wanted to take a 5.3 first. Yes, sir. I mean, 5.3 is um, simply our response to the uh, proposed policy. We work with legal counsel, uh, and we uh, still have a set of, of concerns that remain. Uh, I emailed uh, the board and updated the letter uh, this weekend that outlines those particular concerns about uh, the policy from a legal standpoint. Uh, also, just feel like from a, from a professional standpoint, uh, we need to be very cautious here because of the signal that we send to uh, colleges, universities, uh, employers, the community about what uh, a diploma means uh, within the state of Louisiana uh, and what uh, our expectations are for students having have, having to have a set of proficiency uh, in uh, relative topics and, and content areas that we uh, have previously set forth. And so uh, you should have received uh, a copy of an updated letter from legal counsel this weekend on this, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and if someone has not and would like to receive that, we can do our best to get a copy of that uh, to the board at this time. Questions or comments? <coughs> Those are the yes. I'll follow up with the superintendent. I'm just curious. So, based on the last motion that was passed unanimously by this board at the last meeting, which directed you to your work with the Excel Pathways Coalition, except what specifically was done after that meeting to actually advance that particular action that was approved by the board? So that. That particular item, once we met with uh, our legal counsel, we didn't find that uh, 
that pathway to be legal. Um, and there are questions that we still have about that. So we as a staff uh, did not want to participate in the development of that pathway when we believe at this point in time there are unresolved uh, legal questions. Uh, what we did do, however, is we spent time working with LCTCS uh, to develop, and we are in the process of trying to develop, uh, a new pathway that combines both dual enrollment and high set, whereas students who have struggled to pass uh, the lead test could enroll in a dual enrollment course, whether it be high school credit, hopefully pass a high set exam, which is offered in Spanish, um, and have credit towards a, an associate degree at one of our LCTCS campuses that they can then roll into that particular program. So we've worked uh, over that period of time to try and develop uh, the framework for that program, but we did, we did not develop um, in coalition with the Excel group because we have legal concerns around, around that work. So you didn't talk to them about the high set path, or that, that conversation did not occur? We, we have not talked about that publicly at this point because we've been working behind the scenes with LCTCS on that. And uh, regardless of what happens here today on this uh, on this uh, item, I think that this is really worthy work uh, that should be further explored. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Question for the superintendent. Uh, the effort that you're working on with LCTCS uh, regarding creating a high set preparation course, that would be open to all students, if I understand it right? Yes, sir. And so I, I, I do have a handout around this just in case this did come up, just so you would have an appreciation of some of the work that we have uh, begun working on. So it would take individuals. Um, who have not passed our lead assessment, uh, it would create a, a course where it would be a uh, partnership between the LEA uh, and LCTCS. The students would work on successful passage of their high set exam, which is offered in English and, and or Spanish. Um, and that course would count towards an associate degree. And so the students can then roll on into a community college uh, environment working towards an associate degree. Uh, we also have discovered uh, through this that uh, the high set, which is an equivalency diploma, uh, is uh, accepted at, at uh, community colleges or universities, uh, the military, uh, and, uh, and many of the employers uh, that we all know. But you can see we've met with LCCS on the dates that have been included, um, and we, we're like pretty excited about this opportunity to move forward. Thank you. Any other questions or comments relative to the five point three? And also, Mr. Garvey, this, this is not this is not in response to this proposal, but we also have our um, pilot that we're running um, on using our artificial intelligence on a phonics based approach for English learners in the state. And we have fourteen thousand students uh, across systems in the state. We recognize that we have to do a better job for all the first learners, whether that's English language learners or special education learners. Um, and so we're excited about the pilot that we have right now. And it's showing some promising results on early foundational reading um, with our English language learners through the use of this um, phonics based artificial intelligence. And it's even greater when you couple artificial intelligence phonics based pilot with a real tutor uh, for the child. And we're seeing uh, really, really good results across the state around this. Ms. Townsend told me this, that uh, there's 19, currently only 19 parishes that offer high set prep courses in their high schools. Does that sound like you? I think there are uh, just under 20, so yes, there are around 20, just under 20 that offer this particular opportunity around the, the high set of the equivalency. Um, and that used to be a greater number, I believe, but it's been reduced to around 19 now. And if I remember correctly what she told you, also, there's, there was only 394 students who took those prep courses last year. Uh, would you expect that number to increase? It sounds like it would increase dramatically. Uh, yeah. LCTCS would offer this throughout all of the parishes. 
all, all students of all parishes. Well, I think, if, I think if this option that we are working to develop, um, separate from the waiver for policy, policy here today, um, it, it's going to provide support towards students attaining the high set. Um, it's also available in Spanish, which we believe would be helpful. And our goal is that the course could be designed in such a manner that it would count for and towards an associate degree that would roll over into um, the community college system. And so I do believe that we would see an increase of enrollment in these types of courses if we had a very clear pathway of how to do that. Um, this, this is prompted because of these discussions. Um, and and uh, innovation here, I guess, is one way to say uh, that, that we're approaching this. And it would not have happened except for the discussion that has been ongoing with this board, rightfully so, over the last few months. Thank you. Um, Ms. Worsha? Yeah, I think I'd like to comment. I'm glad that you're maybe formalizing this process of talking with LCTCS, but a little bit of a background here. Many years ago, adult education, which used to be GED, went over to HiSET. In many, many, many communities, in fact, most communities, K-12 system ran the GED or the HiSET program. Um, a few years ago, there was a change where all of those programs then were put under LCTCS. And they are currently in existence at, in every, I guess, community surrounding these community colleges of the LCTCS system, and they do satellite offices in many, many places. This opportunity that we're talking about already exists that we have students doing exactly this right now, where if, but it's meant as it exists at the moment for kids that are not going to be completing a, um, an entire Carnegie unit coursework. Uh, it might be kids, if you look at the yellow community, maybe they're coming at the age of 16, 17, and they're not staying four years to complete a full high school program. So then an alternative is to look at a high set, which they can currently take the high set courses. They can enroll in them through LCTCS with the cooperation of the regular school district. And they can take courses at the community college, which if we're talking about doing both, they already have the availability of taking those courses concurrently while they're studying for their high set. So while this is, you know, going to be very good, I can see if we're looking at expansion of this or more knowledge about this, uh, I'm not looking at it necessarily for the same type of students we would be considering this uh, alternative for. You know, we're looking at kids who have completed an entire set of coursework and completed all their Carnegie and credits this uh, alternate proposal is really for kids who have not done that, uh, who have maybe come to the country later or maybe dropped out of school and didn't complete their Carnegie and credits and find themselves at the age of 17 and wanting to re-enter an educational process. And then it is quicker and they become more employable going through the HiSET program and concurrently enrolling in classes in the community college as well, because LCTCS is now running this program. So I think the program can use some refinement, but to me it is definitely not a substitute for what we're talking about here at all. Mr. Morris. Thank you. Um, yeah, one, one other uh, question that was raised in this conversation was uh, whether or not a student could walk at graduation. My, my understanding is that a student does uh, Chief the high set, and they can walk to graduation. Uh, and that's not a problem. Can somebody clarify that for them? So, walking at graduation is a uh, is a ceremonial event, and local school systems make decisions on who is able to walk at graduation um, independently of the, the LDOE investment. Um, and I'm sure some negotiate easily say I should handle the current system. But it would be handled different across various systems in the state. 
but but yes, I would assume that there are systems that if a student right, if a student achieves a high set, that they would be willing to allow them to participate in that ceremony for walk. So the students that have completed it, we're certainly not aware of any that have been denied walk graduation. Is that accurate? Uh, I'm not really sure if we, uh, Dr. Brown, you mentioned the timeline as you continue to work with the um, the, the TCS. T um, what are your projections as far as the timeline for this to become effective for the board to receive, let's say, final um, proposal? Well, we're trying to refine this. This process, as Superintendent Boche says, there there are options that are already available, but we're really trying to refine it alongside LCTCS, and they're excited about that. They're like really excited that we're doing this, and also also considering it as an option for students in the particular uh, position that this board is concerned about now. Students who have been but have not passed their leave, um, and so we've had a series of meetings. Um, we're going to have more, but it's not something that we're going to be able to resolve within the next month or two. But you can do it right now. Okay. The, the difference, though, Superintendent Moshe, is I, I don't know that you can do it right now, what we're talking about, because we're talking about opportunities where students who are involved in actual high set preparation roll into associate degrees and it counts towards one of those credit hours. So I think that's a slight difference. I'm not arguing with what you're talking about about the game. Rolling it. into an associate degree meaning take, it means you're taking one of the courses for a 60 hour associate degree and then having to take a course or other regular typical general ed courses and or a career tech courses. So it would be one or whatever courses may be on that pathway. But what happens right now, if that if that student is enrolled in a high set through the LCTCS program, they can concurrently take those same courses that you're talking about, uh, whether they be welding or whatever or uh, part of the general ed program, at that, I mean, we, we've heard Dr. Sullivan talk about um, quite frequently that the high school diploma is not a prerequisite to entering a community college program. So while these students are in that high set arena, they can take them. We have students in my district who, who don't do that. They're in high set at the uh, LCTCS institution and can currently enroll and um, forces there as well. Mr. Castile, I just wanted to provide context for the board. If you look at page 10 of your packet, those are the statutes that outline what an adult education program is and what ISET is uh, good for, counts for. So technically, when you take the ISET and use it to graduate, you are exiting the school system. Just like that student who came today wanted to be able to take the high set and wanted to graduate, and she wanted to exit, she wanted her son to exit the system and go into an adult ed program. So the high set programming for you program for term, for use, using it for graduation is separate and not within the local system. Is that am I saying that right? Like you don't take the high set and graduate in your local system. Like I, I, I don't know, excuse me, Boshe, I don't know, are you an authorized um, high set administrator as a system, or are you one of the systems that does that, or does it happen at LCTCS? No longer. LCTCS yeah. controls that now. Like that change took place a few years ago, where those adult ed programs moved over under the umbrella of LCTCS. Now we will do possibly some preparation if we know a student is not going to the Carnegie University, uh, Carnegie University uh, pathway because of many reasons. It's not just um, people new to the country. There are many, many reasons why, just like the uh, person who came today and asked for her child to be allowed to enter that. I'm assuming that was not a person new to the country and that. <laughs> 
her um, son was that was the best course for him because he had some of the required if you there are listings of who can enter that room. Right. That is in the statute. That's why I was pointing in that. statute there you have are to be a certain age. You have to be at least sixteen, you have to meet an, one of those conditions that is in the policy um, in order to get early entrance into the high set program, which is technically an adult education program. But there are some no, and some schools have their there. own adult path, but it's not a school system pathway. There it's are, not a pause no. or a jump start. It's a adult ed. But there are some systems in the state that have the option to authorize and administer the high set test. You can't become a satellite administrator if you go through that system and you can be designated. So there, um, you know, you have criteria for test security. Who can administer the training for it? What you have to do? Yes. You can become a satellite administrator of the assessment. <coughs> and so a lot of people will do that. It depends on proximity to the high set center. If you want to call it that. And so what what we have tried to accomplish here is better serving a subgroup of a population, which is what we've been charged to do. So I mean that's that's why we are here, is trying to uh, create this partnership specifically around. Um, the the yellow students but could be utilized for all well and I think it, it this works extremely well for um, any students whether they are EL or um, students who have dropped out or students that they have um, hardship within their families um, there are many many reasons why they apply for those waivers and as a local superintendent I sign those waivers for kids who are under the age of 18 who meet one of those conditions to be allowed to participate in that program earlier. So I think it is a very good program and it serves the need of many people and it will serve the need of some of our EL students to me who come maybe um, at the age of say 17 or someone who is not, who come with no high school credit whatsoever and you're saying well you can stay in high school for years to accomplish all this or if your goal then is to enter the workforce and the skill, then we can get you ready for the high set in conjunction with the local LC TCS institution and begin to get you that credential and entrance into a program that would be beneficial. So and, and I so I've thought that, that we're gonna do more of this and I think a lot of people may not even know it's available to them. But it's not necessarily, um, I would think, for the same student who completes the entire Carnegie unit, 20 whatever credits you need to graduate. I think it's 24, I don't, know, I don't remember, is this 23, 24, it whatever it is. Exactly. I mean, I think that is one of the differences, though, here is this, this doesn't remove the student <coughs> to adult ed. This contains the student within K-12 where they continue to receive the K-12 support while working towards the high school. So that, you can still do that if you so choose. Mr. Garvey. Yes, uh, this will be directed to the superintendent. Thank you. Uh, two issues that I haven't heard discussed or pointed out or highlighted yet are two points that uh, legal staff mentioned in the memo that you referred to, which was that uh, before Jesse takes up and votes on an issue regarding a waiver for graduation that uh, House Ed and Senate Ed needs to be given a chance to give us their input on such a proposal and that by uh, statutory requirement and by federal ESSA requirements, um, the Accountability Commission, which works as ESSA's Committee of, uh, committee of experts, committee of with the exact name, uh, committee of practitioners, I think it is. Uh, our accountability commission was designed to meet the definition of committee of practitioners. That our accountability committee needs to give us feedback before we can approve such a waiver. Did I understand uh, our legal counsel's 
opinion correctly? Uh, yes, sir, and specifically on, uh, I'm sorry, point of clarification, which legal counsel are we referring to, the department's counsel or RC's counsel? Yeah. Okay. So, yes, sir, on um, uh, Ms. Hunt's letter, that's essentially uh, item four and five, and on five you'll see that uh, for us, uh, uh, the accountability counsel serves at that function for this board. Thank you. Any other questions or comments with respect to 5.3? Is a motion to receive any objection to that motion? All right, that takes us now to 7.3, I think. Uh, with respect to 7.3, um, just I think we need to get Dr. Buffy and Dr. Davis, who I think will be presenting on that item. I think I need a motion to, you know, good? Good, great. Secondary education. I'm thrilled to be here today with Bessie President uh, Dr. Holly Bopi. I guess we need to get used to the view from down here since that time is coming soon for both of us. Um, so, uh, as we get started in this presentation, um, I want to say that the need for an appeals process uh, for students initially focused on our state's EL students. But as we move through the process of discussing that, this proposed policy with the Superintendent's Advisory Council, as well as we researched information on what other states are doing, it became abundantly clear that we needed an appeals process for all students. Um, but I want to assure this board that despite the expansion of an appeal process to all students, this by no means opens the floodgate for students to flow into graduation through an appeal. At most, this would be based on 2022 data, this would be about 3,000 students that would not be passing our end of course exam. So that is a number that was given to us when we were discussing COVID waivers last year. Most of those 3,000 students would not be eligible for the appeals process because of the constraints that we place around the work that students have to do. And I think that it will become apparent as we move through this process um, what we mean by this high, highly rigorous appeal that we have designed. Um, and I would say too, as we got into this, every decision that we made surrounding this policy proposal, we had to have at the forefront of our minds, is this policy change best for students? And does it help better prepare our students for the post high school environment, whether that is moving correct right into the workforce, whether that's college or whether or not it's some combination of the two. And so I think it's important to remember um, as background, Louisiana is one of only eight states that still require standardized test scores for graduation, but all of those states have an appeal process for this requirement. All of them, except for us. Of those states are requiring or that have this appeals process, um, they basically are part of a conversation around the national shift, moving to formative assessments, shifting focus to soft skills that are needed for college persistence, and industry-specific skills that are needed for career readiness. And so I want to give you an example of what some of the other states that have high-stakes testing are considering. Um, so just to look even at Pennsylvania as one example, they have five diploma pathways, including the CTE pathway with no state exam score and an evidence-based method with a portfolio. And then more interesting to us um, is Texas, which I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about today. Um, Texas made permanent their portfolio method of appealing assessment requirements recently and is considering full elimination of their assessment requirements. And so as we began researching what other states were doing, what we decided to do was to focus in on two states that we think have very rigorous approaches through two different angles. 
The first is Texas, which has a very rigorous process for making sure that the implementation is done correctly around, the, uh, around um, who is eligible and that the steps are necessary uh, or achieved for good post high school outcomes. And so I'm going to talk about what some of those outcomes are for Texas that they focus in on around uh, college persistence as well as employability. But New Jersey, on the other hand, in their model, they are very much focused on the portfolio and content proficiency. And so what we try to do with this proposal is to take the best of New Jersey with their um, high level of uh, concentration around students illustrating content proficiency through something other than a high stakes test and then marry that with Texas's um, explicit emphasis on uh, post high school outcomes. So the Texas story, um, Texas is really interesting to me because as we started researching this, I learned that their appeals process started in 2014 and initially their process had to be renewed by the legislature every couple of years. And what was so amazing was that in 2021, with unanimous votes in the Texas House and in the Texas Senate, they made their appeals process permanent. And I don't have to tell you how hard it is today to get every Democrat and every Republican to agree on something, right? Like this was huge. And so when I saw that, it was a big shocker to me. And I said, I need to go and I need to figure out what's going on with what's happening in Texas. And so what I did was I went and I watched their committee debates as they renewed this policy year after year after year. And what I saw were the parents of children with dyslexia coming to the table and saying, my child could not have graduated despite passing all of their coursework. They would not have graduated because of the STAR test. That's their in the course exam. I saw parents of English language learners coming saying the same thing. I saw legislators saying that their own children took their end of course test four and five times and finally after passing it by one point, right, they acknowledged that they too would have availed themselves of the Texas appeal process if it had come to that for them. And so over time, right, over a 10 year period, as Texas rigorously evaluated their program, what they saw was between two and five percent of their students uh, graduate using the appeal process, and that between 30 and 50 percent of the students who try to graduate with the appeal, those appeals are denied. And I think that when you look at Texas, you can see from their outcome data that their appeals process is doing something good. So I want you to look. Um, this is their percent of employment of their students, uh, their graduates, graduates nationwide. This is using uh, the uh, Labor Bureau data. 45.8% of high school graduates nationwide are engaged in work. That number is low because that number also includes students who are enrolled full time in post secondary education. But when we look at Texas IGC graduates, those are their graduates that graduate through an appeals process nearly 70% of them are engaged in employment. And I want you to look at that compared to nationwide data on high school dropouts, 41%. So we've got 41% of our high school dropouts engaged in employment, but when you give those Texas students access to that diploma to an, through an appeal, it jumps to nearly 70% employment, right? And for a state like Louisiana, that has one of the highest youth disengagement rates in the country, this is something that we ought to be looking at. Another thing that that, uh, that number on employment in Texas is a conservative number because we know that many of their graduates lack the proper paperwork to be able to be counted inside the state of Texas's labor data. 14.3% um, of Texas appeals graduates go on to college and their persistence at the college level aligns with national statistics of appeals of, of, of traditional graduate students. So their persistence is there as well. And so Texas is doing something that Louisiana ought to be thinking about. Um, and so while we learned from the approach of other states around the appeals process, we thought that there were ways that we could make it better in the state of Louisiana. 
And so we wanted to think about policy design consistent with what we know about our own percent mastery on assessments, our high rates of disengaged youth, and the disparate use of TOPS tech pathways in our state compared to the TOPS university pathway. And so we wanted to think about ways in which we could elevate our career and technical training that is going on in our high schools um, in a way that might expose students in this appeal process to career and technical education in a way that they are not right now. So uh, we have the expanded criteria for every learner in Louisiana process for you. Um, so here is how we designed this process. Um, students can appeal if they have not met the assessment requirements on both exams of any content pair. Students cannot appeal until their senior year. This does not mean that the work for the student and the school doesn't start until their senior year. We know that because we have front-loaded our end-of-course exams now, especially with the move to U.S. Uh, civics over world his or U.S. history, students are going to be taking the bulk of their EOC exams their freshman and sophomore year, at which point schools will begin identifying kids that are struggling with their EOCs, which they're already supposed to be doing, and engaging in intensive uh, work in order to be able to help those students graduate um, by passing their end of course exam. We want schools focused on helping their students pass this end of course exam. But we want to provide hope for students that are struggling right, to not give up on high school altogether because that they know that if they put in the work right, and they demonstrate proficiency that there is a path for them to graduation through this appeals process. Um, so in order to appeal, this is really important, students are required to complete all their Carnegie units for either Tops University or Tops Tech. And so what this means is, if you have a student who has a D in Algebra 1, and they fail their end of course exam, and that brings their class grade down to an F, they are not eligible for this appeals process. The students have to pass the class with the EOC as part of their grade in order for them to avail themselves of the appeal process. The other thing that they are required to do is to demonstrate content proficiency by either meeting the standard assessments required in the pair or by creating a portfolio of work aligned to the standards for both subjects in the EOC pair that is unfulfilled by their EOC score. In this right is something that is novel to the Louisiana approach because we are asking these students to demonstrate content proficiency in both EOCs areas unlike what we do for students who are graduating without the appeals process. The third thing is we ask them to demonstrate evidence of employability by either earning a silver or higher on the ACT work keys earning a TOPS Tech Award, or earning a Jumpstart Approved Industry-Based Credential. Additionally, we have reporting requirements um, around this that annually school districts have to provide for us the percentage and the number of diplomas that are issued via this appeal process per graduating cohort. If the school's graduating cohort, co sorry, cohort exceeds 5% through appeals. LDE is to audit um, a random sample of the appeals that were granted, and unsatisfied audits may result in additional monitoring, periodic data requests to evidence uh, appeals process in practice, right? So we are trying to ensure the integrity of the process by allowing DOE to come in and randomly audit portfolio students in the appeals process to make sure that the rigor of the implementation process is being followed. Additionally, there will be a triennial report of initial implementation findings to include post-secondary outcomes for graduates through the appeals process. So we want to know how are our students who are graduating through the appeals process faring as they enter college and they hopefully persist there with their non-appeals process graduates. Additionally, we would like to see um, 
employment numbers for graduation uh, for our graduates, as well as our graduates that um, use the appeals process and those that drop out, right? That would provide us with real data around whether or not we were able to use this appeals process to reduce youth disengagement. And then also we would like to know the industry-based credentials that are being uh, earned through this appeals process to make sure that we are seeing industry-based credentials that align with the needs of the workforce um, in the state and the region the student resides in. And so we believe that this appeals process is the answer because it increases evidence of content proficiency by requiring students to use that, uh, to demonstrate content proficiency in both subjects of the EOC pair. It makes Louisiana competitive in terms of national career readiness, industry-based credentials. So moving us towards our goals of having a prepared workforce and decreasing disconnected use. And it aligns with national priorities, right? Louisiana right now is an outlier in this process, and we will become even more of one if any of the states that are considering additional changes to their processes um, pass those, right? And so we think that this puts us in alignment with what is happening nationally in these areas. Um, at the June 8th SAC meeting, uh, SAC made a unanimous motion to endorse the Excel's peers, uh, appeals process and urged Bessie to pass the policy at the June meeting. And we, um, they also urged DOE to provide Excel appeals process implementation guidelines in advance of the 23-24 school year. And our recommendations for the board today is to ask that you would um, motion to adopt the Excel appeals process and the respective edicts proposed in Bulletin 741 and that we would direct LDOE to provide Excel's skills process implementation guidance in advance of the 2023-2024 school year. I'll turn it over to Dr. Bowden. Thank you. So uh, in my life, I've generally been considered a high achiever next to this lady and her level of details. I don't feel as though I am one. Um, it's impressive how hard she works. A couple of points I want to make just based on the conversations we've had so far. This is not a waiver. It's an appeals process. And so what I think you'll find as we talk through this and really dig into it is that a lot of the concerns that have been raised as we've had conversations over, I don't know, years, right, about this topic, that, that they have been addressed and brought to the forefront. And um, so anyway, I do want to make the point. So this is not a waiver. This is an appeals process. Also, it's not an additional uh, graduation requirement. It our additional graduation pathway. It is a, a process for kids no matter what their graduation uh, pathway is. So I, I wanted to make that point. Also, I just feel like I need to give you a little context of my uh, journey here as an educator. So I have long been an advocate for high standards for Louisiana students. I continue to be an advocate for high standards for Louisiana students. In my role as a principal, one of the things that I've come to see is um, I know students, right? So I know what they bring to the table. I know what their academic record is. I know which IBC tests that they've passed. And I understand their readiness to contribute to our community, right? So I see that. And then I look at their transcripts. And so, you know, there's a particular student I have in mind where this child had passed a number of um, tests required for her particular IBC but was not passing the LEAP test, right? And um, in seeing this process, I really, the limitations of testing come to light, which we've discussed earlier, right, today. Like this notion that the test as we have it is an autopsy as opposed to a physical, we all know that there are limits to testing. And what this appeals process does is addresses those limits to testing because those limits exist for a large number of students and for different reasons, right? Like people have, those limits to testing exist for different reasons. What I've come to appreciate is there are people who are not strong test takers that are incredible uh, contributors to our community, especially because of the resiliency that they employ in the contributions that they make. And so what I hope that we can do, and I think a theme you're gonna hear today is hope, right? Like this is all, 
about hope in terms of what brings the two of us to the table together is we want hope for children of our faith who typically have been, who've not had that in our system. So um, when you look at these transcripts and you see kids taking the same test over and over and over and over again, and it's not just that they're taking the test, they're getting interventions, they're getting remediation, but where the struggle is is in their display of their knowledge is not ideal in this testing situation. And so what we want to create is a process that allows them to demonstrate the things that they have learned. Um, I really am hoping that you pass this policy today, right? And I look forward to the samples that we'll be able to see over time of students demonstrating their knowledge in different ways. And just, um, you know, our daughter is adopted, in order to adopt our daughter, we needed to have a birth mother choose us. Well, guess what, who I went to? I went to one of my students who every time I gave a project, he said, it was Ms. Bofi at the time, Ms. Bofi, Ms. Bofi, can I make a video? Can I make a video? Can I make a video? Well, when it was time for us to adopt our daughter, I called that student to make a video because he had been doing it since eighth grade. And while his knowledge was displayed somewhat in a testing environment. His skills, his creativity, what he brings to the table is just absolutely impressive in a video environment. And you all know the end of that story, right? The birth mom chose us. I'm not sure she would have. If she wouldn't have had that insight into our family, that this video that my student created, that he started in our own classes, wasn't possible. So I think it's, you know, we talk about standards. And everybody knows, and if you don't know yet, standards are what you should know and be able to do. The reality is demonstrating what you know and are able to do can come out in different ways, right? So some of us are strong writers. Some of us are strong speakers. We all have, some of us are strong cooks. We all have different talents, right? Like what we know and are able to do, we can show in different ways. And what this process will allow our students to do is to show their master and the standards and it's even more rigorous because we're not just saying, hey, you have to have um, English 1 and English, English 1 or English 2. We're saying English 1 and English 2. And this to kind of get at the point that um, Mr. Garvey was talking about with the opportunity to review. So that clause is specific to course requirements and academic standards. We're actually not making any change to course requirements or academic standards. The only change we're making is this appeals process connected to the graduation requirement that we have. And members, I just want to give you comfort in looking at the other states and what the other states' graduation requirements are, right? So I think that slide of there are eight states that still require an assessment to graduate from high school, but Louisiana is the only one that doesn't have some kind of process in place for students who don't make the bar on that standardized test. Um, so, like I said, I do hope that you see evidence of the, the input that you've made show up in this process and as we have this conversation. And then the last bit that I want to leave you with is, um, I hope to see fewer students who use April Dunn, the April Dunn Act to graduate and pick up more of the appeals process. Because I feel like what we're providing will help our students become more ready to contribute. And so I just want you to know, like there's a, um, you know, there is a piece about auditing, and I think we do audit, and I don't, I don't want floodgates open, but I want us to continue to refine this, and I want us to use this in such a way that it's helping our students. Um, one of the things that I struggle to achieve as a principal is really helping to get my students connected to these opportunities out of high school. I mean, <coughs> high schools are like fast place, uh, fast paced environments, and people make really interesting decisions that can hijack the agenda of my day, right? And a lot of times my agenda is about connecting kids to opportunities, making sure they have the credentials and those kinds of things. But then I have to go focus on an emergency or crisis situation that was created by somebody else. What I want to bring to scale that I hope will, this will be the beginning of it is the piece about connecting students to opportunities in the community. And so one of the parts of the policy you'll see 
is this connection, the educators actually scheduling a meeting, because we talked about it, right? Like, we want the educators to collaborate. Well, what does that really mean? You know, and how do you check the box on that? So instead, we were very specific. We want educators to schedule meetings for our students with people from the community who have the contacts with career placement or additional training, right? So that's specific. And so I, I hope that this is the beginning of starting to reimagine our high schools, and especially with some of our most vulnerable students. Um, so I'm really excited about it. I hope to have your support. I think it um, presents a lot of hope to the kids in our state, but I also know there are a number of people here that want to talk about it as well. <coughs> Right. Uh, any questions from the board of our two presenters today? Ms. Morris. Yeah. Well, why not? Uh, when, when I look at the fundamentals, I guess, of, of the proposal, um, you focus on students that, that can't have the lead test. Um, when I look at the lead test, I don't claim to be an expert by any means, but it's basically a ninth grade test. It's a ninth grade test, one of those tests, we've heard testimony before for students that didn't pass the biology test, right? And at that time, when the middle of COVID, I'm asking myself, maybe we need two biology tests, right? So our kids really appreciate this, this whole concept of a global pandemic and a virus and how well educated they should be and so that they can respond you know, to what's going on in the real world. Are we really providing enough education so they can deal with the current state of affairs? Um, but no, we don't have two biology courses. We only have one. And it's a ninth grade biology course, as I understand it. So the requirement to pass a ninth grade science class to get a high school diploma doesn't sound like a high bar to me. Um, what would whether it's science test or the English test or whatever, I, I've asked the department, I haven't heard a response yet, but I asked, well, okay, if a student scores a D minus, let's say they did pass the test, they scored a D minus on the ninth grade science test, what is the grade level proficiency for that that you would compare it to? Are we saying that's an eighth grade level proficiency? So we're going to give a high school diploma to a student with an eighth grade proficiency in a subject. Uh, my point here is just from my understanding of the systems in place today, it seems like a very low bar. Um, so when we talk about an appeals process to provide someone uh, a subjective pathway around that, then, and I look back to a couple of emails that constituents sent me with concerns about this uh, in prior years, before, I assume before the standardized steps were put in place, there were valedictorians in our state that were illiterate because they went through a process to graduation that was purely subjective. It sounds to me like we're one step forward and two step backwards, with, with again going back to a subjective process to award a high school diploma. And then my, my last thought right now is that if the hurdle here is just the lead test, we've heard testimony that the high set provides uh, the credential to get students into uh, college in this state. Um, it could be something that can be done today. Students are doing it today. It's an objective process. We don't have to have this concern again going back to valedictorians that are illiterate. Um, so I don't understand why the high set, and for another reason, I don't understand why the high set isn't a reasonable solution to the problems put on the table today. The other concern here is time of implementation. The high set's available today. The process that's being proposed Soon there's going to be a timeline, and then I'm concerned about the HR requirement. The, the way I understood it, the model that uh, is being compared to is the April Dunn model. 
you know, where every student's got an IEP, right? It takes resources to put that IEP together. How many man hours annually does it take to support one IEP? How many man hours annually would it take to support developing, managing, supporting a portfolio for, for all these students? How many uh, FTEs does that translate to? We don't have enough teachers in the state today. The current number I heard was 1,500 that we're short. We don't have enough teachers in the state today. We don't have enough counselors in the state today. Where are all the people that are going to come from that are going to develop and, and support individual portfolios for all these students? Where's the funding going to come from that, that, that's, going to, that's going to support it? And I hope you guys have the answers. I just heard on the answers, and these are just the questions that are, that are in my mind. So thank you for taking my questions. Thank you, thank you Mr. Morris. Um, so I'm going to start with the, I think in the order that you gave it, the, the piece about moving to a subjective process and concerns about illiterate valedictorians. That's a fact. So... There is actually an objective component to this process. So it's not a purely subjective component. There's an objective component. And so that comes in with students having a certain, there's eligibility criteria that they have to have a place to do this. For the first place, they have to pass their test. Or they have to pass their class that are in the Carnegie units. And their LEAP scores will be figured in to the grade of that class. So if they're... But, but didn't the illiterate valedictorian pass their EOC? I don't, I'm not sure. I can't speak to the, the specific individual that you're talking about. I, I just can't, I I'm sorry. Yeah, so, but in this case, what would happen is students have to meet certain eligibility uh, criteria. That means they have to earn the Carnegie units for the, um, their pathway. And for their LEAP classes, their EOC classes, their LEAP score is figured into that class score. So if you're like making a D in the class every nine weeks, like you're showing up every nine weeks and you're making a D, and then you do so poorly on your LEAP test that you fail that class, you would not be eligible for this because you hadn't met that criteria. You're not showing up, you're not, do, you're not doing the work. So that's one component. The other, another component is around the work keys a TOTS Tech Award, or an IBC. And really this, a lot of, I had you in mind when we were talking about this component and this notion of employability, employment ready. And so we have a system that I've learned so much being in the principal's role at a career center about different IBCs. So we have IBCs in place that help add objectivity to the component. So it's not a purely subjective component. And then the issue about the HR requirement, that's such a, it's such an, an important point to make, and I, I feel it, right? Like of the things I'm most concerned about, this is the one that keeps me up at night, that we've got thousands of, tens of thousands of kids across the state who didn't have a teacher. Um, this is going to allow education, educators to shift their focus, right? So if you have a child who hasn't passed one of the tests in the biology U.S. history pair. Then what's happening is the counselor's continuing to set up remediation and intervention opportunities for the student. Maybe the student is auditing the class of biology class, but they're auditing the biology class. Those are the, they're already spending the time. This allows a shift in the time to focus on what else could we be doing to help this child once they graduate. And so the SPLC process is an existing process within our schools. Our schools are having SPLC meetings already. This gives the SPLC team another option to um, put into place for students. And when you say in terms of the educators creating the portfolios, it's not the educators who will create the portfolios. The portfolios are evidence of the students' knowledge. So it's the students that are creating the portfolios. The educators will work together to assess them. And so um, these are the these are the components that we built in to create what we believe is a really strong process. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Um, I've, I've got a number of questions, and they're not necessarily directed to y'all. I'm, I'm going to ask y'all, y'all, uh, Superintendent Brown, or somebody in the department, maybe the ones with the information. I don't know. Anyway, 
Uh, okay. My understanding is that the Excel, when it was brought to us, I guess in April or whenever the first time it came to us, was limited to the EL student population only. Now we're talking about all students, correct? Yes. Was the Excel, I guess, their model, has it ever been tested for that expanded population outside of the ELP appeals process? Is it used in other states to apply for all students? Yes, yes, yeah, so repeatedly. The, the Excel model, or is it a similar model from Aspen? So ours is actually, we tried to make ours more, it's actually the Texas model with the rigor that we see with some of the other states, New Jersey in particular. So Texas has the appeals process for all, but there's components of that of that New Jersey appeals process that helps strengthen ours. Um, don't mind. Can you turn to slide slide six? necessarily know the numbers. See it at the bottom. That's where I got from oh. Dr. Davis. Oh, thank you. Okay. Sorry. The, yeah. the, okay, the last... Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I can't see. There, there you go. go. Thank you. Okay, between 30 and 50% of the appeals are denied. I'm reading that to mean between 70 and 50 to 70% of them are granted. Correct? When you're passed, yes, they, allowing the students to grant. They meet the Texas requirement to graduate, and that amounts to between 2 and 5% of the total graduates in a cohort every year in Texas. So a very small percentage of students are availing themselves of their appeal process. And I think you said somewhere, I'm not sure before that, there would be 3,000 students in Louisiana. So in 2019, we had 4% of our students um, fail to graduate because they did not pass the EOC. In 2022, the data that was presented to us at the Bessie meeting when we were discussing the COVID waiver was 7%, but the department um, told us at that meeting that that number would decline substantially because we were getting numbers before all of the EOC retakes had been done that summer. So 7% is the maximum in 2022, and it was likely less, but I used that 7% number to look at the number of graduates that or the number of seniors we had that year and that amounts to about 3,000 students of those 3,000 students not all of them would be able to avail themselves of the appeals process because they might not have the Carnegie credits and in addition many of them might say that they are not willing to do the additional work that is required of them to graduate through this appeals process so they don't do the additional work that we go take the high step. Or drop out. Or drop out. Or drop out. I mean, the, you know, the, some of these students are just dropping out. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think you mentioned in Texas it went through the legislature, not their Board of Education. Is that correct? That is the way that Texas chose to institute their policy. And so we are arguing that, that that is not necessarily required in the state of Louisiana and that we are doing an appeals process that we are able to do under Bessie's powers. Um, and in particular, because we are not requiring an additional class be taken, we are not changing anything around the university diploma or the jumpstart or a technical diploma pathway. We talked about comparing multiple states. Well, Michael. Okay. Yep. Yeah, um, in Louisiana, in order to pass the EOC, you need a coaching basic, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, coaching basic does not mean that you're proficient. Is that correct? Yes. Do we know in Texas what level? I know it's not going to be called this, but is it basic, is it approaching basic? What do you need in Texas in order to graduate? 
I, I, I don't know what their label is, but it's not going to be comparable to Louisiana because they're not normed and they're measuring different standards. And so you're not going to be able to compare what is required in Texas on the STAR exam to what we're required to do in Louisiana. I guess my, my question is, is like, we're at approaching basic, then there's basic, and we consider mastery is, is proficient. So we're two levels below proficient in order to pass the EOC. I know that you just said it's not an apples to apples. You're not able to do that. But at the end of the day, like we have to be able to do that because part of the reason why there may be, you know, a higher level in Texas of, of students that don't pass is because what happens if, if their level for passing the EOC is master? Right? Like, does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. it's not an apples to apples comparison. But we're saying it works, that all these other states have an appeals process, and so therefore we should have one. But if it's, if in order to pass the EOC, you have to be proficient in another state, and here you don't, that is a very important distinction as to why other states may have an appeals process and we don't. Does that make sense? Did you have something? So when we designed the um, portfolio process, students, the language in it is that they are required to demonstrate content proficiency. Yes. Right. And that leads me to another question. Right? Yeah. And so, content proficiency in the state of Louisiana is now mastery, right? And so, they are demonstrating inside of their portfolio con content mastery level work in the portfolio. And that leads me to another question. Thank you. Um, Touched on it, I'm not sure if it is, I don't see it in, in here. Uh, maybe I'll look over it. Who would be like, essentially grading the school? Members of the SBLC committee. So, a school building level committee is an SBLC structure that we have in place in Louisiana, and SBLCs come together based on the needs that they're trying to address for students. So if you have a if you have a principal where a child is going to be eligible for um, this process, then they would pull together their experts on campus for that SBLC. So that experts would be experts who would be subject level experts, right? Because a principal wouldn't necessarily be the one that would be able to assess the student content um, proficiency in that content area. There's also a lot of our schools employ different instructional leaders who would be in, uh, qualified on campus to serve that role. There's typically counselors that are also part of the SBLCs. So it would be within the, the actual school? The school, yes. For me, that raises a level of concern that the teachers or the, the school that was tasked with educating these students are acting as the judge, jury, and the execution. Like, that, for me, raises a very legitimate concern of, I want to have a higher graduation rate in order to potentially get the credit in my SPS score. So there is an, an incentive, potentially, whether, whether it's going to be a cognizant issue or not, whether it's an intentional act or not, there's a conflict there between what a school would do potentially in order to graduate and get the SPS score and potentially just graduating a student. And I know that there's an audit here, but the audit, also I have questions with that. The language in the audit says there's, I don't want to misquote anything. Um, Unsatisfied audit may result in additional monitoring, periodic, periodic data requests to evidence appeal process in practice. There's a penalty. So if a person has an audit and it's unsuccessful, you're going to do additional monitoring. So what happens if you come back again and they're still unsatisfactory? Basically, they don't comply with the, the process. What is the? How are you going to stop this from them just continually having unsatisfactory? So I'm glad you raised that question because, and I appreciate the individuals who've uh, engaged with us on um, on similar issues. 
And so, Ms. March Jones, would you like to sure. talk about discussions that we've had connected to that exact point? Yeah, thank you, Ms. Miller. I, I shared that concern, and um, one amendment I'd like to make to the proposal today um, would actually address your very concern around the audit and actually ensuring that, I mean, language that I would like to uh, suggest be considered for any of us. Um, if the initial audit yields discrepancies in the implementation of the appeals process, the state superintendent of education may be the final authorizer for the respective school site the following year. Right? So they, they no longer are able to actually uh, make that decision the following year. It actually goes to um, a different, a different, more senior body in that regard. And then I guess one other one is we talked about IBCs. Uh, well, my time here, we, we've heard that there are concerns with basically putting kids in an easy IBC to get them, get them that so they can get the points and on the SPS and they can go through. What guardrails do we have to make sure that since this is one of the requirements that they're going to get a legitimate IBC that can help them in the future? Because I don't see that in here. There's nothing. It just says an IBC. And like my concern is, you could just a system could just put a kid in there. Get them something that is no real world value, but that would check that box and get them through. Do you, is the, um, I don't have the language right in front of me, and Ms. Davis, I do need a copy of that as well, please. But um, is the, I believe we put in a graduation qualifying IBC, and our board uh, did a refresh of Jumpstart. So we did a Jumpstart 2.0 to refresh the fact that there were people who were uh, using IBCs that were not as useful um, out in the field. And so uh, one, of the, one of the things we try not to do is um, over-regulate this process to create conflicts with other policies. And so if any of the graduation qualifying IBC changes are made on the Jumpstart side, then they would ultimately um, be recognized on this side as well. So it's a graduating, graduation qualifying IBC that Bessie has already addressed through Jumpstart 2.0. But yes, that's a, it is, that's a, another conversation that we've had. Okay. And those IBCs, right, I mean, they are, they go through a process of a committee that is comprised of not only educators <coughs> and a Bessie member, which would be me, but also members of the business community that make sure that the IBCs are aligned with the regional workforce needs of the state as well as the state level workforce needs. So that happens. Um, and then the other thing to your to your point about like what IBCs are children um, earning, right? We have in that report that the IBCs by type are reported to Bessie. And it is our hope that in that that report at year three that looks at the uh, use of this appeals process over time is able to diagnose as they look at that which IBCs are being used by our students and how are they linked to the regional um, or state level workforce needs across the state and so that Bessie will have the opportunity at that three-year mark to say should we re-examine this make policy changes so that we can make it better right and so we built that review process into the policy um, so that you all would have a chance to see what the outcomes are for kids that are using the appeal. And then going back to the uh, previous concern about people just being at the school site making a decision, uh, that was a similar concern that we heard from others. And so instead of stopping at the SBLC, you'll see language on the last page that Ms. Davis, and thank you Ms. Davis for highlighting the differences added in for us is that the local education agency head would have the final approval. So an SDLC team could get together, pull all this information together, and then that local, in a lot of places it would be superintendents, but in the place of a, uh, a charter school would be the charter uh, executive director that would be able to make that final decision. So again, another, another point that we also heard and tried to update the proposal to reflect those concerns or deal with those concerns and then the last one 
is um, we had put the audit at 5% originally, just looking, and those numbers are based, if, for those of you who are familiar with the response to intervention process, where you look at about 80% of your kids are tier one, about 15% are tier two, and about 5% are tier three students. So that was the thinking along with the data we have seen from the department in previous years and what we see out of Texas. So we started at five, but have moved that down to a 3% threshold for the audit. Um, and this is a quality control check, right? Like if you're doing good work, you're having high standards, you're not going to be watched as closely. You continue to have that autonomy in your decision making. If you are gaming the system, you're making bad decisions, you're pushing kids through who shouldn't graduate, then you are going to lose some autonomy there all the way up into the possibility of the state superintendent having to make some decisions based on evidence gathered uh, at the school site. And I will say that originally we had that report issued at year three, but in response to concerns that we heard, um, in particular this was uh, Ms. Moore Jones, we moved that report to year two so that uh, sooner rather than later, the next Bessie board would have the opportunity to look at this program, its outcomes for students, and assess um, the need for policy improvements, right? So um, it gives you a chance sooner to, to look at it. Two things from the, the revised proposal that Doug just saw. Um, going back to what Dr. Roby just talked about, about the LEA, um, my reading of this says if the SBLC passes and says you can graduate, it doesn't go to the LEA. So it still stays in house. It's only in instances when an SBLC denies the, or does not approve it. That's not the intent of the change. So let's read. So if you look at G, G says for students meeting the requirements outlined in subsection D, the SBLC may determine that the student is eligible to graduate subject to final approval of the local education agency head. My read of that is an SBLC team is going to get evidence together, take it to a superintendent to sign off. Exactly, sign off. Right. That, you're not going to, that's not an actual review. Like, I, I don't expect well, Ms. I Boche, don't I don't expect Ms. Boche to go through every single one of these portfolios and sign off and say, yes, this meets all the requirements. But Ms. Boche is not going to put her signature on something she's not going to stand behind. And I like this gives us a great opportunity to ask Ms. Boche, how many, how many students this year would you have had that could have availed themselves of this process? So think about those that did not graduate but had also met the Carnegie units and then could have tried to meet the evidence of employability can come in as well. Okay, and um, have a high school of 2,200 students. Uh, the graduating class, if I remember correctly, was 460 some odd kids. We had eight kids who um, did not graduate because of late. There were a few more who did not graduate because of coursework or whatever, but so what did that, you know, that percentage turn out to be? This, this percentage, let me ask you this, and I know it's every school is different, but let me ask you this, when you're talking about the 3% or 5%, that is the, um, if you cannot, you're saying that that is the upper limit of, um, say, appeals to grant in a particular cohort, or what are you saying? What is that 3% or 5%? So if you pass that, that trigger an audit or what? Yes, that, that if you pass the, pass the threshold, it would, you would be audited. Ms. Boshe, I can follow up real quick, if I might. Sure. Um, so of the eight, with this appeals process, how many do you actually think would have actually even qualified for the appeals process? Okay. Well, not now you kind of like well <laughs> part of this be, well to be honest no it's not like but part of the criteria now none of those kids would have because you have to do in each of the courses the way i'm reading this each of the courses where the link test is not passed they would undergo 30 hours of remediation 
retake it then do the portfolios in both um, you know both courses and have the employability factors so either a silver on work keys a 17 on the ACT or an industry based certification that meets the criteria of our Jump Start program so I would venture to say that none of those eight would have met what you have here now had this, had this process been in place and when I first began to look at this process to me in many cases it's a higher bar for a graduate than what some of our kids currently have and especially you know the employability piece and then the demonstration at a certain level of portfolio of both pairs of the LEAP assessment that they did not. So for example, if you're looking at biology and US history as a pair, and um, they would have to demonstrate go back and do the portfolios and the demonstration of competencies in both courses, whereas right now, they really only need the passage of the assessment in the law. And so let, me, let me just, you know, make this statement. I mean, standardized testing. When, when Louisiana is the only state in the United States, the only one that has absolutely no appeals process to any of this, there are eight, only eight states that still require this end of course assessment. In our case, the LEAP assessment. <coughs> And I begin to wonder, and I did some reading after y'all brought that, why are, why are states looking at different measures of what satisfies completion? So whether we say the level of our lead test, you know, what demonstrates proficiency, we've had major discussions on the reliability of these tests or the efficacy of these tests. Or I know we've had discussions in-house about revamping some of this in terms of questions and which levels they address. So our lead tests are not the all and end all of proficiency in any particular area that we're testing kids in. And in many cases, we have kids, uh, we had a 31% failure rate on the U.S. history test. <coughs> whether these kids forget who they are, they knew the country, not knew the country, whatever their reason was, you know, that begins, um, sometimes you need to look at the assessments themselves, which is for the discussion, understand that. But being the only state in the country that um, does not have a process to look at kids who may not test well on one day in an academic test environment, the way we're asking them to demonstrate proficiency with these standards. It's not, I think most people think, if you go around and ask people, what's on the U.S. history exam? What do you have to know? <coughs> you know, do you, do, is it factual? Because when you see these game show hosts and they go around and they ask people, you know, who's the president of the country, who's the attorney general of the U.S., whichever it was, it's more of a civics question or something pertaining uh, to one of the world wars or whatever that we're involved in, and then it becomes comic that people don't know the answers to it. So a lot of times I think people say, well, okay, this U.S. history test, our kids have to know something about our country, and they're thinking more factual. Well, what actually happens with these exams, very, uh, it, it's not heavily factual. It's more read these passages, compare, contrast, in for this, do this. And there are many kids who don't have necessarily that level um, of expertise that they can demonstrate that as they flip through. I'd be mean, one of these kids flipping through the computer trying to find, here's my source document, let me go back and annotate this or do this to get on. Whereas I need the actual written work. We don't even have paper copies anymore. We even now and I have third fourth graders maneuvering that um, on a computer. But you have to say we can maneuver it much more easily than I can at this point. However, I do think there is a place for a small number of kids that cannot demonstrate proficiency on one of these standardized tasks. 
And I see that over and over again. I mean, we had a, a CEO of a um, whole community. I mean, the guy was in Florida, and he came to a community here in Louisiana, and I was at a workforce development thing. He said he got a 12 on the ACT. These are horrible testing. And, but his skills in collaboration, putting things together, making things work, were phenomenal. So sometimes we get caught up in this demonstration of proficiency at this level, what proficiency means, as opposed to looking at the whole student. And again, a small number here. You know, I'm, I'm fine with looking at this and making that number, you know, 3% of the people go for it, if that's the number that you're proposing you know, to go along with. And take a look and see and follow these kids. Are they getting a credential? Are they going to work? Are they availing themselves of opportunities? You know, I mean, even if we put that as a part of what's required in this, this whole process, because I think we do, as Dr. Bolton was saying, when we look at reimagining high schools, you know, that employability piece and that piece is extremely important. And we can't get bogged down in this one item of what is proficient on a biology test and what is proficient on this U.S. history test and at what level, and that determines the ultimate fate of that particular student. There's got to be a way of that child demonstrating proficiency in another, in another modality. You learn that as an educator. Many, many times there are different styles of learning, there are different styles of teaching, and many people demonstrate, like you were talking about, the, the kid in the film that he could do. There are many kids who can demonstrate in a different way. And sometimes we have to be a little bit open to trying this and say, now if we made this card launch and say, every kid, no, I think that I think y'all have some tremendous safeguards in place that we're looking at a very small number. And I think it has to be impressed upon, you know, schools and, and uh, school systems that we, if we implement something like this, it has to be done with fidelity and it has to be done with a sense of rigor as well. And then kids have to be able to demonstrate their knowledge of these particular areas, albeit in a different way. Just like we do with our special needs kids. They come up here all the time and say, different, it may be it, it, what equal, different but not equal, or whatever the, the saying is, you can't look at it all the same way. They learn differently, but they still learn. <clears throat> Mr. Castile, I know that um, we have some people who came here for a nine o'clock meeting to testify on this island, and I am more than happy to be here like all day and into tomorrow to answer everybody's questions. But I do want to just, you know, be cognizant of the fact that some of these are young people who sitting in this meeting is is even harder than it is for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was not finished. I know we, they directed some questions. I have two more points. Uh, under Section G, where we're talking about the SBLC going to the LEA, that doesn't address the concern about conflict of interest. The LEA would be concerned about, or a charter school would be potentially concerned about a either charter school letter grade or a district letter grade. It would need to go to someone outside of the LEA would have to go up to the state level in order to be able to do away with that conflict of interest. Um, so, Mr. Malloran, if we make that change, are you planning to vote in favor of this? Uh, no, I don't think we have enough information. I think we this was brought to us as an EL. It was then morphed outside of the public scope without public input into a full everyone. The waiver started off as an EL waiver, went to everyone. Also, under the audit that Ms. the audit issue that Ms. Orange Jones brought, this is a lawyer in me, it says may instead of shall. It, the language needs to say shall be the final authorizer instead of may. May allows discretion to be exercised, it doesn't put any teeth into it, it should say shall. It, this is something that is often in the past. Thank you, Chairman.
Mr. Garvey. I had a couple of questions too that should not take. I don't think more than five minutes or so. Uh, if I Sorry, right, as I understand, uh, this proposal has not gone to the legislature to get their input. Do you think that you could convince the legislature to approve this yes. proposal? I think, I think this would be really popular in the legislature. I really do. But I don't, I feel like policy should be developed at our board level by our board. And so I do think it's something that should ultimately be codified. But I think our board is closer to this issue and knows more about it. And I think it's a place where our board should be leading. So you don't think that the legislature should give us input on this before we approve? I think we're, we, I know, we're the experts in this, Mr. Garvey. And so you think this is the kind of thing that the legislature was not elected to look at before approval? I, our role is to be the leaders for education in this state. This is our responsibility. So the legislature was not elected to be leaders in education in this state? <coughs> Any, uh, Ms. Holloway? Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your efforts, your passion for this, and for our students' outcomes. The question I have, in the words of everything that was asked, that I was also interested in knowing, is school performance, accountability. Have you thought about what is the rating of the uh, individual school as for appeal? Will it be scored or the rating scale will be the same? And you know as well as I, we don't want inflation. So what does it look like if there's an appeal process and this child is seeking to appeal? What does the scoring system look like? So the intent of this policy is to be a student-focused policy. There will be implications for accountability because the child will be a graduate, but our goal is not uh, to change accountability with our this policy. Our goal is to look at the students of our state and what we need to do to best serve them in the process. So if the child receives an approved appeal, that means he will receive the same points, or the school will receive the same points, the student, the student would count as a graduate in the school performance score. And he's receiving the same score as others who have completed the requirements. Yes, in that particular component, as a graduate. Are you, now, the are you score, researched that? Have you looked into it? Or are you just assuming? This is a, this is a student focused policy. And so the focus is on what do we need to do on behalf of the kids. now. <coughs> Another component of our leak, of our school performance score is the LEAP component. And so the students who did not pass the LEAP and qualify to graduate, the school would get the score corresponding to that piece. So that part of the accountability wouldn't be impacted at all. But our board hasn't passed any accountability process, any accountability changes, and the goal wasn't to do that. The goal is to be student-focused. This child or student would still receive Oh, the awarded point as a grad. Yes, not the child will be a graduate. Not following the same procedure mm -hmm. as the child next door to or next to That is, you know what I'm getting at. That particular child that's gone through the appeal process will get the same points as the child who has completed all the requirements. As a policy stance, yes, ma'am. This policy, your, your policy. As the proposed policy stance, yes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, board members. Yes, well, yeah. Let me get some. We really need to get a lot of these children out of here. <laughs> I think it's a good civics lesson for the students, frankly. Yeah. I, know. Uh, I hear you. They can stay if they want, and, and yeah, they can go get some dinner and come back. But uh, let's hear from all these folks. We'll be here. We're not going anywhere. But we have a lot of kids here. I'd really like to accommodate them. I suspect there's lots of other questions. All right, what we'll do is, again, two minutes. Uh, we'll invite those who have submitted comment cards who uh, wish to speak. We have four here and then four in the back row so that we can speed up the process a little bit more. 
Uh, first, I have Beth Templet uh, supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Please come up here. Uh, Derek Torrens supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Danica Wassman uh, supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Uh, Huang Trung uh, supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Thank you for the phonetic assistance. That's four. I'll pick four more. Um, <coughs> Olivia Allison supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Please take the metro. Uh, Melanie Marson supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Brita Kimball supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. And um, Maybe Sadia Bandel supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. All right, we'll take those first four and eight. Please introduce yourself by giving your name. And if you represent an organization, say that. But you have two minutes and may proceed. And we'll start with you on the right. Hold on, one second, I want to pull that microphone closer to you. Someone's coming to assist. Um, for graduation. And I will also add 
that overall graduating illiterate people is not like a, a huge issue that is um, that I've seen. Um, they, along with 42 other states, as you know, use these tests as a tool rather than a standard for achievement. Uh, they can be a powerful tool to identify certain skills, but here in Louisiana, Louisiana they are an obstacle uh, for so many of our students, especially our English learners, who have not had uh, those seven years to become fluent. But um, I know that you have all heard these talking points already, so I'm just going to quickly mention some of the things that I've seen. Um, it was mentioned at the last meeting that the Spanish word toward dictionary does not include a significant number of the words that were on the leak test, uh, which is unfair. And I teach my students to use the dictionaries in class, um, and then come test day, they're not supported. But I would also like to mention something that was not mentioned in April, and that is the experience of our Vietnamese students and non-Spanish speaking EL students. Um, the Vietnamese language is extremely contextual, and I have been told by uh, a lot of my students that, sorry, a lot of my students that um, the Vietnamese word toward dictionary actually confuses them even more. So we are here marking that little box on their accommodation, saying that we are giving them this tool, um, that we are supporting them, but it is not functioning as a tool. Um, it, it feels to me like it's just our way of saying that we're, oh, okay, that we're doing something. All right. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Thanks, sir. Yeah, hello, my name is Derek Mejia Torres. Um, I graduated from International High School of New Orleans in 2020, so it's been a minute. Um, what I, I'd like to start saying is standardized testing are only one way of many of measuring learning. They are beneficial for some, but not for all. This is why we're here talking about this proposal today. Um, I would like to Okay, one of the things we are talking about right now is time, like especially um, since I was a, since I, um, English learning myself, um, when we come to the United States, time is something that we don't have when we go to high school. But also time is not the only problem. Um, unfortunately, there's not a, there, we don't have attorneys to represent, to represent us in the criminal legal system. So uh, when, when a teenager comes to the United States, tries to learn the language, tries to adjust to a culture, and tries to work so that they can get legal representation, like, learning a language is like the least of our problems. Um, and so, uh, I understand that we have limited resources, as you mentioned. Um, I understand that we have short staff, but we need to ensure that we have equitable access to where you can thrive, not just the English learners at all. Um, and then, what I would like to all of you to read today is like the Excel, uh, the Excel appeal process is not just for the EL learner, like the English learners, but it's for all of us. Um, that is not just great uh, level equity, ensuring that one group of students like me can have the option to choose any career, but it's relevant because it can be used as a stepping stone to implement uh, the appeal process for all students. So what I'm suggesting is if we are afraid to implement it for all, let's start small, but let's start somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Brown. Hi, I'm Beth Conclay, and I'm the director of secondary schools for Ascension Parish, and I have been the principal of Seminole High School for the past six years. And so I just want to speak for the high school administrators in our district in support of an appeals process as it relates to the graduation assessment requirements. And we are a high-performing district, and we have um, schools with high graduation rates, so that fear is not one that we have. At one school, we, I have a student with a in the 2023 cohort, she passed all of her classes, every one of them, 32 of them, with a 2.2 GPA. She earned two certifications and an industry-based credential and made silver on her work keys. When she took biology, it was during the pandemic and the global shutdown, and so she, um, her biology test was waived. So then she had to pass the U.S. history course um, test, which she did not. And then what we did is we put her back in remediation. We put her in remediation for both courses, and then she took the test two subsequent times after that. Still has not been able to pass the test because of the pressure she has put on herself with this test. I also have another student who's an EL student, and um, she entered her freshman year in the United States. She's been here for four years, and so she hasn't had that seven years to um, be proficient. However, she has also diligently come to school. She has passed chemistry. She's passed 
numerous courses but has not been able to pass the English 2 or 1 ES, I mean, um, end of course exam. And so both of these students have showed evidence of content proficiency, employability, and have documentation of interventions, yet they're not eligible to graduate due to one assessment requirement. We believe that students in this situation should have a means to appeal, and we encourage the board to adopt this policy. Great. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Our next row. Could you please come up, please? And stand in the process. If you would introduce yourself by giving us your name, and you may begin. Uh, we'll begin with you, ma'am, on my left. Okay. As loud as you can, stand green light on. Hi, my name is Bridget. I'm using the You have to push the button. Hi, my name is Bridget. I'm using the key Pull that back real close here. Yeah. There we go. Hi, my name is Bridget. I'm using the key and I'm using the key academy for a year 125, which means one out of five students have the goal is to pass initiative to set up the alternative to be tested for the ICS students. Her graduation does not depend on you. We need an alternative option because we learn dreaded language here. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, my name is Olivia Against it, it, it plays into every weakness and considers none of the strengths of these students at all. So, in truth, the test itself is testing their disability. So, uh, in, if we prevent graduation because of the score on a standardized test, we are telling these students that they are failures. And we are diminishing their future. <laughs> so, 
So from testimonies, we know that these dyslexics will fail tests, will fail standardized tests, but they become successful in business, in the arts, in entertainment, in their lives. But they feel defeated in many ways. So we would like this in the past. Great. Thank, thank you, ma'am. All right. Uh, thank you, folks, for your testimony. I'm going to invite up the next group of eight. The first four, please come to the table. And the next four, please sit on the row just behind them. Monica Owens supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Uh, this is nice. Tingle uh, supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Mario, Mario Williams supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Hamilton Simmons Jones supports the recommendation, wishes to speak. Come on up, folks, and come to the table. And then after that, we'll have Lane Edelman. <coughs> Dr. Aaron Atkins. Gerald Como Jr. did not come up. This is Caroline Roller. Elizabeth Osberg. And then Billy Harris. All right, Ben, you can go first. Please state your name and then give us your comments. that were denied the opportunity to walk their classmates despite having completed all of their graduation requirements. They were barred due to their inability to pass a single assessment, the LEAP. Of these six students, four are non-native English speakers that were being asked to pass a test in the language that they're still learning. These students had earned 27 regional and state credentials. One has earned college credit towards higher education. They've completed certifications through welding, EMR, OSHA, and many, many more. This shows that they are workforce ready. The late April conversation to notify a senior and their parents that they will not graduate due to failing the LEAP is devastating. These students have worked tirelessly to write piles of practice essays, complete sample assessments, and amass a wealth of examples of their competent knowledge. These students simply struggle with the format of a three to four hour test and for more than one fall short of passing the LEAP by a single point. Students should not be held back from graduating by a senior, single point on an assessment, yet it happens over and over again. Across my district, 19 students pass their classes and can show that they master content but were unable to pass the LEAP. Louisiana is only one of eight states that requires a standardized test in order to graduate. We are the only state in the nation that does not have an appeals process or alternative means of assessing content knowledge. Excel would remove this artificial barrier of requiring students to pass a test for graduation. It outlines a fair, rigorous process for students to prove their content mastery by an alternative means and prove that they are workforce ready. They are prepared to contribute to society and should not be held back by this single barrier to their diploma. The high set is seen by many employers and by students as not being equivalent to a diploma. These students have names, 
They're not data points or statistics. They have done the work and they know the content. They have simply been able, unable to show it in the way that they are, the only way they are currently able. I have your two minutes around. Thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Erin Atkins, Assistant Principal at Indiana High School. Our SPLC meetings analyze our students' current performance, identify areas of weakness, and help determine supports needed to try to help make our students successful. These meetings are not additional work that will be placed in our schools. These meetings are already taking place and involve the stakeholders in an individual student's educational journey. Those who are working daily with the student to meet his or her, her educational needs. We have conversations with our students to learn their goals for school and life, their weaknesses and strengths, and to determine what, if any, supports have been provided and help them to be successful. We analyze grades, attendance, behavior, testing history, language proficiency, and a variety of diagnoses that can create barriers to student learning and success. These are not conversations about a data point in an SPS report that those not on a school campus often see. These are genuine and often difficult conversations but are necessary in order for our students to achieve success. However, this work can only help support the dyslexic students so much. The same goes for the classmate who fled a life or death situation in another country and arrived at our school at the ages of 15, 16, or 17 and are expected to graduate in one to two years. Or the student who has test anxiety, dysgraphia, severe depression, or the student with mental health issues. These students are our tier two and three students that we meet with frequently to determine if the supports we are providing are working and making necessary adjustments as determined by our SBLC committee. But this doesn't always help them pass their LEAP exams. A small percentage of these students have barriers to passing standardized tests that some of us in this room cannot understand. Some of us in this room struggle with dyslexia, anxiety, ADHD, or a language barrier and fully understand this barrier. 1.5% of our seniors did not meet their graduation requirements because of the LEAP test alone. This impacts their future opportunities and the positive impact they can have on our community and state. Statistics show they will most likely cost our state money due to their limited opportunities and decreased health literacy rather than being able to contribute to successful economies. The Excel appeals process holds these students to high standards by requiring them to show proficiency in the LEAP subject area while ensuring they have credentials to make them a viable member of our communities and state. The process removes the barrier for all students and takes Louisiana out of a category it sits in alone for a job's opportunities in the future. And I apologize that we're having some technical difficulty. Or nearly it is see your time on the screen, but we're keeping a separate time right here. So thank you. Ma'am? Good afternoon. I am Good afternoon. I'm Monica Owens. I'm currently the principal at Using and Key Academy. We serve our community of dyslexic students who have dyslexia or characteristics of dyslexia from K through eight, and we are opening our high school to the school year. Um, I've had the pleasure of teaching these scholars that you see today for four years. Each and every single one of them are extremely bright and intelligent and persevere every single day through their dyslexia. Dyslexia affects a person's ability to read. Um, they have to work extremely hard to connect the spoken word to what is printed. Dyslexia is lifelong and affects 20% of our community. Um, that is a lot of people who struggle with their, um, who struggle to truly showcase their level of intelligence beyond the restrictions of a standardized test. We all know that there is not only one way to learn, so why should we give our students the chances of graduating and fulfilling their dreams to the results of elite tests? Preventing graduation because of a standardized test score is telling our dyslexic scholars that they are failures that detrimentally affect their future and undermine the potential of their level of intelligence. Many dyslexics will fail standardized tests due to their deficiency and the difficulty with the reading, but they will go on to be successful in many, if not all, career fields. We've all heard many stories of that. Um, having the opportunity to create a portfolio truly allows our scholars the full um, chance to fully showcase their knowledge and intelligence, and it's, that is usually overshadowed by a standardized test. This accommodating alternative allows our strengths to be put up to, and provides another avenue for our scholars to show and present all that they have learned throughout their high school career. Thank you. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Joe Como, assistant principal at Lafayette High School, and currently a retired command sergeant major. I have three combat tours. I understand standards and accountability. However, the military will adjust their recruiting practices 
support future leaders and their goals to end the military depending on their recruiting goals for that year. Currently, soldiers, future soldiers, still need a high school diploma or a high set to enter the military, but it does limit their career field in the military. All branches require a higher level of education to get a lower score on the AC on the ASVAB. At one point, the military was only taking a high school diploma. A high school diploma is preferred, uh, a preferred and affords the crew the best opportunity to get the job they want. So in the military, the high school diploma is preferred. Thank you, sir. Sean? Aye. Uh, good afternoon, Caroline Romer, Executive Director of the Louisiana Association of Public Charter Schools. My card does not pick a side on this. I think that the appeals process is something that should be considered. Life is full of appeals, and so this is something that we agree should be considered. And as you look at the data and see other states and the, the process they put in place for these things, um, we think that's important. Um, we believe that parents choosing schools that meet the needs of their kids is something that we will show up and do battle over. We, we believe in that uh, ferociously. Uh, we believe that all students learn differently, have different needs, and that that should be considered as well as we do accountability and assessments and these types of policies. But I'm at the table today because LAPCS does not believe this policy has gone through the proper process. Whether it is for this policy or future, we do want to put a stake in the ground. Uh, this is a major uh, conversation, it's a major potential change in policy, and that it's been done without a diverse table of people and stakeholders to debate it, to discuss it, to mull it over, uh, to put their brains around it. We don't think that that's the right way to do policy. We're very proud that this policy has been led initially by a group of charter folks from New Orleans. Uh, they are doing amazing work on behalf of ELL students. But when we took the leap from ELL to universal, we also should have taken a leap in the process itself and put more people in the room to really think through what, what we're doing today, what the long-term outcomes would be, and how best to serve all students in Louisiana. So we would ask that this process, if you don't change it today, we hope this Bessie and future Bessie will consider your process for policy change. Thank you. Thank you, Brown. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Osper. I'm the founder and director for the Nat Charter High Schools in New Orleans. I'm encouraging you today to approve this proposed appeal process as a way to recognize the unique challenges that many of our young people have in earning their diplomas. Currently, the Nat schools serve the young people in our city who have struggled the most in a traditional setting. That may be because they are parenting, because they are working full time, or because they have recently arrived in the U.S. As such, we are very aware that every young person is an individual, and as such, we have to ensure that our institutions create multiple pathways and opportunities for young people to reach the same end. I believe that this process can be used as an additional lever to encourage young people to stay in school and to do their best work, even as they are struggling with a state exam. Having learned to create high quality portfolios and alternative assessments uh, through the Act 833 April Done process, and having had multiple years to see how our students who have gone through that process do post-graduation, I feel confident that we can use this process rigorously and thoughtfully to support individual young people. Thank you. Thank you. Millie Harris. I think Millie Harris. Okay. All right. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, say something to the Louisiana Key before they leave. Sure. Louisiana Key. Wait just one second. Thank, right. you, Thank you so you. much for being here. And I so appreciate young people who come to the table 
and you gave your all, and that was a challenge, and I know how scary that was, but thank you for being here, and especially the young man that how the staff member, I'm not sure whoever it was, that was so sweet that you comforted her. Thank you. Thank you, boys and girls. Thank you. Students can, do not meet the LEAP 
requirements. At the end of the year in 2021, 21-22 school year, I emailed every BSE member and several people on the Department of Ed about one of my students that met the waiver requirement that was granted to the New Orleans districts due to Hurricane Ida, but not the rest of the state. He scored a 20 on the science section of the ACT, but had scored unsat on his biology leap. His disadvantage was that he came to us mid-year after his private school had closed. We need to act now. I've ran out of time. Uh, but I do want to tell you real quick about the boy who didn't fit in the desk. He is now playing college football, but the school will remain nameless since it is not LSU and actually a big rival school south of us. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Can I address the, the biology question y'all talked about? I had a student, if you don't mind. Hold, hold on. Uh, okay. Let's get through all okay. the comments. And if one of the board members wants you to address it, we'll address it later. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Make sure your right. microphone is on and pull it up real close to you. Pull it up. Pull it up real close. In the 11th grade, I came to this country when I was 15 years old. I have been working very hard on my own. I have good grades in school. And I'm a good student in the class. I, as a mother, I have a son named Smart. He's five months old. Every day I work hard. I take my son to his daycare. I go to my class. I take care of my son and I do my homework. My family is not here. So I have to take care of myself and my son. My relation from high school is important. Not only for me, there are many students who have children and they want to have a diploma and a way to, to, to be able to work. Get a get to get children. I think of it when I was in the hospital. I would like to interpret for people who come to the hospital who speak Spanish. I'm very smart. But if you want to look at me exam great, you will know you will not know this. I promise to keep working hard. Please give me my a chance to get a high school diploma so that I can fulfill my living of them and also and give my son a new life. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, ladies. My days as a Carver student were incredible and I enjoyed it so much. 
I had never had such wonderful people to support me and inspire me to be better in class. And despite not speaking the same language, they were always helping and supporting me. I always gave it my all. My experience with the LEAP exam was not that good. It was frustrating since it was difficult, especially for a student still learning the language that the test is in. I worked hard. I passed the math test and even one of the English tests, but I could not pass the US history or biology test. I thought I would not be able to graduate with my friends that year, but that year was 2020 when COVID happened. And like a miracle, I did not have to pass the test. Thanks to this change, I managed to graduate and enter the College of Delgado. At Delgado Community College, I started my business administration career. To start university, I studied advanced English to help others fill out applications, documents, and translate for people who speak Spanish. I'm a tour guide at Delgado for new students and give bilingual tours to make everyone feel included and answer everyone's questions. The test, the LEAP test makes me feel that all of my efforts and activity and homework was worthless because if you don't pass the exam, you can't graduate. This is why many of my classmates did not graduate. They gave up. In other words, high school is the main thing, is knowledge, but it's not the test. If I had to pass the test, I would not be here today in college getting my education and having a good future. Um, and that is that it's her syllabus. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Okay. Um, as educators, it's obviously our job to hear decisions and student stories. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about my student, Mary, through this appeals process. She came to the United States having completed her freshman year in Vietnam and had three years to go until graduation. In her first year, she told me, Miss Merrill, I will accomplish the goal of growing two years in English and I'll pass it. And by the end of that first year, she received an intermediate level of English. She was a shining star. She excelled in writing narratives solving mathematical equations, and wanted to be a doctor. She even received a mastery on her geometry leap exam. But by her senior year, she had still not passed her biology leap, even after taking the test multiple times. I started to see her lose her spark and enthusiasm for learning. She didn't greet me with a smile in the mornings anymore. And when she turned in one of her English proficiency essays, I became very worried. She wrote, sometimes I think about killing myself. This is one of the scariest moments you can experience as a teacher. We went through all the correct channels, setting up a school social worker, a local psychologist, and I texted her in the evenings because she said those were the hardest. She retested on the biology and U.S. history leap in May of her senior year, and again failed both. She was three points away from passing the biology leap, from receiving her diploma, from walking across the stage with her peers. I told her I wanted her to come to summer school to retry the test, and she said, for her own mental health, she couldn't do that. And I couldn't argue. I've changed the name of my student to protect her anonymity, but her story is not unique. Our students walk into our schools with dreams and plans and leave feeling crushed and disheartened solely due to a score on a test. We're letting test scores define their identities. With this policy, Mary could have had a career in healthcare, as well as gained a healthcare industry-based credential through a local community college that would have served her in the appeals process for a diploma. She's currently making minimum wage in a nail salon. I encourage you not to maintain the status quo, to work together and build our system. The need for this appeals process is urgent. We cannot wait for more students in this upcoming school year to have their identities as students and graduates to be defined by a test score. It is our responsibility to make this change that serves all needs of all students. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm going to read the additional public comment cards of those persons, persons who submitted a card but do not wish to speak. Brian Davis opposes the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Terrence Lockett uh, opposes the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Dr. Aaron Bindley opposes the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Barry Irwin opposes the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Caitlin Neville supports the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Uh, Kelly, who didn't provide a last name uh, or first name, supports the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Alexa Godinez uh, supports the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Tommy Byler. Uh, supports the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Uh, Skyler Jefferson supports the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Layla Hunter supports the recommendation, does not wish to speak.
Julian Jupiter supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Sabrina Ward supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Leslie uh, Cazardo supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Rachel Ortiz supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Austin Ventura supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Megan Gibson supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Dr. Laura Cassidy supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Cameron Cato supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Portia Davis supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Jordan Wilson uh, supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Um, well, Landon uh, supports the recommendation and does not wish to speak. Cameron Kelly supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Rachel Arte supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Um, Howell Trong uh, supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Michael Falk supports the recommendation does not wish to speak. Uh, Kelly Dinghauer supports the poses the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Those are all of our submitted public comment cards. Uh, I know our board members were eager to engage in additional conversation. Um, I do have a question, though. Uh, Mr. Rondo, uh, just a quick question for you. You submitted a memo to uh, Bessie, you're our general counsel, uh, and in your letter you concluded that uh, Bessie likely holds the legal authority to adopt the pro proposed revision to section 2321 of bulletin 741, um, and that, that was the legal opinion that you issued as our general counsel, is that correct? Yeah, Mr. Castillo, that's correct. I just want to address a couple of points uh, before I get there. Uh, first is just to remind the board that, uh, again, that is my opinion. Uh, it will be subject to review by the legislature through the APA process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, let me start over. Alex Ryan, both general counsel for Bessie. I just want to remind you all that the, pro the policy change, if you all do adopt it today, will be subject to review by the legislature. Um, I did, in fact, get the opinion that Bessie does have the authority to make this change, the legal authority to do so. I've done that in my capacity as Bessie's general counsel. It is not an opinion of the Attorney General's office. Um, if you all want to request an official AG opinion, that is an avenue that you all you know, are totally able to pursue, and uh, that would go through the normal procedure. And the other thing is that I can tell you that the AG has asked me to impart to y'all that he does not support this measure from a policy uh, perspective. Uh, if y'all need any other information on that, that's something that y'all have to contact the AG's office uh, about to discuss. And in terms of the opinion I rendered, it is uh, all stated in the memo. Nothing that I've heard or seen has changed that opinion. And if y'all do want to go into any further detail, on any legal questions or anything like that, uh, I'd like to do that. That'd have to happen in an executive session for attorney-client privilege information. But that's all I have. So I've got a question that, that I don't mind waiving the privilege um, lawyer also. I can do that as the client, so the privilege being on this side. So um, I, I did have a question as it relates to something um, Mr. Mellon raised, I think, and and perhaps Ms. Caroline Romer raised. And that is, I'd like to offer a substitute motion, but I need some advice first. And I think it is better to, to do it here. And that is, this is sort of broadened a little bit from focusing on EL students to, to, to all students now. Um, is, is it your opinion that that's probably more problematic if I offer a substitute, such a substitute motion more narrowly tailored to EL students? That is probably a question I can't answer sitting here right now. There is definitely the possibility that constitutionally there could be a concern because you are limiting it to a certain group, whether or not that group is sufficiently uh, differentiated from everybody else in order to be able to be treated differently. 
I can't say sitting here right now, but it certainly does at least open up the prospect of additional constitutional concerns. Other questions, comments? All right. Um, so, so I'm going to we'll stay with Ms. Holloway. Oh, no, it's not. Well, it's just a, a clarification, um, Alex, about what did you state in the beginning about the legislature? That any rule that y'all pass will go to the legislature, and this isn't for this issue. It's any rule, any policy that y'all put in place, it's sent to the legislature as part of the Administrative Procedure Act, and they have the ability to review uh, that before it gets promulgated. And that the ability to review in favor or not. Right. Is that how? Right, yeah, they have oversight over rulemaking okay. for all of them. Thank you. Mr. Miller? Uh, this is a question for. Uh, Superintendent Brumley, uh, on page 148 of our packet, um, requirement number two talks about uh, the DOE developing the standardized rubrics uh, for the six classes. Uh, Mr. Lambert and I had briefly talked about this for Superintendent Brumley. Is that something that the department would be able to do in time for 2023, 20, 20, 20, 24, whatever the first year going to effect? I guess that'd be 24. Are there any concerns, any issues, that challenges that the department would face? Yeah, I think I would, I think I would need to get probably additional information from the board on what that actually looks like and what that rubric means. Um, and then, of course, if we needed to develop, then we would have, um, you know, it takes some time because we need to probably have some contracting, and we'd have to have psychometricians also review if we're going to create a rubric uh, to assure that a portfolio aligns to, uh, is equivalent to an assessment. We may, if it were passed, go into the next school year without knowing it would be ready? Yeah, I mean, that, yes, yes, because we're in June. I, there's no way I can promise that to be ready by August. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Garvey? Yes. A couple of questions. Mr. Ron, um, one, you said that the legislature has oversight over this through the APA process? Correct. With, uh, uh, that that means that if they don't like it, they could stop it? Potentially, yes. Uh, doesn't the governor have the ability to override them on that? So they do not have the ability to stop it on their own? They would have the ability to stop it. The governor could overrule that decision. Right. So they don't have the... Uh, they do not have the final ability. That, that is my point. Mm -hmm. um, could I get Mr. Lambert You, I'm sorry, I'm to come uh, talk about the ESEA process that uh, may help with the next question. I think the concern was that. Um, prior to publication of a proposed rule to implement the provisions of the ESEA, the Committee of Practitioners is to receive a copy of that for review and comment. I think that was the concern. Yes, ma'am. Prior to publication by Bessie or by the Department of Administration through the APA process, does this have to go through our accountability commission first for their comment and review? The Accountability Council serves as our Committee of Practitioners for that purpose. And your reading of ESEA, two sections, 1111 and 1603, is that that is required? That's my understanding. I'm not an attorney. We may want to, Mr. Garvey, uh, for referencing that particular issue, we may want to call up Ms. Hunt, uh, since she's the one who offered that particular uh, and actually forgives you since it's 3 o'clock and you have not had a meal. Right. <laughs> 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 
But yes, that, that group serves as our, uh, I believe it's our committee of practitioners. If I could have referred to her as Ashley, I could have done that. It was the town that was giving me the trouble. This time, I'm sorry. Uh, our uh, Ashley Hall Board you might say ESEA experts have said that this needs to go to the Accountability Commission first for Bessie to publish it through the APA process. Uh, is that your understanding too? It is. Okay. Question. We then go to Mr. Weinberg. Do you disagree with that? And if so, why or why? Well, as the memo states, it's about what I've opined on is the legal authority, not any prerequisites to publication or anything like that. It doesn't seem to me that this policy would change something that uh, that ESSA governs, but as subject matter experts, I would have to defer to the department, to Bessie staff, and even to yourselves in terms of what actually requires uh, ESSA plan change. So you would defer to Ms. Hunt, Ms. Townsend, Labor. In addition to Bessie staff and, like I said again, yourselves who have more experience with what requires an ESSA plan of change, that's not something that I have review. Or maybe we should ask for an AG's, official AG's opinion. That is an alternative. Well, I would propose to Bessie members that either we follow Mr. Ryan Booth's deferment and follow Ms. Hunt's recommendation that this has to go to the accountability commission before we can approve it and start the APA process or we should seek an AG's opinion before we move forward. Jim, how many times have you told me you don't even believe in the accountability commission as a body? Like honestly, like this this is a little bit ridiculous. Can we just either take a vote or like like you you know you don't believe that. Like I understand we might disagree on this issue, but like this is just sort of like let's like this has been a process that these ladies and everyone who's got involved have actually been pursuing for four years, right? Four years. We have heard from dozens of students, families, teacher leaders. Like this is a the data speaks for itself. There's eight states, eight states who actually have and of course have testing as part of their you know, graduation requirements. We're the only ones that actually don't have an appeals process, right? Like, you don't have to vote for it, but can we not play games with the politics? Can we actually just take it to a vote and see where we actually stand on this? These people have worked really hard to advocate for something they believe in, that they believe are going to serve students well. So we can disagree, but let's just take it to a vote. I believe that people have worked hard on this. I believe that people want this very dearly. I believe that this is proposing a very subjective process. I believe that it has a lot of conflicts of interest built into, baked into. I believe that part of the rules that ESSA has proposed brings out more information so that people can make proper decisions. But I still go back to the conflicts of interest. I think that that, that makes this faulty. Okay, then don't vote for it. But, but I call the question. All right. The, the question has now been called. I don't know that we have a motion on the floor. Uh, actually, the motion is to approve as notice of intent. To approve as notice of intent the uh, copy that we have in front of us with the yellow highlights. Uh, it was amended by Ms. Lynch. Perfect. Just want to make sure. Mr. Pistil, I don't know if it's appropriate, but. Uh, Typically, the recommendations are from the department as the original motion, and so I don't know with it being Dr. Davis and Dr. Bofi if that warrants the fact that they are the person making the first motion, if that makes any sense. Like, in the fact that the recommendation is usually from the department, some of the motion um, is coming from, like, Dr. Bofi. Uh, I, I, I think they were making the second that motion. Okay, so that's we, just if, what we, if we want a technical... Did Ms. Lawrence Jones make a motion? Ms. Holly, Ms. Davis. No, to receive. It was to receive. So, all right. So, we need another motion to receive. I read both of them as we were taking them. So, for clarification, we receive. Yeah, we receive. I'd like to make a motion, Mr. Chair, to. Hold on one second. Let's have Dr. Davis. 
and Dr. Grobe, since they are the presenters, to be the mover and the second. That's okay. I make a motion that we approve the policy creating an appeals process for graduation as presented to us via Ms. Orange Jones um, requested changes. I second. All right. Um, there is a motion, there is a second. I presume that there is a position, so roll call. Is it, are we still open for comments? I, I have a question for our vice president. Well, the question has been called, uh, which would end comment, which is the, the purpose of Ms. Barnes Jones calling the question as a parliamentary friend of what? Is that right, Ms. Barnes Jones? Yes, sir. So, so I can call a question and kill the conversation here we'll regardless whenever I want to? You have to vote. You have to vote. You can ask for a vote on calling the question. But if it's been a long time, you can vote on calling the question. All right. We'll, we'll take a roll call vote on calling the question. You need a two-thirds vote for that. All right. Roll call vote. Dr. Bovey? Yes. Dr. Bovey votes yes. Dr. Davis? Yes. Dr. Davis votes yes. Ms. Ellis? No. Ms. Ellis votes no. Mr. Garvey? No. Mr. Garvey votes no. Ms. Holloway? No. Ms. Holloway votes no. Mr. Mellorin? No. Mr. Mellorin votes no. Mr. Morris? No. Mr. Morris votes no. Ms. Orange Jones? Yes. Ms. Orange Jones votes yes. Mr. Rock? Yes. Mr. Rock votes yes. Ms. Boucher? Yes. Ms. Boucher votes yes. Mr. Castile? No. Mr. Castile votes no. That allows additional debate. Marcy, yeah, I had a question for our two esteemed colleagues that uh, made the proposal. Um, I, I really appreciate, sincerely appreciate the discussion today. Uh, but still didn't answer my initial question, which was um, the high set, based on the testimony I heard today, the high set definitely works for some students today. It, it definitely removes the barriers that, that I heard today. So my question is, why doesn't it work for um, all the students in the state that are in the same situation? I guess my thoughts around that process would be that these students have been in high school, they have passed all of the Carnegie units that we have asked them to pass to earn a high school diploma. The only thing standing in their way is an end of course exam. The high set is not aligned to our standards, right? It's not. And so it's not aligned to the academic standard. Those are national standards surrounding the high set, not Louisiana standards. And I believe that we owe those students the opportunity to show us that they are content proficient in the classes that they passed in our high school. That. And I will say, right to the point of the former um, uh, military officer in the room, right, like the high set does not guarantee you access to the military. They have priority rankings when they are allowing men and women to enlist into the armed services. And the number one priority ranking is, uh, or the, uh, the high school diploma gets you a higher priority rank than the high set does. And so they're not equivalent even in the eyes of our military. Um, and so I just am urging us to allow these students the opportunity to show us that they have mastered this content in something other than an end of course exam, that while a good assessment of what students know, it is not a perfect assessment. And we know that because our own department has received millions of dollars in federal funding to develop EOC exams in ELA in particular that do a better job of not creating a format that systematically advantages students based on their background, background in particular their socioeconomic status. So, thank you. And then, um, Mr. Morris, sometimes it's by one point, right? So you have children who will to get all of the Carnegie credits. If they're on a jumpstart pathway, they get all the Carnegie credits. Nine of those credits are in a particular pathway, and they pass an IBC 
in a particular pathway, and it could be one point on one test. And so to go that far and get that close to the goal and have no way to say, but wait a minute, is this right or not? That's why I want an appeals process. Now, I'm not saying high set isn't appropriate for some students. For some students, it is. But when I have counselors tell me the story of a child who wants to serve our community as a police officer, but the police force does not recognize the high school, the high set as a qualifying credential for them, and they can't serve my own community, but instead they have to move to a different community because law enforcement in a different community looks at it differently, I want to put something in place. I, I just feel like it's an unfairness, and that's, that's why I have the position I have on it. Because the kids can get at the right at the goal line, and it can literally be one point. And if the tests were perfect, then I, maybe I wouldn't feel this way. But I know the tests are not perfect. And as a, super, as a district superintendent, we encourage kids to stay in school, take all of the courses that are required for a high school diploma, improve, do your best. We never, ever, ever recommend high set except under extenuating circumstances or real um, hardships within a family <coughs> or some really extenuating circumstances. I would hate to see the high set begin to be viewed by families and children as a quicker way or an easier way, because it is an easier route um, in terms of testing. A quicker way or an easier way, just, oh, I'm 16, let me get my diploma and I'm going to go off and do whatever I want to do. It's, it's very difficult for me as an educator to even make that a suggestion, um, even getting close to that to any child. So the high set is never, ever, to be a first course of action with any child to fail. It's just meant for certain kids under certain situations. And to me, this is not one of those situations where I would like to recommend that to Yes, ma'am. Also, I would also like to say that, again, what y'all are doing is for students. Um, students first and foremost. And clearly, a lot of people here um, think that a proper high school degree is the best for a future for a student. And I want to uh, remind y'all that y'all are all elected for the um, student advantage. And I understand that politics is a big deal of what y'all do, but y'all's first and foremost should always be, what is the best for the future of our students in Louisiana? So thank you. Well, thank you folks. I don't see any more questions or comments. <coughs> It's now appropriate to have a roll call vote. Dr. Bovey? Yes. Dr. Bovey votes yes. Dr. Davis? Yes. Dr. Davis votes yes. Ms. Ellis? No. Ms. Ellis votes no. Mr. Garvey? No. Mr. Garvey votes no. Ms. Holloway? No. Ms. Holloway votes no. Mr. Mellorin? No. Mr. Mellorin votes no. Mr. Morris? No. Mr. Morris votes no. Ms. Orange Jones? Yes. Ms. Orange Jones votes yes. Mr. Rock? Yes. Mr. Rock votes yes. Ms. Boche? Yes. Ms. Boche votes yes. And Mr. Castile? Yes. Mr. Castile votes yes. All right. Motion passes. Motion passes. All right. Thanks, Adam. The next item is on page 158, item 7.4, consideration of revisions to Bulletin 111, Louisiana School District and State Accountability System regarding social studies assessment transition. The recommendation is to approve as a notice of intent. So moved. Second by Mr. Rock. No public comments? Oh, wait. How are we doing? Tommy Filer. Public comment. He supports the recommendation but does not wish to speak. 
Mr. Superintendent. Uh, I was uh, just going to add, this is around um, trying to maintain stability in the accountability system as we transition uh, the new social studies work. Um, and I know the Accountability Council supported the recommendation, and I believe staff did as well, so uh, really haven't had any um, contention relative to this particular uh, uh, approach. Is that correct, Joanne? Right. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional comments? Any objections to the motion? Motion passes. Next item. Next item is on page 161, item 7.6, consideration of revisions to Bulletin 140, Louisiana Early Childhood Care and Education Network, regarding family child care ratios, observations, and technical edits. The recommendation is to approve as a notice of intent, and the updated exec rec has been distributed. So moved. Motion zero second. Second. Any discussion? Motion passes. Any objections to the motion? Next slide. That concludes your agenda. Thank you, folks. Lunch. We don't come back at what time? Oh. Hey, help. Meeting will start in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't eat lunch. 3.30? Oh, yeah. 3.45. No, we're realistic here. I didn't say 3.30. We're going to start. <laughs> 